is touching the truth. Good morning, Jarvis. The weather is nice today, sunny and bright. Good morning, Master Mark. It's a clear day with a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius, a southeast wind blowing, suitable for outdoor activities. In a tech-filled luxurious villa on the Malibu coast, a mixed-race teenager with black hair and black eyes, while ruffling his messy hair, greeted the intelligent butler inside the villa. It was a habit he developed since childhood. At that time, he was just over a year old and could already sporadically utter a few simple words, although it would certainly sound vague and incomprehensible to adults. He still remembered Edwin Jarvis, the kind gentleman who took care of him back then. Every day, Edwin would hold him in his arms and say, Good morning, Master Mark. He would then carefully feed him, take him out to play, and bathe and change his diapers. And every time, he would respond, Good morning, Jarvis. As he grew older, his speech became clearer, and the habit was formed. Later, when the old butler passed away, his unreliable father, in memory of the loyal gentleman who had served three generations, named the newly invented intelligent butler after him. The habit continued, although the recipient changed. By now, you should understand the identity of this young man. Yes, he is none other than the famous. Tony Stark's illegitimate child. The young man's name is Mark Stark, 14 years old this year, standing at 1. Meters tall. He is a mixed-blood child with half-Chinese heritage. His mother is a Chinese-American journalist named Li Lina, working for a New York television station. During an interview with Tony Stark, she was deceived by his charm and some indescribable things happened. And that's how Mark Stark quietly came into existence. Because no protective measures were taken, by the time she realized she was pregnant, it was already two months later. Although she was an independent woman born in the West and decided to give birth to and raise the child, her East Asian family upbringing led her to keep this unmarried pregnancy a secret and not inform her parents. So she quit her job, came up with an excuse via email for all her parents and friends, left New York City, and eventually gave birth to this child, naming him Markley. Since she successfully gave birth to the child, the next step was to find a new job and obtain a stable income in this new city. Then, she would find an appropriate time to confess this matter to her parents. Lilina had already planned how to live her life from now on. But fate had other plans. Just as Mark passed the doctor's examination with everything being normal and Lilina was preparing to leave the hospital after recovering, a phone call from a friend delivered a devastating blow, both of her parents had passed away. According to her friend, they got caught in a conflict between a group of unidentified individuals and suffered serious injuries. Although they were later taken to the hospital by a bald black man with an orange cat, they ultimately couldn't be saved and died. The tremendous shock plunged Lilina, who had just given birth, from the peak of joy in receiving a child into the abyss of losing her parents. Coupled with the hormonal imbalances after childbirth, she sank into postpartum depression. It's important to note that this was still 1996, and even in the scientifically advanced and medically progressive United States, awareness and understanding of depression, especially postpartum depression, were far from sufficient. Patients felt ashamed to speak out about their depression, and those around them couldn't comprehend the pain and struggles involved. Once trapped in the vortex of severe depression, it was like a duck in a drought, destined to perish. Eventually, Mark's mother, Lilina, was unable to overcome the torment of her mental illness. After entrusting her one-year-old son Mark to a friend, she chose to quietly end her own life and permanently depart from this world. After being brought to Stark Industries by his mother's friend, young Mark experienced some difficulties before finally being safely handed over to Tony Stark. After DNA testing confirmed that Mark was indeed his biological son, Tony was willing to fulfill his parental responsibilities and changed his name to Mark Stark. However, growing up without a father's love, Coupled with Tony's youthful and self-centered nature, he was unwilling to let the unexpected appearance of a son change his lifestyle. After handing him over to the old butler, Edwin Jarvis, for care, Mark rarely saw Tony throughout the year. And it was in this environment of lacking parental care and attention that Mark gradually grew up. In fact, such an environment was more in line with Mark's preference. After all, he had the psychological age of an adult. If someone were to constantly lecture him and impose various household rules, he would feel uncomfortable. Yes, Mark's psychological age was already that of an adult. 
If you're wondering why, it's because he was a reincarnator. In his past life, Mark had the same name, but he was a legitimate Chinese person from Earth. As an orphan, he grew up in a state welfare institution. Perhaps due to the environment, Mark had a calm and gentle personality, and he was very mature. Although he wasn't a genius with exceptional intelligence, through hard work, he eventually gained admission to Shuei Mo University, one of China's top institutions, and even received a national scholarship. It could be said that Mark had overcome the shackles of fate and was about to embark on a brilliant new life. However, things didn't go as planned. Full of excitement, Mark boarded the train to the capital, looking forward to his new university life. But after falling asleep in the compartment, he woke up to find himself transformed into a baby. What on earth is going on here? Mark, now being held in the arms of an unfamiliar Asian woman, exclaimed with immense sorrow. Mark, who was held in Lilina's arms, didn't have the chance to properly vent his inner sorrow or take a good look at his new surroundings. His mind was quickly occupied by an overwhelming influx of information, leaving him in a state of confusion and daze. Of course, to others, this was just how a newborn baby would typically appear. Mark spent his first year in this chaotic state, absorbing and assimilating the massive flow of information. Meanwhile, his biological mother, Lilina, overwhelmed by pain, entrusted him to a friend and prepared to end her own life. At this time, Mark was unaware that his mother was about to depart from him forever. With the absorption of the overwhelming information flow, not only did Mark cast aside the uneasiness of his inexplicable rebirth, but he also completely forgot his curiosity about the new world. He was astonished by the astonishing content within the information flow he had assimilated. According to the beginning of the information flow, he learned the reason for his rebirth. A celestial scion, due to being mischievous, tampered with Mark's fate while his parents were not paying attention, causing him to suddenly die on the journey to the capital. To make up for his negligence, the celestial being randomly sent Mark's soul into a world with a similar historical and cultural background, allowing him to retain memories of his previous life through reincarnation. As compensation, random memories of individuals with great fortunes from various realms were extracted and injected into his brain. After accepting this segment of memory information, Mark's karmic ties with the celestial being were completely severed. From then on, he became a resident of this world, and the celestial being erased any information related to itself from his memory. According to the description given by the celestial being, receiving this information flow would not only enhance Mark's brain development, intelligence, and memory capacity but also further improve them as his body matured and his brain underwent secondary development. The reason Mark was so surprised after receiving this information flow was not because of the brain's development process through absorption and assimilation, but because the content he obtained told him that he knew this person, the individual with great fortunes. In other words, he knew the person's identity. Hiro Hamada, perhaps many people wouldn't recognize this name, but when it comes to the protagonist of the Disney Marvel joint production animated film, Big Hero 6, everyone should know who it is. He was precisely the main character from Big Hero 6, the animated film Mark had seen in his previous life. He was the one who invented the magnetic robot, transformed his personal healthcare companion Baymax into a combat robot, and, together with the other members of the Big Hero 6, developed numerous high-tech weapons and equipment. He was the mechanical prodigy with a genius mind, Hiro Hamada. In this year, Mark not only digested and assimilated all of Hiro's memories but also learned the profound knowledge of mechanics within them. More importantly, he learned Hiro's way of learning and thinking as a genius. With this, coupled with his highly developed brain, in the future, no matter whether it was learning new knowledge or encountering new challenges, Mark could overcome them one by one through his diligent and persevering personality. Originally, in his previous world, Mark was an orphan with no ties or attachments. Now, with this rebirth, he gained another 10 plus years of life. Moreover, regardless of his current background, he had already acquired knowledge and abilities that were sufficient to change his future. Therefore, he quickly accepted the fact that he had traversed and been reborn. If he hadn't met the man who would come next, this carefree and happy time of accepting reality would have lasted a little longer. Because he couldn't even dream that his biological father would be none other than the famous Tony Stark. Dear God, no matter how random you are, please don't choose such a terrifying Marvel world. Although Mark complained a bit when he first learned this fact, as the saying goes, life is like, well, since he couldn't resist, he could only enjoy it calmly. 
After realizing this, after all, there were still 23 years until the moment of the snap that wiped out half of the universe, and Mark began his childhood peacefully. Mark's childhood can be said to have been quite happy. In his infancy, he had the company of the butler, Edwin Jarvis, which was warm and fulfilling. As a teenager, every day was spent practicing advanced mechanical techniques from his mind, and it brought a great sense of accomplishment. Occasionally, he would flip through the books and design drafts left by his grandfather Howard Stark and father Tony Stark, gaining a lot of new knowledge and verifying it with the knowledge in his mind, gaining a lot. Although he lost his mother and ended up with an unreliable father, he never experienced the greatness of parental love even though he was reborn. But these were all minor flaws that couldn't hide the bright side. He was already accustomed to it in his previous life. Most things in life don't go as planned, so how could there not be regrets? Not to mention that Mark's life, aside from these things, can be said to be very satisfactory. Thirteen years passed in such a plain manner, and the time came to April 2010. As usual, after greeting Jarvis, Mark walked into the kitchen, opened the refrigerator, took out a box of cereal and a bottle of milk, and prepared to solve his breakfast. At this moment, the voice of the intelligent butler Jarvis reminded, Master Mark, considering that you didn't go to bed until nearly two o'clock last night, I suggest you not consume frozen food directly taken from the refrigerator. It should be heated in the milk warmer before consumption. Thank you for your concern, Jarvis. I'll follow your advice. Mark, who was about to mix the milk and cereal, stopped and followed Jarvis's suggestion, putting the milk into the milk warmer. As you know, Jarvis, I'm at a critical stage in developing Baymax. Once I complete its medical chip, Baymax will bridge the healthcare resource gap worldwide, allowing economically and culturally underdeveloped countries and regions to enjoy top-notch medical diagnostics. I wish you success soon, Master Mark. Thank you, Jarvis. Mark's recent project is to recreate the adorable and lovable personal healthcare companion Baymax from his memories. Although Baymax was not invented by Hiro Hamada, restoring Baymax itself is not difficult, as all the key points can be found in Hiro's memories. The most crucial aspect is the medical chip, which requires highly complex programming logic and underlying data support to accurately assess the emotions of people from different regions and ethnicities, as well as accurately diagnose each patient's illnesses. The difficulty of writing the necessary code and data support is extremely high. Mark has now completed the production of the chip, and last night he performed the final verification and debugging. The progress of the verification on his high-performance computer in his room has reached 45, that means if everything goes smoothly, Mark will be able to successfully recreate Baymax in this world by this evening. In the evening, as the sun set, the long coastline of Malibu Beach was adorned with a layer of red veil. After leaving the company, Tony returned home alone, which was a rare occurrence. Getting out of the car, Tony's driver and bodyguard, Happy, drove the car to the underground garage, while Tony headed to the front door of the villa. Welcome back, sir. Without using a key or needing to actively undergo biometric recognition, the smart butler Jarvis had already opened the gate on its own. Just as Tony entered the door, he noticed a red suitcase in the living room that clearly didn't belong to the villa's decor. The suitcase was about 20 inches in size and had a long power cord connected to the wall socket. Jarvis, what is this? Seeing the suspicious item in his home that he had never seen before, Tony immediately asked Jarvis. Sir, this is the recent research achievement by Master Mark. Oh. What new thing has this kid come up with again? Where is he? Where did he go? Master Mark stayed up until around 2 in the morning yesterday and has been working on perfecting his new design all day today. He is currently resting in bed. I see. After asking out of a sense of paternal responsibility, Tony didn't inquire further. In fact, his childhood was very similar to Mark's. Growing up without his father's presence, he immersed himself in exploring mechanical knowledge from an early age. So now, even though he had become a father himself, he didn't know how to fulfill his paternal responsibilities or how to show his fatherly love. Combined with his fascination with a fast-paced lifestyle, Tony could be considered a completely unfit father, though he himself was unaware of this fact. What he cared about most at the moment was the red suitcase in front of him. Although father and son didn't communicate much on a daily basis, showcasing their latest research achievements to each other had become their most tacit way of communication. 
Tony approached this seemingly useless new invention out of curiosity and couldn't help but reach out and touch it. With just this touch, the metallic red suitcase began to change. A circular LED light in the middle emitted a soft yellow glow, and the lid on the top of the suitcase opened. Hiss. 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 With the supply of gas from the air pump inside the suitcase, the large white fabric inside the case rapidly inflated, eventually transforming into a chubby inflatable robot. This huge white inflatable robot had rounded lines, a single expression, a large belly, and two small short legs, resembling an oversized cotton candy. Then, to Tony's astonished gaze, this adorable and soft-looking creature wobbled its way in front of him, raising its chubby right hand and beckoning, Hello, I'm Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. I have detected that you need medical care. Shall we begin the diagnosis now? Upon hearing Baymax's question, Tony could only nod in a daze. The idea of an inflatable intelligent robot was brilliant, and if Mark were here right now, even with his acerbic tongue, he would not be able to resist praising this genius idea. With its pure white appearance and approachable design, this medical robot had already scored 59 out of 100 in Tony's eyes. The remaining 41 points would depend on whether its diagnostic methods were convenient and the accuracy of the diagnosis results. Your health assistant, Baymax, will now diagnose you. I will scan you. Scan complete. Wow, hyperspectral lenses, not a bad idea. That gives it a passing score of 60%. So, what are the results? Analysis complete. Baymax projected the information it had scanned from Tony onto its large white belly using its internal projection device and compared it with its own database, as well as analyzed it using its microcomputer. Master, according to my diagnosis, you are in a severely subhealthy state with mild shoulder and neck issues. Additionally, based on traditional Chinese medicine theory, your symptoms are consistent with kidney deficiency. I suggest you engage in appropriate physical exercise and complement it with wolfberry tea for treatment. Zero points, zero points, zero points. After hearing the two words from Baymax, its score in Tony's mind completely dropped to zero. I'm the eight-pronged night slayer, how dare you say I have kidney deficiency? This is a misdiagnosis. Master, based on your description, Baymax diagnosed this as kidney indeficiency caused by excessive indulgence. I suggest you control your frequency of sexual activities and engage in more outdoor activities beneficial to your physical and mental health. That's ridiculous. Baymax's response infuriated Tony, and his angry roar woke up Mark, who was resting in the room. What's going on, Dad? Why are you back so early, without any women by your side? Do you have kidney deficiency? Mark? who had just woken up, hadn't grasped the situation and took a stab at Tony. Nonsense, nonsense. How could I have kidney deficiency? I'm perfectly healthy. I came home early because I have to showcase Stark Industries' latest weapons for the military tomorrow morning. Your invention is no good, the diagnosis results are completely inaccurate. How is that possible? Tony's face-saving words immediately snapped Mark out of his drowsiness. You're just being stubborn because you want to save face. Watch me demonstrate it to you. After saying that, Mark ran into the room and took out a roll of adhesive tape. He stood beside Tony and pulled out a strip of tape, saying, watch this. He stuck the tape to Tony's hairy arm and quickly ripped it off. Ouch. The stimulation of the hair being pulled made Tony cry out, what's the matter? That hurt. Mark didn't say anything but looked at the large white robot in front of him, waiting for something. Master, I noticed that you signaled pain, indicating that you need medical care. Please indicate your level of pain on a scale of 1 to 10. At this moment, a new image was projected onto the belly of the large white robot, displaying different levels of pain using emoji expressions. Is it physical or psychological pain? Tony, in order to maintain his reputation as a playboy, decided to give this guy a hard time. Now I will scan you. Tony refused to cooperate, and the large white robot activated its hyperspectral lens again. Scan complete. You have a mild superficial abrasion on your forearm. I recommend using an antibacterial spray. What are the specific ingredients in the spray? Tony now resembled a passenger on a plane looking for trouble, causing mischief in every possible way. The main ingredient is bactericin. Unfortunately, I'm allergic to that. 
According to the analysis, you are not allergic to bactericin, but you have a mild allergy to crayfish. All right, you got that right. After demonstrating this, Tony also understood the capabilities of the large white robot and reluctantly extended his arm. The chubby right hand of the large white robot extended a finger, and a hiss sound came out as the built-in bactericin spray was ejected, evenly covering the damaged skin on Tony's forearm. It seems you've put a lot of effort into programming this guy. Of course, I had Jarvis help me collect over 10,000 medical measures, and I've incorporated all of them. Mark pressed a button on the chest of the large white robot, and a green medical chip popped out. With this, Baymax can be called a healthcare assistant. Tony nodded and patted the belly of the large white robot, saying, polyvinyl alcohol fiber, huh? Yes, I wanted to design something harmless and friendly. It looks like a walking marshmallow, unintentionally offensive. I'm a robot, I can't be offended. This time, Tony was truly charmed by it. He leaned closer to the head of the large white robot and took a look. Why use hyperspectral lenses instead of holographic scanning devices? To reduce costs, this version of Baymax was designed according to market strategies, limiting the costs of materials and equipment. But I will give it a major upgrade later, with nano-resin skin and holographic scanning and projection devices. What about the framework? Is it made of titanium alloy? No, it's carbon fiber. That makes sense, it's lighter. Oh. Looking through the polyvinyl alcohol fiber skin of the large white robot, Tony saw the mechanical parts that impressed him. The super braking system, you actually made it. It's nothing, after all, the theoretical research has already confirmed its feasibility. I just adjusted a few parameters for practical use. How about its carrying capacity? Tony asked excitedly. Baymax is equipped with a miniaturized version of the super braking system, and it can currently lift objects weighing about 500 kilograms. Well done, kid. I'll offer $300 million, and I want to see the design parameters of Baymax in my inbox tonight. $900 million, and it's limited to the mechanical data only. Deal. After understanding the mechanical technology used in it, Tony now looked at Baymax in front of him as if it were a shining diamond. You did a great job. Here's a lollipop for you. At this moment, Baymax appropriately took out a lollipop and handed it to Tony. That's nice. Tony rolled his eyes and accepted it. I can't enter sleep mode until I receive a satisfactory evaluation of my service. All right then, I'm satisfied with your service. Receiving a satisfactory evaluation, Baymax walked back to the red suitcase with a swaying motion and stepped inside. Hiss, hiss, hiss. With the sound of air being released, the body of Baymax deflated, the lid of the suitcase closed, and it once again turned into an inconspicuous red suitcase. It can help many people. Indeed, it can also earn a lot of money for Stark Industries. The evil capitalist. Your food, clothing, and shelter are all provided by this evil capitalist, you brat. By the way, what energy source does it use? Graphene batteries. Tony looked bewilderedly at Mark beside him, clearly puzzled by the term he mentioned. For Tony's lack of knowledge about graphene, Mark wasn't surprised. When Mark initially designed Baymax, considering the issues of battery life and charging, he didn't follow the original design and use lithium batteries with a supercapacitor charger. Instead, he considered using graphene batteries, which are stable in nature, charge quickly, and have powerful energy storage capabilities. But after searching the internet, scientific journals, and magazines, Mark discovered that scientists in this world hadn't even discovered the potential of graphene, this incredible super material. Since there were no ready-made materials to use, he had to do it himself, self-sufficiently. So Mark started with the preparation of graphene, spending more than half a year step by step, and finally manufactured his ideal graphene battery. Now that Tony doesn't know about graphene, Mark won't miss this opportunity to show off in front of him. Graphene is a two-dimensional carbon nanomaterial composed of carbon atoms with sp2 hybridized orbitals, forming a hexagonal honeycomb lattice. I continuously peeled off graphite using the micromechanical exfoliation method and discovered this nanomaterial consisting of only one layer of carbon atoms. Graphene has excellent optical, electrical, and mechanical properties. Due to its unique internal structure, it possesses excellent conductivity and optical performance. 
I utilize the characteristics of lithium ions shuttling rapidly and extensively between the graphene surface and the electrode to develop a new energy battery, which is the graphene battery currently used in Baymax. The energy storage capacity of a graphene battery is 10 times that of an equivalent lithium battery, and its charging speed is a thousand times faster than traditional batteries. Moreover, graphene also has excellent strength, making it the strongest material among all known materials and suitable as a new type of protective material in the military field. Its outstanding optical properties can also be used to manufacture laser weapons. It can be said that graphene is an almost omnipotent and miraculous material. After listening to Mark's explanation of graphene, Tony stood frozen in place. Who am I, where am I, where do I come from, and where am I going? Tony Stark at this moment was completely stunned by Mark's stunning performance. I'm Tony Stark, and I'm calling you a little genius. I never expected your research to progress to such a level. It completely subverts my understanding of nanomaterials. Of course, after all, when you and a certain unnamed lady were romping in bed, I was immersed in the ocean of knowledge. Mark's frank remarks made Tony feel extremely embarrassed, so he changed the subject. So, when you accepted the offer just now, you specifically mentioned that it only includes the mechanical data. The reason lies here, right? The graphene battery and graphene material data are not considered part of the mechanical data but rather material-related data. And you called me the evil capitalist, but I think you're the one who's being secretive. Name your price, I want to buy this technology. Billion US dollars. So cheap. Tony couldn't believe it. It's a licensing fee, and it's for one year. He truly is my own son. Deal. By the way, what would you like to have for dinner, you little brat? How about a cheeseburger? Jarvis, order food. Understood, sir. The next morning, Tony intended to rest well to prepare for today's new weapon presentation. However, he ended up staying up all night, reading through the expensive technical documents he bought from his own son, Mark. This kid really inherited the high IQ of our Stark family. The contents of these documents have benefited me greatly. Good morning, sir. Miss Potts is waiting for you in the living room. I know, I'll wash my face and change clothes, then I'll go. What about that brat Mark? Is he awake? Master Mark said he wanted to develop a chip for a Kung Fu master, turning Baymax into his personal bodyguard. He stayed up again until 2 a.m. and hasn't woken up yet. Wake him up. This kid, I couldn't even sleep well, and he dares to oversleep. Absolutely unacceptable. Tony, also a genius, felt a bit inferior in his expertise in the mechanical field and decided to reclaim his dignity by involving his father. In this way, Mark, who was still discussing life with Zhou Gong, a reference to the Chinese concept of the god of dreams, reluctantly woke up early due to his unreliable old man's wounded ego. Good morning, Jarvis. Good morning, Master Mark. Good morning, little Mark. Hmm. Suddenly, a melodious female voice interrupted, causing Mark, who was about to go to the wash basin to freshen up, to pause. He turned his head and saw a slender blonde lady dressed in a women's suit. Pepper, sister. What are you doing here? Did that beastly old man of mine finally reach out his wicked claws to you? Mark recognized the person and asked with excitement. Why are you talking nonsense? I'm here to remind Mr. Stark of his schedule today. Since I have to stay behind to take care of company affairs and couldn't go to Afghanistan with him, I need to brief him on the schedule and prevent him from oversleeping and missing the agreed time with the military. And how many times have I told you? You should call me aunt. I'm almost thirty years old. How can anyone still call me sister? I don't care. Pepper, aunt, you're still young and beautiful. Calling you sister is only appropriate. Wait a minute. Mark seemed to remember something, his eyes widened suddenly, and he asked in astonishment, did you mention Afghanistan just now? Yes, what's wrong? So Tony is going to Afghanistan for a new weapon demonstration. That's right. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. I forgot that it's already April 2010. I've been so busy. Fortunately, when I was researching graphene materials, I prepared that thing in advance. I hope it can be of some use. Pepper, wait for me for a moment. Don't let the stinky old man leave before I come out. 
Knowing that his father is about to depart for Afghanistan, where the life-changing event happened, Mark instructed Pepper and then turned back to his room. Wait, Mark, what are you going to do? Bang! Before she could finish her sentence, Pepper saw the door of Mark's room slam shut. She could only roll her eyes helplessly and muttered, Really, both father and son are so unreliable. Hurry up. I can only delay it for a while. Although helpless, Pepper still shouted into the room, assuring Mark that she agreed to his request. Got it, I'll be quick. Hearing the response accompanied by tinkling sounds from Mark's room, Pepper knew very well that the genius syndrome had struck. Again. In fact, Mark was also helpless. Even though he was a time traveler, he couldn't tell others about future events. Otherwise, his unreliable father would consider him insane and send him for treatment. He could only take detours and provide his father with life-saving items to prevent unintended consequences. He didn't want Tony to end up as the invincible Eastern unbeatable instead of becoming Iron Man shaking her head, Pepper decided not to inquire about what Mark was doing and instead asked about Tony's preparations. Jarvis, is Tony ready? Sir, he is changing clothes. You can proceed to the dining room and enjoy the breakfast prepared by the chef. Thank you, Jarvis. But I have already had my meal. I'll wait for him in the dining room. We have a tight schedule today, and when he has breakfast, I can brief him on the matters. Saying that, Pepper stood up from the sofa and prepared to walk to the dining room in the villa. However, she accidentally bumped her toe against the corner of the coffee table. Ouch, that hurts. She inhaled sharply, suppressing the urge to cry out. But as she squatted down and saw her slightly swollen and reddened toe, tears welled up in her eyes. Suddenly, a strange sound caught her attention. Pepper looked up and saw an open suitcase not far away. In the middle of the suitcase, a white object was inflating rapidly, soon turning into a plump fellow. Master, your personal health assistant Baymax noticed that you mentioned a need for medical care. Please rate your pain level on a scale of 1 to 10. Looking at the inflatable robot that appeared harmless and natural, Pepper had no defenses and instinctively replied, but I'm not sure what level it has reached. Now Baymax will scan you. The big black eyes of Baymax emitted a blue glow after opening the hyperspectral lens. The light swept over Pepper and quickly disappeared. Scan complete. According to the analysis, your left big toe is swollen and painful due to external trauma, without any fractures. It is determined as a soft tissue contusion. It is recommended to use chloroethane rapid pain relief spray. Okay. All right. Pepper was stunned by Baymax's performance and nodded, agreeing to the treatment plan it provided. SSSH, Baymax bent its short legs and clumsily squatted in front of Pepper, then extended a finger and sprayed the pain relief spray on the affected area. It doesn't hurt anymore, amazing. Rapid pain relief spray is just the current treatment plan. To speed up recovery, please remember to apply hot compresses tonight and use anti-inflammatory medication to reduce inflammation and swelling. Okay, thank you, Baymax. Please provide feedback on Baymax's service. Baymax cannot enter sleep mode until you express satisfaction. Extremely satisfied. You can rest now. Receiving a satisfactory evaluation, Baymax wobbled back to its charging box, waiting for its master's next summons. So, personal health assistant, it's pretty good, isn't it? Tony, who had appeared in the living room without anyone noticing, looked at Pepper with a proud expression. Baymax is really great. How did you come up with this genius idea of having a personal health assistant? Excited by the healing experience Baymax provided, Pepper asked Tony with enthusiasm. Well. Tony's face became awkward. Actually, it wasn't my idea. Baymax is Mark's invention. That makes sense. With your brain, how could you design such an adorable and silly robot like Baymax? It seems like Mark will surpass you as a father in no time. You have to step up your game. Pepper didn't spare Tony any face and inserted a knife into him, making his already awkward expression even worse. To save face, Tony immediately changed the subject. He said, if you like it, I'll have the brat make another one for you. He wouldn't dare disobey his father's command, he he. Humph, with the relationship between Mark and me, I can handle it without your intervention. Alright, let's stop chatting and get back to business. 
your schedule for the next few days is packed. First. Pepper, being Tony's most trusted secretary, quickly shifted her attention to work tasks. All right, these are the arrangements we discussed with the military. I've sent a copy of the schedule to your email. After briefing Tony on her own work, Pepper didn't forget about Mark's request. She glanced at the time and instead of mentioning their departure, she said, I told you yesterday that the upcoming days would be busy, and I wanted you to go home early and rest. I didn't expect you to be up this late. Although Pepper didn't see it with her own eyes, based on her years of understanding Tony, combined with his exhausted complexion and dark circles, she believed she was close to the truth. Hearing the emphasis in Pepper's words and her disdainful expression, Tony immediately explained with an innocent look, you misunderstood me. I did go straight home after work last night. It was that brat, you know. The technology he used on Baymax was just fascinating. I spent the whole night reading related materials, and that's why I'm not feeling well. Is that so? Pepper was somewhat skeptical. It's true. If you don't believe me, ask Mark. All right, let's assume what you said is true. Seeing Tony using their son as a shield, Pepper reluctantly believed his explanation. What do you mean, let's assume? I. Tony wanted to explain further, but he was interrupted by Mark, who suddenly opened the door and came out of his room. Dad, come over here and see what I've prepared for you. Mark, excitedly dragging a set of silver gray suit, waved and called Tony. What strange thing have you come up with now? Curious, Tony, accompanied by Pepper, walked to the entrance of Mark's room. What do you mean by strange? You're just jealous that I have more talent than you. This suit is made with graphene nanomaterials and carbon fiber framework. Plus, I just finished programming the Kung Fu Master Chip last night. After wearing it, not only will it protect your torso from heat and cold weapons, but it will also instantly turn you into a martial arts expert. Yes, this suit was specially made by Mark for Tony's trip to Afghanistan, inspired by a movie he had watched in his previous life, The Tuxedo, starring Jackie Chan. However, for convenience and style, Mark didn't completely replicate the design from the movie. Instead, he created a slim-fit fashionable suit. Due to time constraints, actually, Mark was too engrossed in his ocean of knowledge and forgot to keep track of time, Mark couldn't achieve the variety of abilities of the magical tuxedo from the movie. He could only temporarily install the Kung Fu Master Chip that was originally meant for Baymax on the suit. But Mark believed that with this suit, Tony would be able to escape unscathed during the attack in Afghanistan, at least without having a large lump on his chest. You're overthinking it. With so many soldiers from the military protecting me, how could I possibly be in danger? This trip is perfectly safe, so don't worry. Although Tony said that, deep down, he still took the protective suit Mark made. But since it's your thoughtfulness, I'll give it a try. After all, it looks pretty good. Even though Tony felt moved inside, he couldn't express it directly due to his tsundra nature. He hadn't learned how to express himself properly yet. However, deep in his heart, Tony made a decision. After this trip, he would make an effort to repair the relationship between him and his son, making up for his past negligence. Afghanistan, Bagram Air Base. General, hello. Hello, Mr. Stark. The general shook Tony's outstretched hand and said, I'm looking forward to your weapon demonstration today. Thank you. In a desolate testing ground, Tony wore the silver-gray slim-fit suit tailored for him by Mark. He wore a pair of tea-colored gold-framed sunglasses and gave a serious speech before the weapon demonstration. Fear or respect, which is better? In my opinion, both are excessive, aren't they? Therefore, I humbly present the flagship product of Stark Industries, the Freedom Series, a missile system that incorporates our patented impact technology. People often say the best weapon is the one that doesn't need to be used, but I respectfully disagree. I prefer weapons that you only need to use once. My father did it this way, my country did it this way, and so far, it has been very successful. Find an excuse, launch this thing, and I guarantee you the bad guys won't want to crawl out of their holes again. As soon as he finished speaking, Tony waved his hand to the artillery battery, signaling to launch the missile. Whoosh, as a missile swiftly ascended, heading towards the predetermined targets in the range behind Tony, it suddenly disintegrated and split into dozens of smaller missiles when it approached the target. For reference, this is our Jericho missile. 
Along with Tony's words, a violent shockwave erupted after delivering a devastating blow to the target several kilometers away. The strong airflow even blew off the hats of the soldiers present. The demonstration was incredibly successful, and the objective of this trip had been achieved. Tony approached a large metal crate and took out pre-prepared glasses and champagne. For every deal over $500 million, I'll give one of these as a gift. Here's to peace. Tony raised his glass in a toast and drank it all in one go. At this moment, the triumphant Tony was unaware that a conspiracy against him was brewing in the shadows. With the deal sealed, an excited Tony chose not to board the specially prepared armored vehicle but instead got into a regular military car, finding it as a bit of amusement on the otherwise boring journey. His good friend Colonel Rhodes didn't persuade him otherwise and let Tony indulge in his quirks. I'll be right behind you to protect you. I'll meet you at the base. All right, see you at the base. Brave soldiers, let's head to our destination. Inside the car, feeling the engine roar as the military vehicle raced across the sandy terrain, the bumpy road tested the limits of the tires and suspension. Tony felt his blood boiling with excitement and passion. Hey, young man, do you have a girlfriend? Tony suddenly asked a young soldier, fully armed and with a handsome appearance, sitting beside him. Not yet, sir. The young man, evidently not a seasoned soldier who had been in the military for years, straightened his posture and replied loudly. All right, relax, buddy. I'm just having a chat with you guys. And I'm not your commanding officer, after all. The journey is long and boring, we have to find some amusement for ourselves. As he spoke, Tony unbuttoned his suit jacket and took off his tie from around his neck. It's really hot in the desert. Uh, Mr. Stark. A soldier mustered up the courage and probed, I heard that you've been in bed with the cover girl from last year's Maxim magazine for all twelve months. Is that true? This seasoned soldier was clearly more experienced than the young man earlier, bringing up a topic that everyone was interested in. Well, that's... Boom! Before the soldiers could hear the answer they were eagerly anticipating, a shell landed in the middle of the convoy, interrupting the words Tony was about to speak. The vehicle was overturned by the blast, and the soldiers inside the car were all knocked unconscious to varying degrees of injury. Only Tony, who was protected in the middle, miraculously escaped unharmed. Struggling to climb out of the wreckage, Tony looked at the scene before him and quickly took out his phone to call for help. But before he could make the call, a missile landed next to him. Boom! Another explosion hit, sending Tony flying. Thanks to the protection of the graphene suit, his torso was not harmed by the blast. However, due to his previous carelessness in unbuttoning his jacket, the explosion's shockwave couldn't protect his heart. Tony's chest was struck by shrapnel, and his life hung by a thread. Before losing consciousness, he saw a clear emblem imprinted on the remnants of the missile that attacked him. Dot. When Tony woke up again, the environment around him had undergone a drastic change. The surroundings appeared to be a dim and dry cave, and he found himself lying on a folding iron bed. Turning his head, he saw an unfamiliar man, using the faint light to trim his beard. Feeling something unusual in his chest, Tony struggled to lift his head and look down at his chest, where he discovered a peculiar device. Two wires extended from it and connected to a battery beside the bed. Without any hesitation, Tony reached out to remove the strange device. If I were you, I wouldn't do that. The unfamiliar man spoke up, stopping Tony's action. What have you done to me? After managing to calm the turmoil in his heart, Tony calmly posed his question to the stranger. What have I done? I saved your life. I managed to remove some shrapnel, but due to their small size and the limitations of this place, there are still some remnants. They could travel with your blood and potentially reach your heart at any moment. Seeing Tony's questioning expression, he picked up a small glass bottle from the nearby table and showed it to Tony. Do you want to take a look? I have a souvenir here, take a look. Taking the small bottle, Tony saw the tiny fragments through the faint light. The stranger continued speaking, I have seen many people in our village with this kind of injury. We call them savers, because a week later, the shrapnel enters vital organs. What about this? What is it? Tony put down the bottle containing the fragments and tapped the metal lump on his chest. That's an electromagnet powered by a car battery. It prevents the shrapnel from reaching your heart. 
Now Tony regretted not buttoning up that damn button on his suit properly. Did you see the suit I was wearing? he asked. Well, it's on that table over there, but don't expect to find anything. If it was left here, it means everything on it has already been scavenged, the man replied. No, the suit itself is important. It was a gift from my son. Thinking about Mark and Pepper's saddened expressions upon hearing the news of his attack from thousands of miles away, Tony felt a sense of guilt for not cherishing the important people around him. We actually met at the Berlin Tech Conference. I don't remember. Of course, you wouldn't remember. If I were as drunk as you were, I would have passed out long ago, let alone giving a speech about integrated circuits. Where are we? Tony asked the question he most wanted to know at the moment. Quick, get up, get up. Before answering Tony's question, sensing someone approaching outside the cave, he immediately urged Tony to stand up. Do as I do, quickly raise your hands. Tony hadn't figured out the situation yet, so he just followed along. But when he saw the weapon held by the incoming terrorist, he couldn't stay calm anymore. Those are guns I created, how did they get their hands on them? Do you understand what I'm saying? Follow along with me. Walking ahead, the person who seemed like the leader of the terrorists saw Tony, who had already woken up. He spoke rapidly in a language Tony had never heard before. Seeing this, the unfamiliar man beside Tony translated for him, he said welcome, Tony Stark, the greatest executioner in American history. He is honored to meet you and hopes you can manufacture the missile for him, the Jericho missile, which you tested. This one. Tony took a clear photo from the terrorist leader's hand and showed it to Tony. Realizing the other party's intention, Tony was dumbfounded. His whereabouts and weapons, which should have been kept strictly confidential, were all exposed. He himself was severely injured with Stark Industries weapons obtained from unknown sources. And now, he was being threatened to work for terrorists using the weapons he invented. Tony understood that someone had betrayed him, but it was also because of this that he couldn't believe that as the soul of Stark Industries, he had been sold. I won't do it. Tony, who had never experienced the harsh realities of society, couldn't be swayed by just a few words. So, under the leader's command, they demonstrated their sincerity through their actions. After being tormented and educated, Tony, led by the terrorists, arrived outside the cave. Here, there was massive firepower capable of destroying a small city. The inscriptions on each weapon were especially glaring. What are you thinking? The unfamiliar man continued to act as the leader's translator. You have stockpiled many weapons I manufactured. He says he has all the components to manufacture the Jericho missile. He wants you to list the materials immediately and start working on it. Once it's completed, they will let you go. He won't. Tony pretended to agree and reached out to shake hands with the leader. That's right, the unfamiliar man agreed. During the crucial time that followed, Tony, encouraged by the unfamiliar man, decided to play along and secretly work on creating hope to escape. He finally knew the name of his savior, Insen, and also learned the name of the terrorist group that kidnapped him, they called themselves the Ten Rings. Taking advantage of the terrorists' desire for the Jericho missile, Tony obtained a rudimentary but usable workshop and had a heap of materials given to him to manufacture the missile. Now, Tony Stark, it's up to your brilliant mind to figure out how to escape. There are people waiting for you at home. Insen, come and help me. Boosting his morale, Tony and Insen began their plan. Tony first used the high-purity palladium element among the available materials to create an arc reactor, which could generate 3 billion joules of energy per second to power the electromagnet in his chest. This allowed him to break free from the constraints of the battery and move freely. It can provide you with enough energy to live for four lifetimes. Insen exclaimed. Or run a large-scale machinery for 50 minutes. Then he handed a pile of blueprints to Insen. What's this? Insen asked. He revealed his secret weapon that he planned to use to escape, stack the blueprints and take a look. Wow! It's amazing! When all the blueprints were overlaid, Insen saw an imposing suit of armor made of steel. I call it Mark I, named after my son. Many of his ingenious ideas have given me a lot of inspiration. He will definitely be as amazing as you in the future. No, he will be even more amazing than me. The plan progressed smoothly, and under the joint efforts of Tony and Insen, 
the various components of Mark I were gradually being constructed. However, it was precisely because the plan was going smoothly that both of them let their guard down. They forgot that they were in the den of wolves, and every move they made would be observed by the Ten Rings. As the components of Mark I continued to accumulate, the monitors began to realize that what they were creating was far from the appearance of the Jericho missile. After threatening them with their subordinates, the Ten Rings gave them a final deadline, they had to hand over the assembled Jericho missile the next day. Time was running out, and tonight was destined to be a sleepless night. But the tension did not make them lose their composure. With orderly completion of all the armor components, the plan finally reached a critical moment. So, are you ready to move? Insen asked, helping Tony put on the armor. No problem, I've never felt better. Suddenly, Insen frowned and stopped his movements. He heard footsteps coming from outside the door. Insen, Insen, Stark. Where are you? Come out. A terrorist's voice came from outside, sounding extremely anxious. They found us. What do we do, Tony? You say something first, keep them at bay. But they're speaking Hungarian. Then say this. But I don't know it. Well, what do you know? Insen thought for a moment and began responding to the person outside in a language he often communicated with the leader of the Ten Rings. But it was of no use. The terrorists who couldn't understand what he was saying decided to come in and see for themselves. Quickly unlocking the door, they were about to enter. But instead of finding Tonin Insen begging for mercy, they were met with a preset explosion trap. Boom! The blazing fireball devoured both of them. The loud noise alarmed the terrorists throughout the Ten Rings base. Go, bring them here. Taking advantage of the time delayed by the explosion, Insen began assisting Tony in loading the control system for Mark I. However, the approaching footsteps outside the door made Insen very anxious. They're coming. Don't worry, we'll succeed once we finish everything. We need more time. Suddenly, Insen seemed to make a decision. I'll go buy you some time. Seeing Insen about to rush out of the door, Tony immediately stopped him. Insen. Stick to the plan. But Insen was not moved at all and continued walking towards the outside. Wait. Wait. This time Tony shouted even louder. At least put on my suit. Are you suggesting that I die in a more dignified manner? Insen couldn't help but feel a mix of amusement and tears at Tony's request. No, do you remember me telling you that this is a gift from my son? Yes, I remember. He's a genius, even though he's still underage. He's a genius that rivals me without any doubt. This suit utilizes a new type of nanomaterial he invented, which effectively protects your body to the maximum extent in the face of various weapon attacks. He will definitely become even more outstanding and great than you. He knows how to replace destruction with protection. After saying that, Insen put on the suit decisively and walked out of the room. Outside the room, the thin and weak Dr. Insen had already picked up the firearms left by the terrorists on the ground and engaged in a firefight with the enemy. Meanwhile, the loading progress of the control system had just reached 50%. Without the coordinated control system, Tony was trapped in the heavy steel armor and couldn't move. Anxiously, he stared at the progress bar on the screen, praying that Insen would come out and scathe from the onslaught of the Ten Commandments gang. Insen, rushing out of the room with a rifle in hand, wasn't as miserable as Tony had imagined. Surprisingly, he felt far from powerless. Insen had made up his mind to sacrifice himself to ensure Tony's escape, but he was amazed by his current state. In the face of the enemy, his body seemed disconnected from himself, effortlessly maneuvering and evading the bullets fired by the enemy. Even if a few stray bullets hit him, they couldn't penetrate the protective layer of his suit. The rifle in his hand seemed to have an aimbot. After automatic targeting, a surge of electricity stimulated his index finger, and with a bang, the enemy in front of him was shot dead with a bullet to the forehead. Stark. Your son is a damn genius, a genius greater than you. I'm going godlike today. Insen shouted, not caring if Tony could hear his words. After venting out his excitement, he continued on his godlike path. In fact, this was the effect of the advanced martial arts chip that Mark had previously installed in the suit. Mark had recorded data in the chip, 
including the combat techniques of martial arts masters from various countries and even the elite soldiers of special forces. Combined with the auxiliary systems Mark had added, Insen's perfect accuracy was not surprising. When Insen had eliminated the first group of terrorists to arrive, Tony, fully armed after the control system finished loading, arrived behind him. Seeing the bodies of the enemy lying on the ground, Tony couldn't contain his surprise. Insen, you didn't tell me that besides being a scholar, you're also a sharpshooter. No, no, no. Tony, your son's invention is amazing. I feel like I've been reborn today. This suit is so damn awesome. Tony now regretted not wearing this suit more tightly. But you're wrong about one thing. It's not just about feeling reborn, we're about to be reborn. Tony controlled the slightly cumbersome Mark I armor, protecting Insen as they wreaked havoc in the base. With the powerful firepower of the armor and Insen's agility, they were invincible. After successfully leaving the cave, they detonated the Ten Commandments gang's arsenal, reducing the base to ruins. Ah, the two of them, finally escaping, didn't feel particularly wonderful at the moment because the propulsion system of the Mark I malfunctioned, and they were now suspended in mid-air several tens of meters high. Bang! Tony, along with the Mark I armor, crashed heavily into a pile of sand on the ground. The strong impact caused the bulky armor to fall apart into pieces. On the other hand, Insen, who had emerged and scathed, praised Mark for his thoughtful design of the suit. As Insen was about to land and bear the impact, the suit inflated like an airbag in a car, enveloping Insen and turning him into a sphere, saving him from harm. Ha ha ha, I'm reborn. Today, Insen is reborn. Sob, sob, sob. Insen, who had regained his freedom, collapsed to the sandy ground and burst into tears. Ah. Uh. Not bad, Insen. What's wrong? Why are you crying? Tony, who had finally crawled out of the sand, looked at Insen, who was sobbing loudly, with great confusion. Sob, sob, sob. I was prepared to sacrifice myself when I rushed out to buy you time. My family, they all died at their hands, and I thought it would be fitting for me to die alongside them. But in the end, I survived. I regained my freedom and a new life. I can once again experience the beauty of life. Promise me, Tony, don't waste your life, don't squander your time. I promise you, Insen. This is a promise from Tony Stark, who regained a new life today. At the New York Air Force Base, the military transport plane carrying Tony safely landed on the airport runway upon his return from Afghanistan. Insen didn't come along, he stayed in his hometown of Kamira, hoping to contribute to its peace. Tony didn't stop Insen from pursuing his own ideals and values. Before parting ways, he gifted the Mark suit, which was originally given to him, to Insen, hoping that with its help, Insen could gradually approach his own goals. With Colonel Rhodes' support, Tony walked out of the aircraft. Sharp-eyed Tony could already see Mark, Pepper, and Happy waiting for him not far away on the tarmac. Are your eyes red because you shed tears for your long-lost boss? These are tears of joy. I hate job hunting, Pepper retorted stubbornly. All right, the vacation is over. Dad, you're such a loser. Even wearing the protective suit I gave you, you managed to get yourself into this state, making Pepper worry about you every day, unable to eat or sleep properly. And what about you, you little brat? Aren't you worried about me? I'm not worried about you. I've gotten used to not having you around. Well, rest assured, no one will ever separate us father and son again. After Tony finished speaking, he attempted to embrace Mark with his uninjured left hand, giving him a fatherly hug. However, Mark unexpectedly took a step back, dodging the embrace. Oh, gross, Dad. Have you been brainwashed by terrorists or driven insane? Doing something that's unlike you. Tony, Dash, welcome back, sir. Please get in the car. Happy opened the back seat door and welcomed the few of them inside. Where are we going? To the hospital, Pepper replied without hesitation. No, we're not going, Tony refused. Why not, Tony? You need to go to the hospital. Pepper glared at Tony with some anger. I said we're not going. Even with your concerned look, Pepper, I'm throwing a tantrum, Tony replied, displaying a childish attitude. Fine, Pepper. Mark here will be the peacemaker. If we're not going to the hospital, 
then we won't. Besides, I've put Baymax in the trunk. If there's anything wrong, Baymax will diagnose it, and I'll personally take him to the hospital, Mark interjected. That's right, Pepper. I know my own body. Even if you don't believe me, don't you trust Baymax, the invention of Mark? I've been held captive for three months, and now there are two things I want to do. First, I want a cheeseburger, and second, I want. Tony's words were interrupted by Pepper. That's enough, Tony. You're shameless. Pepper interrupted, her face turning red. It's not what you think. I want to hold a press conference. A press conference? Yes, but before that, happy, drive. Let's go find a cheeseburger. Stark Convention Center, backstage after the press conference. Baymax, examine this old man's body. Understood, master. Scan initiated. Scan complete. Based on the data analysis, the patient has multiple soft tissue contusions and open wounds, a slight fracture in the right forearm, residual metallic foreign objects in the chest area that may cause major organ bleeding, accompanied by symptoms of mental lethargy and excessive fatigue. I suggest you refrain from consuming junk food like cheeseburgers, adjust your condition through sufficient sleep and a balanced diet, and proceed to the next phase of treatment. Dad. Mark looked at Tony and reminded him. All right, I'm satisfied with your service, Tony acknowledged and evaluated Baymax's service. And what else? Looking at the palm extended in front of him by Mark, Tony reluctantly placed the last cheeseburger in Mark's hand. Is this enough? For now, it'll do. After the conference, remember to go back and get a good sleep. No more chasing after women. Mark nodded in satisfaction and added another piece of advice. Am I that kind of person? Upon hearing this, Mark showed a look of disdain. Of course, you are. But I've been reborn. I'm not the same Tony as before. Mountains may change, but nature remains. A dog can't stop eating shit. You. You. Are you still my son? It pains me. Despite the mischief between father and son backstage, Pepper, who was organizing and arranging. The event flow on the front stage, encountered a mysterious man. Miss Potts, is that you? Uh, yes, it's me. Faced with the inquiry from this unfamiliar man, Pepper hesitated. Can I talk to you for a moment? I'm not participating in the Q&A session of this reception, but the press conference is about to start. Pepper indicated that the person could raise their question after the meeting. I'm not a reporter. I'm an agent. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Phil Coulson, affiliated with the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division. Are you reciting tongue twisters? Pepper, facing this long and stinky organization name, couldn't help but unleash her sarcastic side. We're still working on that. Miss Potts, we're an independent agency with clearer and more specific goals. We need to inquire about Mr. Stark's specific circumstances during his escape. I'll add it to Tony's schedule, okay? Pepper made an excuse to dismiss Coulson. Thank you. Coulson understood that it couldn't be helped and decided to retreat for now, waiting for the next opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, the press conference is about to begin. Please take your seats according to the seating arrangement. Next, I invite Mr. Tony Stark to the stage for his speech. All right, the reception has started. Don't be so tense, everyone. It's too formal that way. As we all know, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to my father, and I have some questions that I never had the opportunity to ask him. How did he view the company? Did he have struggles and doubts? Maybe he was just like the person in a news documentary. But this time, I saw young soldiers of our country being killed, and it was my weapons that I created to protect them that caused their deaths. I also realized that I have become a member of a system that refuses to take responsibility. Tony's topic gradually deepened, and the atmosphere on site became increasingly heavy. The people in attendance held their breath and focused intently on Tony's speech. Only one person's expression turned increasingly ugly as he sensed something unusual in Tony's words. That person was Obadiah Stain, a senior figure in Stark Industries and Howard Stark's business partner. Mr. Stark, where did you experience all of this? A journalist stood up and asked his question. I had an eye-opening experience there. 
I realized that I could do more for this world than just creating explosions. Therefore, I made a decision, to shut down the weapons manufacturing division of Stark Industries. After Tony announced this decision, Obadiah Stane's face turned completely dark. Tony Stark, damn it dash, furthermore dash, just when the scene had already turned chaotic due to Tony's earth-shattering speech, Tony's talk wasn't over yet. I would like to introduce someone to you all. Perhaps you all already know him, considering that the circulation of your newspapers increased significantly when the news of me having a son broke out. Yes, the person I'm introducing is none other than my son, Mark Stark. Mark possesses mechanical talents that are in no way inferior to mine. His youthful and vibrant mind is filled with fresh ideas that may even open a new door for me. And not long ago, he truly achieved that. Baymax Dash, with Tony's call, the inconspicuous red suitcase placed on the stage automatically opened, and after a while of inflation, Baymax swayed his way to the front of the stage. Hello, I am Baymax, your personal healthcare assistant. Do you require medical care? Wow! The appearance of Baymax caused a wave of exclamations in the audience. And after Tony repeated Mark's experiment using a roll of duct tape, everyone's gaze was fixated on Baymax on the stage. So, as the chairman of Stark Industries, the second decision I am announcing today is that Stark Industries will enter the healthcare industry. With Tony's announcement of this decision, the crowd erupted once again. Obadiah Stane in the audience couldn't sit still anymore and immediately went up to the stage, putting his arm around Tony's shoulder and moving him away from the microphone. All right, I believe you won't have any trouble selling newspapers tomorrow. The good news you should take away from here today is that Tony Stark is back, and he is healthier than ever. All right, today's press conference ends here. Hey, old man. The press conference had just ended, and Mark immediately approached Tony backstage with an unfriendly expression. How come I don't remember authorizing Stark Industries to produce anything? let alone mentioning today that my business would be revealed. As Mark questioned Tony with anger, Tony's eyes wandered around, and he reluctantly replied, actually, it was a spur-of-the-moment decision. As soon as the words left his mouth, Tony noticed a hint of danger in Mark's expression. He hurriedly continued, hold on, don't be hasty. Let me explain. It's no wonder Tony was afraid of Mark's anger. Although they didn't spend much time together as father and son, there were still some memories that made Tony's hair stand on end. He remembered when Mark was six years old. Tony had criticized the magnetic levitation bicycle he had built at the time, calling it a waste of talent and useless. In response, Mark secretly replaced the shower gel in the bathroom with his own concoction of hardening foam, trapping Tony in the bathroom for the whole night. The next day, when the foam lost its effect and Tony managed to escape and was about to confront Mark, Mark said something that left a deep psychological scar, making Tony afraid to provoke Mark's anger again. Hey, Dad, you're out. I wanted to take a few pictures of you and then exhibit you at the entrance. I didn't expect this formula to be so useless, its effect only lasted one night. It was precisely because of this memorable experience that when Tony saw Mark's face, which had already started to turn dark, he immediately explained, although it was a spur-of-the-moment decision to make you appear in front of the national media, think about it. As my son, the future heir of Stark Industries, from the moment you returned to my side, it was impossible to escape the media spotlight. Now you're already 14, and in a few years, you'll be an adult. With me helping you build your image, along with your exceptional talent, when the time comes for you to take over the company from me, the board of directors won't pose any obstacles. But I want to grow up quietly and be an old recluse. Being in the limelight like you, who knows, one day someone might kidnap you to make weapons. Besides, who wants to inherit your Stark Industries? I'm a man who's obsessed with knowledge, I'm too lazy to deal with company affairs. I think you should take advantage of your mild kidney deficiency and have a child with Aunt Pepper to be your successor. Hearing Mark's words, Pepper, who was nearby, blushed on her fair face, and Tony's face turned red as he reacted strongly. He shouted, at such a young age, not studying properly, is it your business to interfere in this matter? Let's get back to business. Regarding the authorization for Baymax, I plan to establish a company in your name specifically to operate all the technology and future inventions you've accumulated over the years. The company will be fully owned by you, and it will only handle everything related to you. As for the authorization fee for Baymax, we'll negotiate after the company is set up. Don't worry, 
I won't shortchange you. All right, I accept your explanation this time, but don't let it happen again. If you dare to make decisions without consulting me in the future, be careful I pour the latest batch of super spicy extract on your underwear. Tony shivered, feeling a bit relieved that he had managed to brush off the situation just now. Otherwise, the consequences would have been unbearable. Rest assured, there won't be a next time. I promise. At that moment, Tony saw Obadiah Stane approaching him with a stern face not far away. He felt delighted in his heart and said, Oh, Obadiah is coming. Judging by his serious expression, he must have something important to discuss with me. Mark, you stay with Aunt Pepper, I have to talk about work. Tony immediately used Obadiah as an excuse to get away from Mark, who he saw as his savior. Wiping the sweat from his forehead, Tony greeted Obadiah, saying, Uncle Obi, is there something you want to talk to me about? You did a good job just now, Tony. Obadiah sarcastically remarked. I think so too, Tony replied, taking advantage of the situation. Tony, how much do you think Stark Industries stock price will drop tomorrow? Obadiah's face grew even darker as he looked at Tony, who still appeared nonchalant. Optimistically, I estimate a drop of 40 points. That's the minimum. Obadiah lit a cigar for himself, trying to calm down. Yeah, it is. Tony, we're weapons manufacturers. Obi, I don't want the only legacy we leave behind to be a pile of casualty numbers. That's our job. We are arms dealers, and we should be manufacturing weapons. Not anymore. I've already announced that Stark Industries is entering the medical field. We will become a more profitable and greater company. Are you talking about relying on Little Mark, that inflatable doll? Don't daydream, Tony. Who would believe something invented by a 14-year-old kid? It can't save Stark Industries' stock price. Then let's talk about the arc reactor. I have high hopes for the field of new energy. Oh please, Tony. The arc reactor is just a gimmick. Building it was just to shut up the media and politicians. As Obadiah spoke, he pointed to the prototype of the arc reactor created by Howard Stark in the middle of the exhibition hall. But he succeeded. Tony insisted. Indeed, but that was a scientific project. Its commercial viability is terrible. We knew before we even built it that the arc reactor technology was a dead end, right? Perhaps. I'm right, aren't I? How long has it been since we made any breakthroughs in this technology? They say it's been 30 years. Can your poker face be any more unpleasant? Tell me, who said that? Who told you that I made a breakthrough in technology? Was it Pepper or Rhodey? Forget it, Tony. I want to see. Pepper or Rhodey? Fine, it was Rhodey. Upon hearing the answer, Tony unbuttoned his shirt and revealed the arc reactor on his chest to Obadiah. It works. All right, all right. Seeing what he wanted, Obadiah wore a greedy smile. He put his arm around Tony's shoulder and affectionately said, Listen to me, Tony. We're a team, you know. As long as we work together, there's nothing we can't achieve, just like your father and I did. Sorry, Obi. I didn't consult with you beforehand, but if I had. Tony, Tony. Obadiah interrupted Tony's attempt to explain. Listen to me. There won't be any more of these incidents, do you understand what I mean? You're right, my father took that route in the past. That's right, Tony. Try to keep a low profile, and leave the upcoming matters to me to handle for you. That guy is definitely up to something. What? Pepper was confused by Mark's sudden remark. I'm talking about that old man, Obadiah. Tony's trouble is definitely connected to him. Mark decided to give Pepper a preemptive warning about Obadiah, who was currently talking with Tony, while appearing to be a kind and caring elder. Mark knew that Obadiah was the mastermind behind Tony's current troubles, but he lacked evidence. Relying solely on his knowledge of the storyline from his past life wouldn't be a valid reason to accuse him. So the best approach was to plant a seed of suspicion in Pepper's mind, influencing Tony's thoughts through her. The only people in the company who knew Tony's schedule were you as his secretary and Obadiah as the vice chairman. Since the terrorists were able to accurately ambush Tony on his usual route, it must have been one of you who leaked the information. I don't believe it was you, Aunt Pepper, so it can only be that old man. 
could it really be him? Pepper felt doubtful upon hearing Mark's analysis. Although she couldn't provide evidence to prove her innocence, she was certain that she hadn't betrayed Tony. If Mark's analysis was correct, then Obadiah. All right, Aunt Pepper, don't dwell on these things. After all, it's just my personal speculation. Please don't spread it around. And I have a favor to ask you. Seeing Mark suddenly feeling a bit embarrassed, Pepper chuckled softly. You don't have to go through this with me. Just tell me what it is, and I'll do my best to help you. I know you and Tony are capable. Don't forget, you promised to customize a special version of Baymax for me before. Don't worry, it'll be a pink custom edition with a cute and lovely voice. Tomorrow, I'll deliver it to your door. I've already come up with a name for it. How about Barbie the Iron Doll? That I think I'll name it myself. How is Stark Industries doing? At half past eight in the evening, Tony returned home exhausted. Although dinner time had passed, for Mark, Tony coming home at this time was considered early. It's none of your business, so stop worrying. I can handle this matter myself. Tony walked over to Mark and ruffled his hair. It's your own mess, and I don't care about it. But I do believe what you said earlier. Mark raised his hand and opened Tony's rough palm. What did I say? You said you found a new lease on life and you're no longer the old Tony Stark. Seeing that you didn't spend the night outside today, I'm willing to believe those words. You little rascal, mocking me like that. You, a kid who hasn't even grown his fur, wouldn't understand the joys of deep communication between adults. As he spoke, Tony narrowed his eyes and made a nostalgic expression. Humph, I can't argue with you. But if Pepper ends up marrying someone else and having children, don't regret it. Got it, I'm already working hard, aren't I? Hurry up and finish the robot you promised her so that I can find an opportunity to give it to Pepper and win her heart. Don't worry, this time I've customized an exclusive pink skin for her, as well as a lowly voice recorded by a famous Disney voice actor. And in addition to the health assistant chip, I've also updated several practical chips like a personal bodyguard chip, a fitness coach chip, and a caring nanny chip, ensuring that Pepper will have a thoughtful life assistant from head to toe, in all aspects of her life. Not bad, not bad. Hmm wait a minute, if you raise her living standards so much, it will make me look like I don't care about her when compared to you, won't it? You're mistaken, old man. Do you think Pepper has been by your side for so long, receiving your undivided love and never leaving you because you care about her enough? No. Is it because you're incredibly handsome? No, it's not. Is it because you're fabulously wealthy, with riches to rival a country? Even less so. It's because you're smart, very smart, smart enough that just your brain alone is sexy enough to attract Pepper's attention. So, you don't even know where your strengths lie, and the robots I make are simply incomparable to you. Listening to you say that, it seems to be true. You, at such a young age, why do you seem to have more experience in relationships than I do? You've been cooped up at home since you were little, you didn't even go to school, so where did you learn all these things? You're outdated, old man. It's the year, 2010 already, and mobile phones can access the internet anytime through 3G networks. The 4G era is about to come. Don't you use the internet regularly? Although the old saying in China is good, in this age of mobile internet, any information and knowledge can be obtained through the internet. These things are already common knowledge. Let me tell you, based on my analysis, as the internet becomes more advanced, with wider reach and faster speeds, we will enter an era of online knowledge payment in the future. I'm already preparing a private tutoring chip for Baymax, as well as related educational cloud platforms. I believe there will be great potential in the future. Upon hearing Mark's analysis of the future situation, Tony's expression became serious as well. He didn't think these words were just child's play. Tony knew how intelligent Mark was, and since he could provide logical and well-supported evidence from various aspects to support his conclusions, Tony was certain that the era of online knowledge payment, as Mark described, would definitely come. Do you have any other thoughts about the future? Share them with me. I underestimated you before, kid. I never expected you to be so knowledgeable without going outside, Tony said. Humph, you never underestimated me. You never even bothered to give me a proper look. Sigh, I understand. 
After all, I'm just an illegitimate child who suddenly appeared in your life, making things difficult for you, Mark replied. Enough, you brat. Stop pretending with me. I'm not falling for your tricks anymore. Let's cut to the chase. How much do you want this time? Tony asked. Well, let's see. The Warren Buffett lunch auction goes for no less than $2 million. I'm providing you with accurate and detailed analysis of the future situation. The value of that surely can't be lower than having a meal, right? Just give me a casual $7,777,000 as a token of appreciation, Mark replied. You're ruthless, Tony said as he took out his checkbook and pen from his pocket. He swiftly wrote down the amount and signed the check. Rip Tony tore off the check and handed it to Mark. There you go, you swindler. He he he, as an illegitimate child, it's always good to have some extra money in my pocket, Mark said, his eyes gleaming as if there were two small gold coins spinning in them. This was a habit Mark carried over from his past life. He had grown up poor, so he had developed an unusual attachment to money. Even though he was born into a wealthy family in this life, he was still an illegitimate child, so Mark preferred to save money himself, just to be safe. After hearing Mark's words, Tony rolled his eyes in disdain. Mark, taking the hint, put the check in his pocket and began expressing his insights into future trends. To call it insights would be an overstatement. It was merely a reference to the trajectory of social development in the previous life, combined with the specific circumstances of this world, to make analytical predictions. After enthusiastically discussing the commercial prospects of big data, cloud services, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and other technologies, based on his vivid impressions from his previous life, Mark realized it was already 2 a.m. He said, All right, I think that's enough for now. I'm really tired. Fine, let's stop here for today. Go get some sleep. Oh, there's one more thing. Tomorrow, you have to help me replace the new arc reactor in my chest. My hand is too big, and I can't reach the wires inside, Tony requested. Upon hearing Tony's request, Mark immediately lost all interest. Forget it. That thing in your chest is disgusting, full of pus. There's no way I'm putting my hand in there, even if you paid me. And what's with you? This is a great opportunity to get closer to Pepper, and you're asking me for help. Tomorrow, when Pepper comes, I'll have the robot I've been working on ready. You can ask her for help. But wouldn't that be a bit inappropriate? Tony hesitated shyly. What if I scare her? Hey! You're ruining your image as a playboy and a smooth talker in my eyes. Haven't you thought that if she's not repulsed by this, it's obvious that she likes you? If she really rejects you because of this, then you should work harder to pursue her. Why are you hesitating about something so harmless and beneficial? Mark exclaimed. Well. Maybe I'll give it a try tomorrow then. Tony finally agreed. All right, Pepper. Wait here for me, and don't you dare open your eyes and peek ahead of time. I'll go get the things now, just wait for me. Pepper had just arrived at the entrance today when Tony led her to the underground garage of the villa. To give her a better surprise, Tony had Jarvis search the internet for him using Mark's method. So, using the methods he learned online, Tony blindfolded Pepper along the way. Is it alright, Tony? What's the matter anyway? I wanted to get the robot that Mark gave me, Pepper said. Forget about Mark, Tony walked up behind her and gently took off her blindfold. Now it's my turn to give you a gift. Look at this. Pepper followed Tony's pointing finger and saw a pink mini suitcase, even smaller than Baymax's charging case. The surface of the suitcase had a matte finish, giving it a stylish and beautiful appearance. In the center of the front, there was a yellow LED light strip in the shape of hearts, obviously a special design for women. Seeing all this in front of her, Pepper's girlish heart was about to burst with excitement. Her watery eyes sparkled with a different kind of brilliance. Go for it, Dad. Mark, who was secretly observing everything outside the glass door of the garage, quietly cheered Tony on. Tony looked at him and nodded in acknowledgement. I got it. Hey. I hope Dad can handle this. He's even more innocent in front of someone he likes than a virgin. I wonder if this great atmosphere will ruin everything. But thanks to what happened with Sister Pepper, I remembered the happiness of spending money on skins in my past life. 
I should design a few more skins for the popular version of the personal health assistant and provide a personalized service for the wealthy. I want the people of this universe to experience the joy of microtransactions too, he 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 he, ignoring Mark, who was already indulging in his own delusions, Tony was ready to take action. How about it, do you like it? This is a personal health assistant specially customized for you, Diamond Barbie. Tony introduced. Upon hearing Tony's introduction, Pepper, who was originally very excited, suddenly had a black line on her face. You're not telling me the truth, are you? Is it really called that? Sensing that the atmosphere was a bit off, Tony quickly changed his words. Uh, that name is what Mark called it. The robot system hasn't been named yet, so now you can give it a name you like. Tony led Pepper, holding her hand, to the specially customized pink robot. He reached out and tapped the heart-shaped symbol in the center of the pink portable charging case. Buzz buzz just like the design of Baymax, the lid of the pink case opened, and the robot enclosed within it began to automatically inflate. In no time, the specially customized, limited-edition personal health assistant that Mark had designed and gifted to Pepper appeared perfectly in front of the two of them. The pink polyvinyl carbon fiber skin was covered with graphene film, making it not only more solid and durable, but also giving it a cute and lovable feeling compared to Baymax's gentleness. At the same time, in order to better suit Pepper's aesthetic preferences, Mark reduced its height in the design, from Baymax's two meters to one meters, and its body was slimmer and more slender than Baymax's. To compress the reminders to such a degree, Tony had put a lot of effort into it as well. Firstly, the internal graphene battery was replaced with a miniature version of the arc reactor, smaller than the one on Tony's chest, capable of supporting this customized model to function normally for a hundred years or engage in combat mode for an hour. The interior was also equipped with a holographic projector and emergency and daily medicine kits specifically designed for women, not to mention the various functional chips designed by Mark. Thanks to the compression of its size, after being stored in the charging case, it was not only small in size but also lightweight, weighing only 1. Kilograms, allowing Pepper to carry it with her weather at home, in the office, on a trip, or on a business trip. Diamond Barbie Series Unit 1 at your service, Master. Hello, I am your personal health assistant, life assistant, personal chef. And personal bodyguard. After Diamond Barbie Unit 1 finished introducing its functions with a clear and pleasant customized lowly voice, Tony wiped the non-existent sweat off his forehead and said, now you can go and give it a name. My program has already set Ms. Pepper as my sole owner based on the information in the database. Please allow me to scan and collect your biological features. After the initial authentication is complete, you can rename me. All right. Pepper walked up to Diamond Barbie, although she was disgusted with the name, but looking at its exquisite appearance, cute image, and the imminent naming privilege, Pepper felt that these details didn't matter anymore. Scanning commencing, scan complete. Recording information, authentication complete. Master, please give me a name. Nini. Before the robot could finish speaking, Pepper blurted out the name she had already thought of, without any hesitation. Tony, who was standing beside them, also felt that the name was very fitting after hearing it. It inexplicably felt like this name had some affinity with him too. It seemed like today's plan was very successful. Modification complete. Today is July 17, 2010. From now on, Nini will take care of the master's daily life, protect the master's life and physical health. Please take good care of me, Master. After saying these words, Nini raised her little hand and bowed a standard 90-degree bow. Pepper's overflowing teenage heart was about to melt when she saw this scene. Nini, I'll rely on you from now on. Understood, Master. If there are no other requests, please evaluate my services. Nini can enter sleep mode only after the Master is satisfied. I am very satisfied, Nini. You can rest now. With a satisfactory evaluation, Nini moved step by step back to the case. After deflating and folding, it once again transformed into a fashionable suitcase. It's worth mentioning that due to the reduced size, Nini could move with more normal steps. However, to conserve energy and prevent collisions with valuable objects, its movements remained as slow as Baymax's in low power mode. How about it? Do you like the gift I gave you? Tony seized the opportunity to ask the question in his heart. 
Of course, I like it, but this is a gift from Mark to me. What does it have to do with you? Pepper held on to Nini's charging case lovingly and completely missed the love signal Tony was sending. You can't say that. I provided some technical suggestions for Nini's design and manufacturing, and last night, I used my father's authority to urge Mark to work overtime and transform it to its current perfect state. So, of course, this can be considered as my gift too. Upon hearing this, Mark outside the door couldn't help but shiver. If it wasn't for Tony's relentless monetary pressure last night, he wouldn't have let Tony babble nonsense inside. Alright, since that's the case, let's consider it as a gift from you and Mark together. Thank you, Tony. After saying that, Pepper put down the charging case she was hugging and gave Tony a big hug, making the experienced player in love blush a little. Pepper, actually, I have one more thing I would like to ask for your help with today. Before that, could you show me your hand? I don't quite understand. Faced with Tony's strange request, Pepper was extremely puzzled. If it weren't for her favorable impression of Tony, she would have already considered him a pervert. Show me. Fortunately, at a critical moment, Tony remembered the tactics of a domineering CEO he had learned online. With a deep and magnetic voice, he extended his hand, and Pepper finally shyly placed her palm on Tony's outstretched hand. Exquisite, petite. Tony said solemnly, uttering a remark that sounded quite lascivious. I need your help. After saying that, Tony's subsequent actions became increasingly shady. He took off his own t-shirt, revealing the arc reactor on his chest. Oh my god, is this what keeps you alive? Pepper asked incredulously. It used to be, but now it's an antique. Tony said as he took out a brand new arc reactor from the workbench. Pepper could tell with her naked eye that this one, both in terms of material and craftsmanship, was more exquisitely made than the old one. This will sustain my life for some time in the future. I want to replace it with this upgraded version, but I've encountered some obstacles. Obstacles? What do you mean? Pepper understood that this obstacle was probably where she needed to help, but she wanted to understand what exactly she needed to do. It's not a big deal, just a small problem. Tony tapped the reactor on his chest with his finger. There's an exposed wire underneath this device that is causing a short circuit against the casing. Upon hearing this, Pepper looked at Tony with surprise, but Tony waved his hand to explain, it's okay. So, how can I help you? Pepper asked with a concerned expression. Upon hearing Pepper's question, Tony knew that things were probably going smoothly from here. Pepper was willing to help him. He lay back in a chair, connected a few electrodes to his chest, and then, under Pepper's alarmed gaze, pulled out the arc reactor from his chest. Don't worry, help me put this on the table over there. It's useless now. Oh my god. Pepper carefully took the replaced arc reactor in her hands and placed it gently on the nearby table. Now I want you to reach inside and gently pull out the wire. Is it safe to do that? Pepper asked with worry on her face. It should be fine, it's like a surgical game. Just make sure the wire doesn't touch the casing, otherwise, it will make a sound. What surgical game? Nervous, Pepper couldn't catch Tony's humor at this moment. All right, forget about the game. It's nothing to worry about. Just gently pull the wire out. Are you ready? Okay. Pepper slowly reached her hand to the edge of the casing, but as if she had been electrocuted, she quickly pulled her hand back. You know, I think maybe I'm not capable of doing this. Maybe you should have the doctor come over and help you. Tony looked into her eyes and said seriously, you can do it. You are the most qualified and trustworthy person I know. You will do great. Is my request too demanding? Because I really need your help. Tony now used every trick in the book. First, he comforted her affectionately to win her favor, and then he revealed his vulnerability to gain her sympathy. Under Tony's pursuit techniques that garnered the most likes on the internet, Pepper nodded and agreed. Okay, I'll help you. With courage, Pepper once again reached her hand towards Tony's chest. Oh, there's pus inside. Pepper's face showed a disgusted expression, and her features almost twisted into a bun. Now I understand why you didn't let Mark help. He would definitely refuse. No, no, that's not pus. It's inorganic biomatter released by the device, not something my body secretes. 
Tony insisted. And Mark stayed up late last night, he can't do such delicate work. Mark, who had been observing the progress of the two outside the door, sneered and rolled his eyes. A man's mouth, full of lies. No, wait, it's Tony's mouth, full of lies. It stinks. Despite Tony's forced explanation, the unpleasant smell still made Pepper unable to help but complain. Yeah, it does have a bit of an odor. Tony awkwardly responded, quickly changing the subject. The copper wire, have you found it? I've got it. You've got it. Great, be careful not to touch the groove when pulling it out. Oh. The pain caused by the short circuit made Tony exclaim, I mentioned this to you earlier. Sorry. After the small accident just now, Pepper's face was now pale, and she continued the task with her eyes closed. It's okay, just be careful not to pull out the end coil of the electromagnetic wire. Tony watched as the electromagnetic coil wobbled in front of him. Okay, you've already pulled it out. Oh my god, I didn't expect. Pepper opened her eyes, feeling even more panicked, and in her urgency, she wanted to put the pulled out thing back in. Don't put it back. Tony quickly stopped her. What do I do now? What's wrong with you? Seeing Tony's condition change, Pepper was on the verge of tears. It's nothing, it's just that my heart is about to stop beating because you pulled out. What? Didn't you say it was perfectly safe? Forget about it, quickly replace it with this. Tony handed the new reactor to Pepper. Okay. Tony, you'll be fine, right? I'll be fine, I can handle it. I hope so. At this point, Pepper was completely overwhelmed with nervousness, and even though Tony's acting was extremely poor, she couldn't see through it. Dad's move was clever, making Pepper feel guilty. With her personality, she will definitely find a way to make it up to him. It seems I'll have to start calling her stepmom soon. Outside the door, Mark, who was also well versed in online pursuit techniques, immediately saw through Tony's tricks. Feeling that his old man had succeeded with this move, Mark quietly left the door and returned to his own room. Remember to connect that connector to the chassis. Tony reminded. They heard a sound, indicating the completion of the wiring connection. Phew, is that it? Pepper breathed a sigh of relief. Was it that difficult? It was quite fun, wasn't it? All right, well done, Pepper. Are you okay? Of course, I feel great, but please, please, please never ask me to do something like this again. I have no one else but you. Mark is too much of a clean freak to help me. As I suspected, it was pus. Pepper said, vigorously shaking off the liquid from her hand. All right, don't worry about it. What should we do with this? Pepper picked up the reactor that had just been replaced from the table and asked. That? Destroy it, burn it, it doesn't matter. Don't you want to keep it as a memento? Pepper, people have attached many labels to me, but that's not one of them. All right, is there anything else, Mr. Stark? No, everything's fine, Miss Potts. Pepper left the underground garage with the arc reactor that Tony had replaced in her hand. She lowered her head, lost in thought, as if she had already figured out how to handle it. The future of aerial combat, whether it is manned or unmanned, what I want to say is that, based on my experience, no unmanned aerial vehicle can surpass the instinctive reactions of a pilot. The insight developed through long training, the ability to foresee consequences by observing the situation deeply, or you can say, the judgment of a pilot. Colonel Rhodes, stationed at the Air Force Base, led a group of new Air Force recruits on a tour inside the hangar, sharing his experiences as an ace pilot. Colonel, then. Why can't we create an aircraft without a pilot and co-pilot? Look at this, man who fell from the sky, Mr. Tony Stark. Rhodes introduced Tony to the recruits, interrupting his own speech. Speaking of manned or unmanned, you have to hear about his experience of misjudgment. It was in the spring, remember, spring of 1987. That lady in your bed. Tony didn't stop his act of teasing and continued to reveal his good friend's secrets. Tony, stop it, Rhodes quickly interrupted in embarrassment. What was her name again? Was it Yvonne? They will believe it, don't make things up. Rhodes reminded once again. He didn't want to lose face in front of the new recruits. All right, nice to meet you all. 
Tony perfectly timed the end of his joke. Guys, take a look around by yourselves for a bit. We need to have a separate chat. As the recruits walked away, Rhodes patted Tony's shoulder. I'm surprised, buddy. Why? I swear, I didn't expect to see you back on your feet so quickly. I can do more than just walk. Is that so? Rhodes had some doubts. Yes. Rhodey, I'm doing something big, and I came to tell you because I hope you'll join me. Rhodes nodded perfunctorily but didn't give a definite answer. You could have really made these people happy because what you did at the press conference was quite a headline. This is not for the military. I'm not. It's different. Rhodes looked at the somewhat unfamiliar Tony with a puzzled expression. What's going on? Have you turned into a humanitarian now? I hope you'll listen to my plan seriously. Before Tony could finish, Rhodes interrupted him. No need. What you need now is to get your mind back to normal. I'm serious. All right. Tony replied with a perfunctory smile. Good to see you, Tony. After saying that, Rhodes turned and continued his unfinished work. Thank you. Tony felt somewhat disappointed with his friend Rhodes' lack of understanding, but that didn't make him give up on his plan. Looks like I'll have to ask Mark for help. Mark, come out, I need to talk to you. Tony wasted no time and immediately called out Mark's name as soon as he got home. Ever since escaping from the terrorists with the help of the crude Mark I suit, Tony had been contemplating this plan. Now, besides his progress with Pepper, this upcoming plan was his primary concern, overshadowing the future development of his company. Upon hearing his father's call, Mark, still wearing his pajamas and groggy-eyed, walked out of his room. What's up, Dad? I only went to bed at four o'clock last night. A clock? What were you doing last night? And now it's already noon, considering the eight hours of sleep teenagers need, you should be up by now. All right, whose fault is it that this house belongs to you? It's a pity that I stayed up all night to help you remove the shrapnel from your chest. Ah, uh, good deeds go unrewarded. Ha! Huh. Tony immediately became interested upon hearing Mark's words. He wasn't concerned about whether the shrapnel in his chest could be removed because he knew the high risks involved, and at this stage, he wasn't willing to take that chance when everything else was under control. What truly interested him was the new gadget Mark had come up with. It should be noted that Mark hadn't devoted much effort to medical research. Even when developing the personal health consultant, J. A. R. V. I. S. had assisted with organizing all the medical data. Now, since Mark claimed to have a way to potentially remove the shrapnel from his chest, it meant he had found a direction in some other technology. What new toy have you come up with this time? Show me. Weren't you looking for me because you had something to discuss? No rush, this matter can't be rushed. Let's see what you've created first. Compared to an unknown plan that hadn't yielded any results yet, Mark's new invention was more attractive to Tony. After all, in Tony's mind, Mark had already proven himself to be a genius surpassing his own capabilities, although he couldn't admit it out loud. Fine, but it's not feasible to bring it out. Come with me to my room, and I'll demonstrate it to you. Mark turned and walked back into his room. Tony followed closely behind but was immediately captivated by the sight of a massive metal sphere in front of him. Tungsten carbide? Tony immediately recognized the alloy material used in the sphere. That's right, old tricks never fail. There are 400 pounds of tungsten carbide here. Come here, I'll show you something interesting. Mark beckoned Tony and led him to a workbench in the room. The workbench was neatly arranged with a complete set of chemical preparation apparatus, all connected and ready to use. It contained various colored chemical reagents, indicating that Mark's latest discovery was related to chemistry. Mark picked up a test tube and poured its contents into the preparation apparatus. Add some perchloric acid and a drop of cobalt pigment. Mark adjusted various instruments along the tabletop while adding reagents. A hint of hydrogen peroxide, then heat it to a temperature of 500 Kelvin. After finishing, Mark turned on the heating device. Once the prepared liquid was transferred into a spray bottle, Mark handed it to Tony. Give it a try, spray it onto the tungsten carbide sphere. Tony followed Mark's instructions and sprayed the reagent onto the massive sphere. The reagent emitted a pink mist, quickly enveloping the entire metal sphere, turning it entirely pink. 
It's done, isn't it amazing? Mark asked excitedly upon seeing the successful experiment. It's very pink. Tony felt somewhat embarrassed, not expecting Mark to create something with such little technological significance. The most exciting part is yet to come. Clearly, Mark had kept his true achievement a secret until now. With his right index finger extended, Mark gently tapped the now pink tungsten carbide sphere. The entire sphere rapidly disintegrated, turning into a fine pink powder that filled Mark's room. Wow! Tony, now entirely covered in pink, couldn't help but exclaim in amazement upon witnessing the true effect of the reagent. It's amazing, isn't it? By chemically embrittling the metal, injecting a few milliliters of the corresponding reagent into your chest can turn all the shrapnel into powder, which will be naturally eliminated by the body's metabolism. Unfortunately, I haven't found a non-toxic or low-toxicity formula suitable for human use yet. Otherwise, you could have been my first clinical test subject. It's truly an astonishing invention. It seems I have to keep the metal formula I'll need to use in the future a secret from you. Because what I'm about to discuss with you requires quite a bit of metal. Huh. At the moment he heard Tony's plan, Mark's forehead was already filled with black lines. Can I not participate? No, it has to be you, Mark. Dot. Hey, listen, Mark, you have to at least give me a chance to explain the plan to you, right? Well, go ahead and tell me. Mark accepted Tony's proposal, and in fact, he had already guessed what Tony's plan was. It was the development plan for the Mark series of Iron Man suits. However, Mark had some thoughts and differences from Tony regarding this. Listen, this is a brilliant idea and plan. Do you know how I managed to escape from the terrorists? The military claimed that they rescued me, but that's not true. I relied on this. Tony opened the holographic projection device, and a bulky suit of armor appeared before them. This is the secret to my survival, an Iron Man suit powered by the arc reactor in my chest. It can fight for up to 50 minutes under extreme conditions. With this crude creation of mine and the amazing suit you gave me, I successfully escaped from the clutches of the terrorists along with Dr. Insen and destroyed their weapon stockpile. So this is your plan going forward, right? To develop a more refined and powerful suit of armor. Mark followed Tony's words and directly stated his understanding. That's right. I want to develop a series of Iron Man suits for myself. This project will not only ensure our safety, but more importantly, it excites me. Combining powerful weapon systems, flight systems, communication systems, combat systems, and so on, all integrated into this small suit of armor. It will be the pinnacle of mechanical and electronic engineering on Earth. Because the first suit of armor I built in Afghanistan was named Mark I After You, I plan to make it a Mark series, differentiated by development order and also. How about that? Doesn't it make you feel as thrilled as I do? At this point, Tony excitedly placed his hand on Mark's shoulder, his eyes sparkling as he looked at Mark's calm face. It's not bad. In fact, even if you didn't say anything, I had plans to carry out my own mecha project in the future. And since you managed to create the initial suit of armor in such a crude environment with the terrorists, I can't think of anything I can help you with. It's not like that, Mark. I do need your help. The various chips you design for Baymax can also be applied to the Mark series. I hope to incorporate them as unmanned control modules into the development of the suits. And besides, two heads are better than one. The efficiency of our two geniuses working together will surely be greater than working alone. You just mentioned that you want to create your own mecha, right? While helping me, you can also accumulate useful experience and even carry out your project simultaneously. We can have a competition and see whose achievements are more impressive. Exclamation point. Upon hearing Tony's words, Mark, who wasn't initially interested, also lit up. Mark was a complete otaku, with not many hobbies. Besides conducting scientific research and bringing various ideas in his mind to life, his biggest hobby was competing with his own dad. As long as he could stay ahead of Tony even by a little, Mark would be excited for a long time. Since you put it that way, I'll agree. But you have to change the name of this plan. It sounds terrible. Let's just call it, the plan. Seeing that Mark had agreed, changing the name of the plan was not a big deal, and Tony nodded readily. By the way, there's one more thing. 
Although I haven't finished the design for my mecha yet and can't show it to you, since we're going to compete, we should be fair. What I can tell you now is that my mecha plan is called Project Excalibur, and it will be a giant mecha with a height of over 5 meters. You'll have to wait until the day of the presentation to see the specifics. I promise it will surprise you. Don't keep me in suspense like this. Fine, I'll wait to see what surprise you can bring me. Come with me to the garage. I can't wait to get started. Tony rubbed his hands excitedly at the thought of the upcoming research and development work. At least let me have lunch first. No, wait, lunch. You're a pain, old man. Jarvis, are you there? Tony arrived at the underground garage and immediately called for Jarvis' assistance. At your service, sir. I'm always here. Good afternoon, Jarvis. Even though it was already noon, Mark greeted Jarvis as usual. Good afternoon, Master Mark. Jarvis, I'd like to create a new project document and label it as Mark II. Do you want to store the file in the Stark Industries central database? No. Actually, I'm not sure who I can trust right now, so until further notice, let's keep everything stored on my private server. Are you working on a secret project, sir? I just don't want this thing to fall into the wrong hands. Perhaps in my hands, it can do some good. Arriving at the workbench, Tony opened the holographic design of the Mark I armor. Mark, come over and take a look. What do you think we should remove here? Tony zoomed in on the specific details of the armor and asked for Mark's opinion. I think we can reduce its size. If we remove it directly, it might affect the balance of the armor during flight. That makes sense. The metal material also needs to be replaced, but I won't discuss that with you. I've just witnessed your metal embrittlement firsthand. In fact, if you cover the surface of the armor with a graphene coating, it can defend against the effects of the metal embrittlement agent. It can also enhance the armor's protective capabilities while reducing overall weight. You're right. I knew teaming up with you was the right choice. I also want to equip it with the graphene battery you previously developed as a backup power source, as well as the super strength booster. That will turn me into a powerhouse. Tony and Mark continued their back and forth in the garage. When their opinions aligned, progress was rapid. When they disagreed, they engaged in spirited debates to persuade each other. However, no matter what, Tony always had the final say. After two hours of discussion, the first version of the design was finally completed. They viewed it using holographic projection. The newly designed armor no longer had the bulkiness and roughness of the Mark I, its size was closer to that of a normal person. The defense capabilities, invisible to the naked eye, were greatly enhanced after incorporating Mark's graphene nanomaterials. All right, let's build it and see how it performs before making further improvements. Talking alone won't yield any results. Let's just name it Mark II for now. I won't help you with the hands-on work. Coordinate with your AI assistant. Call me when you have results. Mark's part in the task had come to a temporary conclusion. After discussing with Tony for nearly two hours, he couldn't suppress the inspiration buzzing in his mind. Now, he just wanted to hurry back to his room and bring the design to life. The inspiration that Mark told Tony came from the movies he had watched in his previous life, and in this life, he happened to have the ability to turn them into reality. Compared to Tony's Iron Man armor, Mark preferred this type of giant mech. Unlike Tony, who had a spirit of adventure and personally engaged in battles, Mark, as an otaku, preferred to solve dangers from behind the scenes. Why expose himself to danger, risking his life and ending up injured? Old Mark was destined not to understand his father's personal heroism values, but he wouldn't oppose or persuade him either. After all, mechs were a man's romance. Although their ways of romance were different, it didn't prevent them from understanding each other. Baymax. Upon returning to his room, Mark immediately called out Baymax's name. Currently, Baymax held a position for Mark similar to that of Jarvis for Tony Stark. Mark, who had always envied his father having Jarvis and Dummy S help, had been striving towards that direction after completing the development of Baymax. During Tony's absence, Mark invested all his time into upgrading and modifying Baymax, except for paying attention to news related to Tony. The first priority in Baymax's upgrades was its skin. Mark replaced it with a composite material consisting of graphene nanofilm and polyvinyl carbon fibers. 
He also incorporated a biomimetic material that had self-healing capabilities, greatly enhancing Baymax's defense and maneuverability. In terms of other hardware, the original DLP microprojector was replaced with a more advanced holographic projector, and the hyperspectral lens was replaced with a holographic scanning lens. The frame was also replaced with a composite frame made of graphene fibers and titanium alloy. The battery was upgraded as well, using a new graphene battery technology that not only allowed for high-speed fast charging within 10 seconds but also doubled the battery capacity for the same weight. Furthermore, Mark added many accessories to Baymax, such as armor for combat mode, various tools for assistant mode, and a portable charging box with an arc reactor for hibernation mode. Along with various functional chips, Baymax was transforming from a personal health assistant into a versatile research assistant. Most importantly, Mark upgraded Baymax's AI system. The original Baymax functioned as a weak AI, capable of completing pre-programmed tasks in its chips and had some analysis capabilities, but it did not reach the level of Jarvis. This time, Mark upgraded the system core, which could be called Baymax's soul. It greatly enhanced Baymax's analytical and judgment abilities, at least reaching the level of strong AI. The crucial addition was the latest development by Mark himself, the Emotion Sensing Engine. The Emotion Sensing Engine added by Mark was not a simple micro-expression recognition or psychological analysis. Its inclusion allowed Baymax to learn and genuinely experience various human emotions. With the ability to perceive joy, anger, grief, fear, and more by interacting with people around it, Baymax might eventually obtain genuine emotions. This was the remarkable aspect of the Emotion Sensing Engine. In the future, Baymax would evolve from an artificial intelligence into a true electronic life form, creating possibilities for Mark to build a community of silicon based life forms. Master Baymax, already fully charged, walked out of the charging box and said, Baymax is at your service. Baymax, open the last saved design for me. I'm brimming with inspiration now. Understood, Master. Baymax received the command and activated the holographic projector installed in its abdomen, projecting the design. Speaking of this Transformers, not many people may remember. After all, Transformers was a popcorn movie, and there were numerous Autobots appearing, besides the main characters like Bumblebee and Optimus Prime, it's hard to recall the rest if you're not a diehard fan. The prototype of the design was based on the Chevrolet concept car, the Corvette Stingray. With its silver-gray car paint and streamlined body, Mark decided to temporarily set aside Bumblebee in Optimus Prime and create it first because of its handsome appearance. Interestingly, his father's garage happened to have a Corvette Stingray, which served as a reference object for Mark. First, remove the graphene battery chassis for me. Tony looked at the projected model in front of him and instructed Baymax. For the power source, Mark originally intended to equip it with a high-capacity graphene battery. However, upon seeing Tony's arc reactor, Mark decided to abandon his previous design. First, removing the battery pack would free up more space for Mark's design. After all, to power such a massive entity for driving, transforming, and combat, even with the high energy density of graphene batteries, a significant number of battery packs would be required. Second, Mark chose to use the arc reactor in a way that was different from Tony's, as it would not have adverse effects on his health. Lastly, the key difference between the arc reactor's cold fusion technology and batteries was that its energy release wasn't a simple additive process. For each doubling of the palladium material, the energy output would exponentially increase. This solved the issue of long-range endurance and provided convenient recharging. In the space freed up by removing the battery pack, add two super-strong braking engines to control the movement of the arms. Replace all vehicle components, except the tires and interior, with graphene aerospace titanium alloy. The tires will be made of self-healing rubber. Based on his experience discussing Mark II with Tony, Mark examined the initial design draft and made continuous deletions and modifications. However, one problem continued to bother him, the design of the transformation mechanism. After incorporating various systems such as the power system, weapon system, and balance stabilization system, there was no longer any space in the vehicle body to accommodate the transformation mechanism. But could it truly be called a transformer if it couldn't transform? Finally, a brilliant idea struck Mark. He made a decision, Baymax, delete the entire weapon system and replace it with the transformation mechanism. I've come up with a fantastic idea. When it comes to giant mechs, 
how can we forget about that one? Oh, by the way, if we switch to that, we can also streamline the power system. Baymax, delete the electric engine in the sports car mode. Move the arc reactor, the core of the power source, to the engine's location. This time, I have a major modification. Mark's inspiration this time came from another genre of large mechs, the piloted type, specifically the classic IP of Mobile Suit Gundam. Yes, if you were once young and indulged in freedom, and you've watched this iconic anime from that island country, you can probably guess what Mark will use as the weapon system and auxiliary power in the sports car mode. It's one of the revolutionary and imaginative concepts from that era, the NTD system, also known as the funnel or mobile suit. The NTD system is a wireless and unmanned long-distance attack weapon. It has its own propulsion engine, mono-eye optical imaging system, beam cannons, and control system. Since it's controlled through psychic waves transmitted by brainwave transmission systems, it is completely immune to electromagnetic signal interference and capable of multiple long-range attacks. Additionally, depending on its structural design, it can transform into a close combat particle sword and energy shield, making it a versatile design. Moreover, with Mark's existing technological capabilities, replicating the mobile suit is entirely possible. After all, if it were possible, do you think he wouldn't want to replicate the classic ATP barrier from Neon Genesis Evangelion? Unfortunately, I can't do it. However, replicating the mobile suit is different. The independent propulsion engine poses no major difficulty, and it can be powered by a separate arc reactor, enabling its modular attack capabilities. As for the optical imaging system, it's a breeze. With the holographic scanner's omnidirectional detection, not even a mosquito can escape Mark's gaze. The beam cannon technology can be obtained directly from dear old dad, and control systems happen to be one of Mark's strong suits. The brainwave transmission system, which sounds fancy, is actually a concept that gained popularity in a past life, the brain-machine interface. Coincidentally, Mark's mind already has a reserve of this technology. In the memory information he received from Young Hero, one of the machines he developed, the miniature magnetic axis robot, was controlled using a brainwave amplifier, and the technology is quite mature. Furthermore, the need for brainwave system control is minimal. In most cases, the mobile suit will be operated by the mech's own intelligent AI. However, Mark couldn't help but fantasize about controlling several mobile suit units behind the scenes, obliterating enemies without lifting a finger. The drool couldn't help but flow. This scenario proves that no matter the universe, humans cannot escape the irony of the Qin Xiang Dinglu, true fragrance law. With the design direction determined, Mark organized his thoughts and quickly began a new round of design work. Ordinary doors were replaced with mobile suit energy shields, and the trunk was modified to house mobile suit module components, providing power in the sports car mode. Mark's mind was now brimming, and flashes of inspiration kept coming. He soon finalized the design. The mech is more or less like this. Tomorrow, I'll do a holographic scan automatic modeling of the exterior design in the garage. Sleep, sleep. Mark, who hadn't even changed out of his work clothes all day, collapsed onto the bed and fell asleep. Baymax, who had been assisting Mark, approached quietly and gently covered their little master with a blanket. Good night, master, Baymax softly uttered before turning and returning to their charging station to hibernate. The next morning, well rested without staying up late, Mark's vitality returned. Good morning, Baymax. Baymax's charging station glowed briefly. Stepping out of the room, Mark habitually called out, Good morning, Jarvis. Good morning, Master Mark. What would you like for breakfast today? Let's discuss breakfast later. I'll go down to the garage first to collect the exterior data I need for the car. My design will be completed soon. Wishing you success, Master Mark. Arriving at the garage, Mark saw Tony, with tired eyes and dark circles, working on the welding table alongside Dummy, next one, step up. Not the boot, Dummy. Here, got it. Don't move, very good. You're useless, I'll handle the toes, their collaboration continued amidst Tony's incessant and discordant complaints. Mark didn't disturb them and went alone to the front of the Chevrolet Corvette Stingray with his holographic scanner, starting to collect data. When Mark finished his work and passed by Tony, Tony had already put on the leg thrusters he had just completed and was preparing for a test. 
Hey, old man, I told you it needs a balance stabilizer to ensure safety. You're being reckless. Seeing Tony skipping computer simulations and going straight to the test, Mark couldn't help but remind him. But Tony didn't care, don't worry, all the safety measures are in place. Dummy, be ready for firefighting. And I already had. Successful flight experience in the Middle East, although the power was insufficient later on. But with me, Tony Stark, personally controlling it, there's no need for balance assist. Whatever you say, Jarvis. At your command, Master Mark. Wake up Baymax for me and have it bring the medical kit. Understood, Master Mark. All right, Mark, you need to have some faith in me. Dummy is ready to roll. Begin with a stride, half a meter, dead center. All right, activate manual control and start slowly. Let's see if we can achieve a 10% propulsion increase. I think it would be better to start with 1% and gradually increase, Mark suggested, vividly recalling this iconic scene from Iron Man 1. But now that he was Tony's son, Mark reminded Tony once again. Tony shook his head and started the countdown directly, 3. 2. 1. Bang. As expected, Tony somersaulted and hit the ceiling. Bang. Then he descended from the ceiling to the ground. Hearing the loud noise, Mark couldn't bear to look and put down his hand that was covering his eyes. Eh, I warned you, but you ended up suffering right in front of me. Mark shook his head, sighed, and realized that Tony's overconfidence had led to his own downfall. Oh, dummy, send me a copy of the camera recording. I want to make a funny video. He he he. Old man, you've given me some material to use. Hmm, where am I? Tony, waking up from unconsciousness, looked at the adorable face of Baymax in front of him and felt a bit bewildered. Sir, due to an unidentified impact you experienced earlier, you suffered minor soft tissue contusions. I have already treated the affected area. You are currently in the garage of Villa 10880, Malibu Point, with the zip code 90265. You're awake, old man. You've been lying down for quite a while. I'm already having lunch. Mark, holding Tony's favorite cheeseburger, came down from the living room upstairs. Do you have my portion? Tony shook his head and didn't feel any discomfort. It seemed that Baymax once again perfectly fulfilled his duties. One hundred dollars, please. Thanks. Mark showed a sly smile. After lunch, Tony and Mark returned to their state of design and development. This time, Tony didn't continue working on other parts of the suit, instead, he added a balance stabilizer to the gauntlet in the design. Hee hee, in the end, you still have to listen to me. Mark suddenly interjected, wearing a triumphant expression. Of course, Tony wouldn't admit defeat. After all, how could he compromise his fatherly authority? Humph, what do you know? These are the results I obtained from personal testing this morning. Your suggestions are miles away from that. Mark shrugged, shook his head, and felt quite helpless facing Tony's stubbornness. Moreover, Tony's actions to maintain his fatherly authority gave off a sense of a child throwing a tantrum. Oh, by the way, old man, I need your help. I've completed the design for my own suit, but I need some equipment and materials that can only be obtained through Stark Industries channels. Send the list to Pepper, she will take care of it for you. Aren't you going to show me your design? I can give you some advice as well. Hearing that Mark had completed the design, Tony couldn't help but feel a bit eager. After all, he knew his son's technological prowess very well. Nope, not now. It won't be a surprise if I show it to you. Besides, I came up with a brilliant idea yesterday, and I can't let you plagiarize it. Seeing that it was impossible to convince Mark, Tony remained silent, rolled his eyes, and continued perfecting his own balance stabilizer. Ding dong. Ding dong. Hmm, Jarvis, who is it? After being immersed in his research for an unknown period of time, Mark was interrupted by a series of urgent doorbell rings. It's Miss Potts. Upon hearing Jarvis's response, Mark turned to look at Tony, who was still engrossed in his research. Let Pepper come directly down. Mr. Stark, I've been ringing the bell. Didn't you hear the intercom? Pepper walked down the stairs holding a box and a cup of coffee. Sorry, I was too focused. What's up? 
Tony continued to communicate with Pepper while fiddling with the balance stabilizer in his hand. Mr. Obadiah Stane is waiting for you upstairs. Okay, I got it. I'll go up right away. I thought you said you were done making weapons. Pepper looked puzzled when she saw the prototype of the balance stabilizer on Tony's arm. This isn't a weapon, it's just a flight stabilizer. It poses no threat. Sizzle, boom. The blast of air from the stabilizer pushed Tony against the wall, and the tools in the garage were thrown into chaos. To prove his point, Tony demonstrated to Pepper, but now it seemed that the results were not as harmless as he claimed. It was an accident. What's wrong, Uncle Obi? Isn't it too bad? Tony came from the garage to the living room and asked Obadiah, who was playing the piano. If it's just because I brought you pizza from New York, that's not enough to say it's not bad. You're right, it doesn't prove anything. Tony picked up a slice of pizza and started eating. I've been experimenting in the garage all day, and now I'm really hungry. Can I ask Mark to join us? Feel free, this is your home. But I have to tell you, at today's board meeting, the directors believe you have post-traumatic symptoms and have passed a ban because of it. What? A ban? Yes, they plan to kick you out. Why? Tony wiped the oil off his mouth. Just because the stock price dropped by 40%? These things happen, it's actually 56 dash, Pepper corrected him. That doesn't matter. We have a controlling stake in the company. Tony, but the board of directors also has their rights. They believe that you and your new research direction are not beneficial to the company. I've always been the one to make decisions. It's my work, my company, forget it, I'm going to the workshop. Tony took the entire pizza box and stood up to leave. Don't do this, Tony, Tony. Listen, Tony, I'm trying to turn things around, but you have to give me something, something that can convince them. I can help you find an engineer to draw some sketches or something, especially since the arc reactor is complex. Then I can use it to distract, no, no, absolutely not. Tony forcefully interrupted. I'll handle this project myself. That's the final decision. Don't think about anything else, Obi. If they want to see something, they can go take a look at the gift Mark gave Pepper. That's our secret weapon for entering the medical field. After saying that, Tony returned the pizza brought by the other person and walked away without looking back. Hey, aren't you giving two slices to Mark? Fine, thanks. Tony turned around and took two slices of pizza before heading back to the garage. Tony, do you mind if I come down and see what you're working on? Obadiah persisted. He had no interest in some healing health consultant, what he wanted was mass destructive weapons. Good night, Uncle Obi. Thanks for the pizza. Good evening, Pepper. Seeing Mark peeking his head out, Pepper stopped her work and looked at him. Good evening. What were you sneaking around for? I was observing if the big beard guy left or not. He's gone, come out. Is there something you need from me? There is, there is. Mark nodded vigorously, clearly having an ulterior motive. Did the stock acquisition of Stark Industries go smoothly today? Don't worry, the individual investors in the stock market can't wait to get rid of their Stark stocks. Today alone, nearly 2% of the shares were bought with $400 million from your account. That's the result of a tactical move to avoid attention and cause a rebound for the Stark family. If we go all out with the acquisition, we might be able to swallow up all the scattered stocks today. Hee <laughs> hee, thanks for your help, Pepper. Just thinking about the future value of those stocks made Mark unable to help but smile, drooling at the corners of his mouth. All right, since we have such a good relationship, you don't have to be so polite with me. Did I ever treat you politely when I took Nini in? That's different. That was just a small favor, while you're sacrificing your own rest time to help me. But since you said that, I have one more request without being polite. Go ahead, no need to hesitate. Pepper, wearing a light yellow dress, reached out and ruffled Mark's fluffy hair. I'm currently developing a new project and need to purchase some equipment and materials through Stark Industries channels. Dad told me to ask you, and I've already sent the list to Nini's server. All right, I'll take it to the purchasing department tomorrow and apply for it. Is there anything else? If not, I'll leave for home. No, that's it. Good night, Pepper. Good night. 
The eleventh day, thirty-seventh test, configuration two. Since there are no better options, dummy still needs to pay attention to fire safety. If I didn't catch fire and you still use the fire extinguisher, I will donate you to City University. In front of the camera recording the entire development process, Tony was as usual talking to himself. Today, all the materials Mark requested for ordering finally arrived at the warehouse of the villa, so he was not in the garage at the moment. Okay, take it easy, Tony. Tony encouraged himself, start with 1% axial load support capacity, countdown, 3, 2, 1. Puff, boom. The airflow from the leg thrusters supported Tony's entire body, while the balance stabilizers on his arms allowed him to maintain balance and not flip over like before. After stabilizing and hovering at a height of 40 centimeters for over 10 seconds, Tony deactivated the propulsion device and landed smoothly on the ground. All right. Hey, dummy, don't point the nozzle of the fire extinguisher at me, making me feel like I could spontaneously combust at any moment. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Just watch and be ready to come quickly if I have an accident. Seeing Dummy, who was itching to use the fire extinguisher, Tony couldn't help but remind him. Okay, let's do it again. This time, increase the axial load support capacity to 2-3, 2, 1. Puff, boom. Tony successfully took off from the ground again, this time maintaining a height of 110 centimeters. The increased height made it more difficult for Tony to control his balance, and he started to drift uncontrollably. Okay, I didn't want to move over here. However, things don't always go as you wish, and life is full of surprises. Don't hit the cars, don't hit the cars. Tony watched helplessly as he floated onto the limited edition sports cars he had collected in the garage, leaving behind even more limited edition patterns on them. After a moment of heartache, Tony finally adjusted his direction, but things didn't improve. The table. The strong airflow from the thrusters blew the design documents and calculation papers on the table all over the place, scattering them in disorder. After a struggle against the Earth's gravity, Tony finally gained control of the thrusters and returned to his takeoff spot, landing steadily. Very well, now I can fly. After completing the flight system of the armor, the remaining parts progressed smoothly. Since it was an experimental model, Mark II didn't need to be equipped with weapon systems, which greatly accelerated Tony's development speed. While Tony was making rapid progress on his side, Mark's floating prototype encountered a bottleneck in development. Although he had mastered the necessary technologies for each part, he was struggling with integrating them into an organic whole. What troubled him even more was the programming of the floating prototype's autonomous combat system. Due to the large number of units, making them cooperate with each other in battle and form a protective formation was a complex programming task. First, he needed to determine various formations under different circumstances, then the combinations for cross positions, attack patterns, defense patterns, all of which gave Mark a headache and slowed down his progress. However, despite the headaches, Mark firmly believed that he could solve these problems. Since he had no leads on the floating prototype for now, he decided to focus on building the main body of the exosuit. Mark turned his attention to the construction of the exosuit's transformation mechanism. Jarvis, are you ready? At your service, sir. After such a long preparation time, Tony finally completed the experimental model Mark II. He also transformed his original intelligent butler, Jarvis, into the combat assistance system for the suit, assisting him in controlling the armor. Click, finally, he put on the helmet and armed Mark II. Activate the heads-up display. Jarvis, completed. Input all parameters received from computer interfaces. As you wish, sir. Tony carefully observed the surrounding environment through the heads-up display, feeling good about the field of vision and the high-definition display, then asked, Okay, how does it look? I have received all the data, sir. Connection established, everything is ready. Initiate virtual walking program. Inputting parameters, evaluating virtual environments. Check the control of the outer shell. At your command, sir. Upon receiving the command, Jarvis quickly started executing it. The booster plates on the lower legs, the articulated plates increasing range of motion at the joints, the flow control plates on the back for adjusting flight posture and speed, and the opening and closing plates for the hidden weapon systems on the arms, all of them were adjusted and linked, 
instantly distinguishing the overall feel of the armor from the clunky Mark I, Jarvis, testing complete, preparing to shut down the power and initiate diagnostics. All right, remember to check the weather and the automatic tool repositioning system. Also, start monitoring the airport control tower. Sir, the server still needs to perform 1000G calculations before actual flight can take place. Jarvis cautioned Tony against the dangerous idea. Jarvis, sometimes you have to run before you learn to walk. Are you ready? Countdown, 3, 2, 1. Puff, boom. The flight system was functioning normally, and with the continuous boost from the thrusters, Tony swiftly flew out along the garage corridor, exclaiming, Who? The freedom of flying in the sky immediately captivated Tony. He thought, this feels like a dream. Mark will be so jealous. After getting accustomed to the flight system's working mode, Tony increased his speed and took on some challenging maneuvers degree barrel rolls, tight radius aerial maneuvers, quick stops and turns in various states, all of these no longer posed any challenge to Tony. He confidently said, all right, let's see what this suit is capable of. What's the record for the State Route 71 Blackbird Reconnaissance Aircraft? The record for fixed-wing flight is 85,000 feet, sir. Records are meant to be broken. Let's go for it. Tony adjusted his flight attitude and soared straight into the sky. At that moment, Jarvis quickly interjected, Sir, there is a potential risk of high-altitude icing leading to a crash. Keep flying. Higher. Tony was rebellious and couldn't be deterred by any danger before it actually occurred. However, Tony soon experienced the consequences of his reckless behavior. The armor quickly began to freeze in the high-altitude environment, the thrusters became clogged due to the low temperature, and the internal electronic systems of the suit stopped working due to the cold. Ah, ah. Tony, devoid of power, accelerated towards the ground in a panic-filled freefall. We're frozen, Jarvis. Deploy the auxiliary wings, Jarvis. Tony anxiously called out to Jarvis, but due to the impact on the electronic systems, Jarvis was unable to assist him. Hurry, we need to get rid of the ice. With no other options and without Jarvis's help, Tony had to resort to the emergency devices he had left behind. He manually opened the auxiliary wings on the exterior of the suit, finally removing the layer of ice. With the ice problem resolved, the electronic systems automatically restarted, but by that time, Tony was already less than 1,000 feet from the ground. With the ground looming ahead, Tony had no choice but to await his fate. Fortunately, luck seemed to favor this rebellious and eccentric scientist. At the last moment, the electronic systems recovered and initiated the thrusters before Tony crashed, restoring power to the suit. Yahoo, Tony, who had narrowly escaped disaster, ecstatically celebrated like a 200-pound fat man. Flying all the way back to the mansion in Malibu, Tony gradually landed on the rooftop. Adjusting his landing posture, Tony commanded Jarvis to shut down the power of the armor. Then. Bang. 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 Tony crashed through the roof, landing in the living room, destroying the piano. He then fell into the underground garage and landed firmly on one of his beloved sports cars, bringing an end to this failed landing. Chirp, this time, Dummy finally succeeded and sprayed the fire extinguisher over Tony's head. Did I miss something? Mark, who arrived late, witnessed Tony, wearing the Mark II armor, lying in a sorry state on the completely ruined sports car. This comical scene made him unable to control himself, so he took out his phone from his pocket and snapped a picture. Mark took an ice pack from the refrigerator and handed it to his father, Tony. Tony was struggling to dismantle his Mark II armor with the help of several robotic arms. The high-altitude icing caused some structural components to deform, making the process even more challenging. Tony took the ice pack from Mark and gently applied it to his swollen head, which had a large bump from the impact. Tony winced, whether from the cold or the pain, he couldn't tell. I told you to be careful. Are you really okay? Mark asked, showing concern for his unreliable father. I'm fine, just a minor bump. You should have confidence in the armor I designed. By the way, how's your progress going? I've already completed a finished product, Tony deflected the topic, pretending to be nonchalant. It's going well. Everything else is smooth, but I encountered some obstacles in implementing the weapon system design I changed. 
So, progress will definitely be slower than yours, Mark shrugged helplessly, informing Tony of his progress. That's normal, that's normal. Ha ha ha. After all, I'm your old man, and you're my son. There's no shame in losing to me. Let me tell you, the feeling of flying in the air with the Mark II was absolutely amazing. Too bad you can't experience it. Ha ha ha. Tony laughed proudly, mocking Mark. Mark rolled his eyes and turned his head away. He didn't want to see his smug father's expression of self-satisfaction. Glancing around, Mark noticed a neatly packaged box on the workbench with a coffee cup on top. Pointing in the direction of the box, Mark asked, What's this? Is it a gift from someone? Following Mark's finger, Tony also turned to look. Oh, that should be the one Pepper sent earlier. I got busy with the Mark II, so I didn't have time to open it. Jarvis, hurry up. Yes, sir, Jarvis responded to the command and accelerated the process of disassembling the armor, quickly helping Tony free himself. Mark removed the coffee cup pressed on top of the box and saw a note with Pepper's signature. He handed the box to Tony and said, Pepper went through the trouble of sending you a gift, and you didn't even respond. No wonder you're single. Open it now. Tony looked at the box in his hand, carefully tore off the attached note, and then unwrapped the brown paper packaging. When all the outer packaging was removed, a mini glass display case was revealed inside, containing the old arc reactor that Pepper had helped Tony replace before. Tony had entrusted Pepper with disposing of it, whether through incineration or burial. He didn't care, as he wasn't sentimental. However, he didn't expect Pepper to repackage it and give it to him as a gift. And now, there was an additional line of text on the old arc reactor. Tony smiled knowingly, realizing that he had fallen deeply in love with this woman and couldn't extricate himself. Mark leaned closer, observing this familiar yet strange scene. He looked at the words written on the arc reactor and said, If you break her heart, don't expect me to call you, Dad, anymore. I know. If I really do that, then please wake me up, my dear son. Tony replied, assuring Mark. Don't worry, I would do that even without you saying it. Beating the crap out of you is my favorite pastime. By the way, why did you fall just now? Didn't you calibrate the balance stabilizers and thrusters? Mark asked, curious about the reason behind Tony's fall. I was flying too high, and high altitude icing occurred at the extreme altitude. It caused a system malfunction in the armor. However, we'll know the exact reason after it has been examined. Jarvis, how's the analysis going? Tony explained. The results have been uploaded to your private server, sir, Jarvis responded. Open it and take a look. I've reminded you before to give the armor defensive mechanisms against extreme cold and heat. Looks like you've missed out. Mark finally scored a point and couldn't help mocking Tony. Tony was speechless and obediently opened the analysis results. The work log shows that the main sensors of the armor failed above 40, 000 feet, and there were also issues with the entire boost system. It should all be due to icing. Very accurate observation, sir. If you plan to visit other planets, we may need to enhance the exhaust system, Jarvis suggested, combining sarcasm with a practical recommendation, which made Mark laugh until his stomach hurt. Tony glanced awkwardly at Mark and pretended to remain calm as he continued the conversation with Jarvis. Contact Stark Industries and have them reconfigure the outer shell with the Archangel Satellite's titanium alloy material. That should strengthen the body while maintaining the power-to-weight ratio. Understand? Yes, sir. Should I follow the instructions on the manual for coloring? Jarvis asked. Yes, that's right. Oh, by the way, I remember there's an annual gathering at the Firefighters Family Fund tonight, and you've always been the guest of honor. Aren't you going? Mark suddenly remembered something and reminded Tony. Jarvis, turn on the TV. Yes, sir. As they listened to the host on the TV rambling on, Tony asked, Jarvis, did I receive an invitation from them? I have no record of it, sir. Oh, it seems that the great benefactor Tony Stark has been forgotten, Mark sarcastically mocked beside him. Tony calmly watched the live coverage on TV, knowing that Jarvis had already completed the rendering of the color scheme after notifying him. Isn't this a bit ostentatious? What do you think? Looking at the shiny golden color scheme, even someone as flamboyant as Tony felt it might be going too far. 
what can I say, sir? You're always ambiguous, Jarvis made another lethal comment. At this point, Mark made a suggestion, how about adding some fiery red accents? Mark's suggestion was indeed the classic color scheme of Iron Man, and he also thought that the combination of red and gold looked good, so he spoke up. Tony nodded, finding himself in agreement with Mark's idea. Truly my own son. Jarvis, do it. That will certainly make you more low-key, sir. Rendering complete. Looking at the rendered image on the screen, Tony smiled with satisfaction. Hmm, I like it. Let's make it that way and give it a good paint job. Automated assembly has already begun and is expected to be completed in five hours. Tony looked at his watch and turned to Mark beside him, asking, Do you want to go to the party together? Create some chaos in the party? Mark raised an eyebrow. You know me too well, Tony said as he drove his supercar, heading towards the Disney concert hall with Mark. Unbeknownst to Tony, deep within the terrorist base that once held him captive, members of the Ten Rings organization who managed to survive had found the wreckage of Mark I and were attempting to restore it. However, hindered by their lack of technical expertise and literacy, they had made no progress. Yet, the danger was far from over. Z, with a sudden break, a magnificent Audi supercar stopped at the entrance of the Disney concert hall. As Tony and Mark got out of the car, the crowd immediately stirred. Weapons manufacturing is just a small part of Stark Industries' empire. Our relationship with the firefighter and rescue team. Obadiah, who was being interviewed by reporters, suddenly felt the unusual commotion and turned his head to look outside. If the host of the party doesn't come, what's the point of everyone else coming? Tony approached Obadiah and sought an explanation. Hey, look at that, it's really surprising. Obadiah looked embarrassed and glanced around. Tony noticed the presence of reporters beside him and saved his face by not pressing further. Let's go inside and talk. After saying that, he pulled Mark into the concert hall. That bearded bald guy's expression just now was hilarious. It was like a chauffeur showing off the owner's car and coincidentally running into the owner. Ha ha ha. Mark couldn't help but burst into laughter after entering the concert hall. Ha, huh, to be honest, I also found it quite amusing. Tony's mood improved somewhat after hearing Mark's joke and laughed along with him. The two of them went to the beverage counter. Tony ordered a glass of scotch whiskey for himself and a glass of milk with calcium for Mark. At this moment, a man in a black suit next to them took the initiative to engage in conversation. Mr. Stark, I'm Agent Coulson. Oh, right, that. Organization, Tony hesitated, unable to recall the name. The Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, Mark reminded him. Yes, that's right. Thank you, young man, Coulson responded. Wow, you guys should come up with a new name for your department. Tony joked. Indeed, I often hear people say that, Coulson replied with a smile that was neither awkward nor polite. But then Mark excitedly made a suggestion, how about calling it S-H-I-E-L-D? You can propose it to your superiors. That's a good name, simple and direct, with profound meaning. I will suggest it to my superiors. Thank you again. I think it's great too. What does S-H-I-E-L-D want from me? Tony took a sip of his drink and asked Coulson. Well, it's like this. I know these past few days have been tough for you, but I still need to ask you some questions. There are still many unresolved matters, and time is also an issue. Shall we meet at Stark Industries on the 24th at 7 p.m.? Coulson explained. Tony extended his right hand and shook hands with Coulson. You know what? I think you're right, and I agree. Now I need to go to my secretary and finalize things. After saying that, Tony walked towards Pepper, who was wearing a blue silk backless evening gown, leaving Mark behind in the same spot. I bet he'll completely forget about this matter when the time comes, Mark said to Coulson, patting his arm and striking up a conversation. Why? Coulson was puzzled. Didn't you see the vague look in his eyes when he was listening to you? He was already captivated by Pepper's figure. With your insight, you could have been a negotiator. You have a special aura that makes people easily drawn to you. Thank you for your reminder, but I will still be there on time. And don't be fooled by my appearance, I'm also an experienced veteran agent. Being a negotiator is no problem for me. 
But why are you out with Mr. Stark so late? Won't you be tired for class tomorrow? Ah, you see, as a spy, you should be asking my old man for the answers you need. Yet you don't even know if his illegitimate child is attending school. And you claim to be an experienced old agent? Your pre-investigation work is too perfunctory. Mark shook his head, pretending to be disappointed. He was just feeling a bit bored and wanted to pass the time with Coulson. I only wanted to ask Mr. Stark about the specific details of his escape from the terrorists, not investigate his personal affairs. Generally, our special division still respects the protection of citizens' privacy rights under the law. But seeing that you're not even attending school despite being underage, did you graduate early like Mr. Stark? No, I never went to school. I've been homeschooled since I was young. I already knew everything they taught in school. Why would I waste my time going to school? Mark's sudden show-off attitude left Coulson speechless. This time, he couldn't help but feel genuinely embarrassed, not just offering a polite smile. On the other side, Tony approached the goddess as he locked eyes with Pepper through his gaze-guided navigation. Hey, you look stunning tonight, and I don't see anyone else here. How did you end up here? Pepper was surprised to see Tony at the party, considering that Tony's schedule was usually managed by her. Tony, I'm avoiding a government agent. Did you come alone? Tony, no, I came with Mark. Where did you get this dress? Pepper suddenly looked a bit embarrassed. It was my birthday gift, but in reality, you asked me to buy it on your behalf. At that time, Tony was busy with his own advanced technology and heard that it was Pepper's birthday, so he asked her to take care of it. And Pepper, being a competent secretary, actually took care of even such matters for Tony. It seems like my taste is pretty good. Do you want to dance? Tony, however, felt no embarrassment at all. He was already accustomed to Pepper handling everything for him, even if it made something that should have been romantic quite dull. Oh, no. Pepper immediately declined. Come on. Tony took the initiative to hold her hand and led her towards the dance floor. Thank you, Mr. Stark. But really, it's not necessary. However, it was evident that Tony, who had entered his domineering CEO mode, would not listen. To the other's refusal. Tony wrapped his arm around Pepper's waist, and the two swayed on the dance floor. You seem uncomfortable. Sensing Pepper's stiff body and unnatural expression, Tony asked. Not at all. I just keep forgetting to wear perfume, and now I'm dancing with my boss. Pepper explained hesitantly, without revealing the true reason. In fact, dancing with Tony in an open back evening gown posed a serious problem. For Pepper, who had always been dedicated and professional as a secretary, this would invite gossip and criticism. You look beautiful and smell nice. But I can fire you if that makes you feel better. Tony's words indicated that he understood the underlying meaning behind Pepper's previous statement. However, he didn't stop dancing with her, he didn't care about what others would gossip about because in his eyes, only Pepper mattered now. Feeling the affection in Tony's gaze, Pepper relaxed and joked, actually, I think without me, you wouldn't even be able to tie your shoelaces. I can survive for about a week. Really? I don't believe you. Pepper asked, do you know your social security number? Want to go out for some fresh air? Failing to come up with an answer, Tony once again resorted to changing the subject. Okay, I'd also like some fresh air. On the terrace, in a secluded corner with only the two of them, Pepper spoke words she couldn't say in front of others, I feel weird. It's like everyone I work with is watching us. Why? We're just dancing, right? No, it's not just dancing. It's because you're you, and everyone knows what kind of person you are and how you treat girls. And that's not the only thing. You know, for me, you're my boss, and yet here I am dancing with you. I don't think they'll misinterpret it. But it makes me look like someone who wants. You know, to date a millionaire. And I'm even wearing this ridiculous dress. As she spoke, looking at Tony's focused gaze, reflecting only her own figure in his eyes, Pepper involuntarily closed her eyes and slowly leaned closer to Tony. However, at that moment, Tony became nervous. His body stiffened like a recently awakened zombie, and he didn't respond to Pepper's initiative at all. Finally, Pepper stopped. She was disappointed with Tony's reaction. She even briefly believed that Tony might have developed some different feelings for her. 
but now she couldn't be sure what Tony was really up to. Could this man, who could sleep with magazine cover models all year round, truly have genuine feelings for her? I feel like having a drink. How about you? To cover up the awkwardness caused by their previous actions, Pepper took the initiative to suggest having something to drink. As it happens, I feel the same way. What would you like? I'll go get it for you. Tony, who had regained his composure, responded lightly, despite feeling annoyed at his foolish behavior earlier, in order to maintain his composure in front of his beloved. I'll have a vodka martini with extra dry olives, at least three of them. Sure. Two vodka martinis with dry olives, please hurry. And heavy on the olives for one of them. Tony placed a tip in front of the bartender and finally breathed a sigh of relief. He had been incredibly nervous earlier, and Tony had never expected Pepper to lean in for a kiss like that. He wondered if it was a test, and if it was, he certainly failed. Lost in his thoughts, Tony was interrupted by a flamboyantly dressed female reporter who approached the bar after seeing Tony's back. Wow, Tony Stark. It's so nice to see you here. Oh, hello. You're Carly. Tony caught a glimpse of the woman's face, vaguely recalling her, but he couldn't remember her name. Kristen. Before Tony could pretend to know and guess her name, the reporter, Kristen, directly revealed her name. She knew that someone like Tony Stark, a playboy, would never remember the name of someone like her, even if they had a one-night stand. Tony, right, I was just about to call you that. You seem quite nervous being here tonight. Can you at least show me some reaction? Kristen, with her remarkable observational skills as a journalist, immediately noticed Tony's unnatural demeanor. Just as you see, nervous. I guess being nervous is my reaction. Tony didn't want to tell a reporter about his failed kiss because if he did, it would surely make the front page headline in the entertainment section the next day, exposing it to the whole world. But recently, I've heard that Stark Industries is involved in the recent violence. Is that what you mean by responsibility? Even though Tony didn't want to reveal his thoughts, as a journalist, Kristen wouldn't let go of the opportunity to uncover the content she wanted from Tony. Violence? Sorry, I don't understand what you're talking about. I haven't been involved in company matters for a long time. I've been staying at home doing private research. Tony was puzzled by her words, he had no idea what she was referring to. Kristen handed a stack of photos to Tony. This is a town called Gulmira. Have you heard of it? Of course, Tony had heard of it. He vividly remembered Gulmira as the hometown of Dr. Insen, his savior. Since their successful escape, they had gone their separate ways and hadn't seen each other again. At the time, Insen had said that his family had died at the hands of terrorists and he wanted to return to his hometown to protect more people, sparing them the suffering he had endured. Before parting ways, Tony even gave Insen the special suit he had made for himself as a gift, hoping to assist him in protecting his life. But as Tony looked through the photos handed to him by Kristen, seeing the houses reduced to rubble by artillery fire, seeing the scenes of corpses strewn about, and zooming in on the markings on the weapons used by the terrorists, he became furious, yet strangely calm. When were these photos taken? Tony stared at the photos in his hand and coldly asked Kristen. Yesterday. I didn't authorize any shipments. Tony looked into her eyes as he explained. But your company did. My company is not the same as me. After saying that, Tony didn't linger with the journalist Kristen. He even forgot about his promise to bring the drinks for Pepper. He carried the photos and went straight to Obadiah, who was still on the red carpet in front of the Disney concert hall, ready for an interview. Tony wanted to confront him. Have you seen these photos? What's going on? Obadiah calmly led Tony away from the reporters and spoke with a serious tone, Tony, Tony, calm down a bit. Don't be so naive. Naive. I used to be so naive. When you all spoke, I actually believed it. I was so naive back then. Is there another things you haven't told me? Is that how it is? Facing Tony's intense inquiry, Obadiah didn't show any signs of nervousness or revealing anything. He leaned close to Tony's ear and whispered, Tony, do you think the board of directors is the one who signed the restraining order against you? I am the one who signed that order. It's the only way I can protect you. Can you understand my intentions? After finishing his words, Obadiah patted Tony's shoulder, his mouth curled up in a meaningful smile. 
Then he got into his car, leaving the venue, and leaving Tony standing there in a daze. Hey! Old man, what are you spacing out for? Suddenly, Mark's familiar voice came from behind, startling Tony out of his daze. After Tony snapped back to reality, Mark still didn't say a word, but he slapped Tony heavily on the back. Ouch, that hurt. What's the matter, you brat? Why are you acting all melancholic? Just now, Sister Pepper even came over and asked me where you went. I helped cover for you, saying you went to the bathroom. I didn't expect you to leave Pepper alone on the terrace and have time to space out here. If it's misunderstood that you're overflowing with compassion and flirting with other women, I won't help you explain. Oh no. I forgot I promised Pepper a vodka martini. Let's go together and bring the drinks to Pepper. Then, we're going home. Tony grabbed Mark's hand and walked towards the concert hall. So soon. You haven't even had a chance to cause a scene yet. Looking at Tony's complex expression, Mark couldn't remember what had caused this sudden change. We do need to cause a scene, but not here. We need to find a different place. My company has made a mistake, and I'll be the one to fix it. On a 15-mile hike to the outskirts of the small town of Gumra can only be described as a path where humble farmers and kind farm women are being driven out of their beloved and peaceful homes. Their land has been occupied by a group of warlords supported by an emerging power. The villagers are forced to find shelter in the wilderness. This series of violent actions, according to investigations, is attributed to a foreign military group known locally as the Ten Rings Gang. As you can see, these people are heavily armed, with clear targets, and anyone who hinders their objectives will be killed. Without political intervention and pressure from the international community, the hope for these refugees is very bleak. As Tony listened to the news about the incident mentioned by Christine on the TV, he held a partially assembled gauntlet in his hand for debugging, creating a silent atmosphere. Mark, beside him, also remained silent. He neither offered any suggestions about what Tony was about to do, nor expressed sympathy for the plight of the Gulmira villagers on the TV. Because Mark now finally knew what had caused Tony's sudden change in mood, and because of this, Mark III was about to make its debut. ZZZ, boom. ZZZ, boom. ZZZ, boom. Suddenly, Tony fired three energy blasts from the palm-mounted repulsors of his gauntlet, shattering all three bulletproof glasses surrounding the garage. This action also snapped Mark out of his daze. Sorry, I got a bit carried away. I just wanted to test its power, so that these ten ring guys won't have a chance to escape later. Tony took off the gauntlet, ran his hand through his hair, and tried to calm himself down. Mark softly called out to J-A-R-V-I-S, instructing it to turn off the TV. Let Baymax go with you, it can assist you. Mark, who knew what Tony intended to do, didn't stop him. Since Tony had already made up his mind to become Iron Man, Mark naturally wanted to support him in becoming a better version of himself. However, Mark wouldn't forget the help he could provide within his capabilities. Why bring it along? It's clumsy and slow. If it gets shot and deflates, I'll have to pick it up, and that will only slow me down. Upon hearing Mark's suggestion, Tony immediately made a disdainful expression. Mark didn't get angry at Tony's belittling of Baymax, the robot he had created. He raised his finger and shook it left and right, saying, it seems you haven't seen Baymax in combat mode yet. In battle mode, Baymax can not only help you defeat enemies but also provide medical assistance to injured villagers on site. But it's okay, I'll make sure you change your opinion of it. Then Mark took out his phone and dialed a number. Baymax, equip the combat chip, change into the battle suit, and come to the underground garage. Step. 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 Accompanied by rhythmic footsteps, a figure in red descended the stairs. It was Baymax, already transformed into its battle form. However, unlike Baymax's usual wobbly and adorable appearance, at this moment, its steps were steady. It was enveloped in a vibrant red armor, resembling flames. From the sound of its footsteps, one could tell that the armor was lightweight, likely made of graphene composite materials. The battle form of Baymax is equipped with my latest design super combat chip, which, combined with the super thrusters, gives it tremendous power, making it effortless to take on ten opponents at once. 
and the graphene titanium composite material provides it with robust protection, ensuring that even in close range missile attacks, its body remains intact without compromising its mobility. In addition, the armor is equipped with a flight system. Powered by the updated ARC reactor I installed for Baymax, it can fly at a top speed of 3 Mach. The only regrettable point is that due to the simultaneous inclusion of a medical chip to assist in rescuing the villagers, the offensive capabilities of Baymax have been locked by the system. In other words, Baymax can only help you incapacitate the enemy, and the final step has to be resolved by yourself. Whether it's a lethal strike or left to legal judgment, it's up to your own judgment. After Mark introduced the completely upgraded and transformed battle-ready Baymax, Tony could only express his shock with a WTF. You see, at this moment, Baymax, apart from not being equipped with a powerful weapon system and the ability to inflict harm on enemies, has equipment and functionalities even more advanced than Mark III, which Tony himself hasn't completed yet. And this achievement is not even the mech that Mark ultimately intends to compete with him. Tony can no longer imagine how formidable Mark's ongoing research and development will turn out to be. Sir, I have detected a 30% increase in your heart rate within a short period, accompanied by feelings of anger and astonishment. Baymax kindly reminds you to maintain good mental health and a calm mindset. It is beneficial to your physical well-being. Humph, despite the upgrades, it still can't talk properly like before. Well, later I'll have it follow me and provide cover on site, as well as assist in rescuing trapped and injured villagers. Tony nodded in agreement with Mark's suggestion. He still didn't know the exact situation of Eanson back in Gulmira, but having an assistant would certainly benefit his plans. Oh, Dad, there's one more thing you need to hold. After Tony agreed to bring Baymax along to help himself, Mark suddenly slapped his forehead, remembering something. Dialing a number on his phone once again, Mark spoke up, Magneto, help me bring over Lifesaver No from the bedside. Hurry. Lifesaver No, what kind of strange thing have you come up with again? Hearing Mark giving his inventions peculiar names, Tony was already used to it, but this time, the naming was so absurd that Tony was left speechless. Sizzle sizzle accompanied by the unique sound of magnetic axles rubbing against each other, Mark unveiled his creation. It was a shiny, doll-sized magnetic robot with a simple and minimalist design, consisting of a torso made up of three spheres and limbs made up of six cones. Magneto is a magnetic robot connected through a magnetic axle system throughout its body. Each part of its body can move flexibly in a 360-degree range, and it can be freely assembled and transformed. It is equipped with a high-speed centrifugal motor and graphene batteries, allowing it to operate at high speeds for one hour. It's my new little toy, Mark explained the principles and structure of Magneto to Tony. Tony raised an eyebrow, not a bad idea, but if we're considering commercial development, we need to discuss it thoroughly later. What I'm most interested in right now is that, what is it? Ahem, Mark pointed at the head of Magneto, the small circular disc attached to Magneto's head with magnetic attraction. Tony carefully looked and indeed saw a transparent disc slightly larger than a fingernail attached to the miniaturized head of Magneto. Stop keeping me in suspense. Tell me what it is. Feeling Tony's impatient curiosity, Mark smiled proudly and explained, actually, it's an integrated graphene chip, but I added some special functions to it. The first function is a backup battery. I compressed and folded the graphene material it uses tens of thousands of times, allowing it to have an extremely high energy storage density without altering the properties of graphene. It can serve as a backup power source for the electromagnetic magnet on your chest, sustaining the magnet's normal operation for 15 minutes. After all, you rely on the reactor in your chest for the functions of your armor. If you get carried away and don't control your energy consumption, it could really save your life. Fifteen minutes should be enough for you to find a sustainable power source for the device on your chest. The second function is an automatic distress signal. The sensors on the chip can detect your vital signs. When you encounter an emergency situation, it will automatically send out a distress signal. I've installed signal receivers on all the robots at home, my phone, and Pepper's Nini. The device closest to you will come to your aid when it receives the signal. And the installation is incredibly simple, no wiring needed. Just stick it on top of the arc reactor on your chest. Great stuff. After listening, Tony immediately took it from Magneto and attached it to the arc reactor on his chest. Do you have anything else? 
Bring it out, I'm getting ready for the battlefield, so don't hold anything back. After witnessing the power of Mark's inventions multiple times, Tony now firmly believed in their practicality. Like when he was in Afghanistan, Mark's miraculous suit saved his life. Now he was about to face the firepower of the Ten Rings once again. Although this time he was better prepared, with stronger defensive and offensive capabilities in his armor, he still felt a bit nervous without the desperation that fueled his previous fights. Tony hoped that Mark's inventions could provide him with some support in his heart. I do have something, and it's a weapon. However, it hasn't undergone safety testing yet, so I'm not sure if I should give it to you. After all, this is the first time I've made something this dangerous, Mark's expression turned somewhat tense as he mentioned the power of the weapon, seemingly recalling its destructive potential. In that case, you should definitely show it to me. Remember, I'm an expert in weapon design. Stark Industries relied on the weapons I designed for a living, Tony said, even more intrigued by Mark's description of the weapon as dangerous. He believed that facing those ruthless terrorists required using dangerous weapons against them. Well then, wait here for a moment. I had locked it up in a safe in my room. I have to retrieve it myself, Mark hesitated for a moment, thinking that it might be a good idea to have Tony's input as well. He went back to his room to retrieve this dangerous invention. Soon, Mark returned downstairs with a box. Click, Mark placed the box on the garage workbench and unlocked the fingerprint verification lock on top. As the box opened, Tony finally got to see the true appearance of this dangerous weapon. It was a completely black heavy pistol, with redwood decorations on both sides of the grip. The gun had no openings for magazine loading and unloading, and even the muzzle was different from traditional firearms, featuring an open-ended structure instead of a spiraling barrel. Dad, pick it up and give it a try. Upon hearing Mark's request, Tony picked it up from the box, and he heard a prompt ringing in his ears, identity authentication successful. User is Tony Stark. Usage authorization confirmed. Dominator enforcer activated. At the same time, a blue glow emanated from the hollow parts of the gun's body, and the safety mechanism on the gun was disengaged. The weapon had officially entered its operational state. Now you should have heard that prompt. It's a sound only heard by the person holding the weapon. It's called the Dominator Enforcer, a pistol that can assess the threat level of targets for the wielder and adapt different attack modes accordingly. Assessing threat level. And what was that sound just now? It was like it was ringing in my ears. What kind of technology is this? Once Tony, a super genius and weapons design expert, had the Dominator Enforcer in his hands, he immediately realized its extraordinary nature. The identification of threats and the sound you heard are both applications of my brain machine interface technology. By collecting subconscious brainwave information emitted by the targets, the graphene integrated core inside the dominator can assess their threat levels and unlock different attack modes. As for the application of the prompt sound, it converts information into ideation waves that can be directly received by the brain, stimulating the auditory center for effective information transmission. Furthermore, there is another application, the targeting system. It also stimulates the visual center of the brain through ideation waves, projecting the aiming reticle directly onto the retina. It can be said that it is a foolproof operation where hitting the target is as simple as pulling the trigger. Moreover, you can connect JARVIS as a combat assistance system to the dominator. I have already granted JARVIS the necessary permissions. Now, you can aim the gun at me and give it a try, but please don't pull the trigger. As I mentioned before, it hasn't undergone safety testing yet. Tony nodded, aimed the gun at Mark, and removed his finger from the trigger position. As Mark had described, when Tony attempted to aim at Mark, an auxiliary aiming reticle immediately appeared before his eyes, as if it were a holographic projection. With the help of the blue reticle, Tony effortlessly locked onto Mark. Then something changed, the entire auxiliary aiming interface turned red, and a new prompt sound reached his ears, target threat level determined as 37. No hostile intent, no weapons detected. Threat level below 100. Dominator safety engaged. When Tony looked back at the dominator in his hand, the blue glow on the gun's body had dimmed. Obviously, as notified in the prompt sound, the gun's safety was now engaged. However, due to safety considerations, Tony had no intention of pulling the trigger and testing it out. The design is flawless, from the auxiliary aiming to threat assessment. 
It surpasses the currently deployed weapons of all nations and can even be said to be a weapon ahead of its time. But since the Dominator lacks a loaded magazine and conductive copper wires, the only thing that makes it a dangerous weapon, as you said, must be its method of attack, right? From design to user experience, the Dominator could be considered a perfect product, but the most important and critical aspect was its method of attack. As a weapon, the only evaluation criterion was its killing power. Indeed, you guessed it right. Mark nodded and tapped a few times on the screen of his smartphone, projecting the design diagram of the Dominator as a hologram. When designing the Dominator, I incorporated multiple execution modes. Under different modes, the firearm can transform into various forms, with the selection of the mode determined by the system based on the target's level of danger. When the threat assessment of the target does not reach the baseline or the user is not authorized, the trigger will be locked by the system and unable to be fired. If the threat assessment of the target exceeds the specified value, above 100, the safety will automatically disengage. At that stage, the system selection and the effect of the shot can be modified. After disengaging the safety, the Dominator enters its primary mode, the stun gun. If the threat assessment of the target exceeds 100 but remains below 300, being hit by the Dominator will immediately render them unconscious and defenseless, except for individuals under the influence of high doses of stimulants or psychoactive drugs. If the threat assessment of the target exceeds 300 and they are deemed highly dangerous with hostile intent, it can transition to the second execution mode, the lethal gun. When hit, the targeted body parts and the surrounding tissues instantly swell and eventually burst, resulting in a lethal outcome. The third execution mode is the molecular disintegration gun. It requires approximately 3 seconds to accumulate the corresponding energy and, upon firing, a large energy sphere is released from the muzzle, directly disintegrating the target at a molecular level, leaving no traces behind. It is highly effective against humans and can cause massive cavern-like damage to machines. Under normal circumstances, the molecular disintegration gun mode will not activate. Only users with the highest system privileges can forcefully activate this mode when the threat value of the target exceeds 500. The firearm is powered by an internal miniaturized arc reactor and adjusts the power of the high-energy microwave generator within the gun body to achieve the desired lethality in the three different modes. Speaking of the stun gun, you should be quite impressed. I improved it based on the ultrasound version when I was 6 years old. Compared to the previous version that only temporarily immobilized people, this time it can truly make them faint. However, I haven't tested the power range of each mode yet, and the safety of the safety devices and system hasn't been verified. So its danger might be higher than what I described. But since you requested it, and since you're going to play the hero anyway, why not help me conduct a field test on the Dominator? Collect some parameters for me so that I can make adjustments and improvements. This is indeed a terrifying weapon, Tony looked at the Dominator in his hand and even he felt a chill. As a master weapon designer, he had seen countless powerful weapons and had even designed individual combat suits like the Mark series, but the Dominator gave him a sense of fear. Especially the design logic that there would be no survivors if it hit in the lethal mode made Tony feel that even if he wore the Iron Man armor, he wouldn't stand a chance against the Dominator's attack. After a moment of fear, Tony shook his head and smiled bitterly, if I hadn't shut down the weapons division of Stark Industries, I believe the Dominator would have become the best-selling weapon in history. But now it seems that only a few people will ever get to see it. Mark shrugged nonchalantly, I never intended to mass-produce the Dominator anyway. Making the Dominator was just a way for me to prove if the ideas in my head could really be realized. After all, no matter how high the threat level determined by the system is for the targets it aims at, we can't use that as a basis for pulling the trigger. If the Dominator were to circulate widely, it might truly become the Dominator of human society, just like its name suggests. Alright, for dangerous weapons like the Dominator, only I can help you test them. Jarvis, how is the assembly of Mark III coming along? Tony put the Dominator back in the box and turned to Jarvis to inquire about the progress of Mark III. Sir, it is estimated to be completed in one hour. With one hour left, Mark, project the design diagram of the high-density energy microwave generator you designed. We'll measure a rough threshold value for now, and I'll have Jarvis assist in recording detailed data when we get to Gulmira. In just a short hour, which passed in an instant, for two mechanical enthusiasts immersed in testing experiments, that amount of time was simply not enough for them. 
They had just roughly measured the power supply of the Dominator's three modes when Jarvis's reminder sounded in the garage, Sir, Mark III has been assembled and painted in red and gold as per your request. Only then did Tony remember his plan to rescue Gulmira Town. Reluctantly putting down the Dominator in his hand, he ordered, Jarvis, prepare for suiting up. Understood, sir. Tony changed into a black bodysuit and stood at the designated spot on the dressing platform. Sensing that Tony was in position, the floor of the platform began to rotate and transform. Mark III, which had been assembled by mechanical arms, rose from beneath the ground. Tony looked at Mark III, which had risen in front of him, and without hesitation, he stepped onto it. The mechanical arms immediately followed, attaching the red and gold leg armor and securing the connection structures. At this point, with the completion of the armor for the limbs and torso, four sets of mechanical arms descended from the ceiling, corresponding to Mark III's chest armor, back armor, and the arm armor on both sides. After the chest armor was connected, the arc reactor on Tony's chest also integrated into the entire suit as Mark III's power source. Once all the limb and torso armor was in place, the red helmet of Mark III, accompanied by a golden faceplate, was seamlessly combined and fastened onto Tony's head. Click, the mask closed, and a blue light shone from the eye area of the faceplate, indicating that Tony was fully suited up and ready to go. Be careful and stay safe. Baymax, take good care of the old man. Mark leaned on the chair he was sitting in, gripping the edge of the seat tightly, revealing his concern and nervousness. Baymax understood. Baymax will do everything possible to protect the old master. Don't worry. Call and order a few cheeseburgers for me. Let's have lunch together when I come back. I'm off. After comforting Mark with those words, Tony rushed straight out of the underground garage and into the night. Observing this, Baymax also deployed the flight flaps on its back and followed with a swoosh as the propulsion system was activated. I hope everything goes as smoothly as in the movies. I hope nothing goes wrong because of my arrival like a little butterfly. Mark murmured anxiously. What he didn't know was that the reason Tony left in a hurry after saying those words was to prevent him from knowing that he was moved by those caring words and nearly shed a tear. To conceal his teary voice and preserve his dignity as a father, Tony swiftly fled the scene. Boom. Ah. Spare me, spare me, die, you bastard. Crisis and chaos, slaughter and pleas for mercy, this chaotic land is the hometown of Dr. Insen, which was once peaceful and tranquil, Gulmira. At this moment, Dr. Insen is exerting all his efforts to fulfill the promise he made. When Insen and Tony separated, he made a wish to return to his hometown. And protect the land, as well as the happiness of the families living there for generations. However, what Dr. Insen can do now is just to protect the lives of as many of his fellow countrymen as possible. Sending them out of Gulmira also means sending them on a perilous journey through the desert. For the Gulmira residents who have just escaped the threat of war and have no food or tools, this is nothing but a desperate measure. But even so, it is the only option they have now, and Dr. Insen has to painfully help them embark on this dangerous escape route. Because even wearing the miraculous suit, facing the overwhelming numbers and superior weapons of the Ten Rings organization, and even holding hostages, Insen is powerless. He can only compromise with reality time and time again and hypnotize himself that it is the only way to keep hope alive. Hurry up. The Ten Rings organization is getting closer, you need to pass through here quickly. At a secret exit from Gulmira, Insen, escorting the villagers, is urgently urging the people passing through. The intelligent system embedded in the miraculous suit, which Tony presented to him and was meticulously developed by Mark, has already issued a warning to him. Bang! Bang! Before the villagers could completely pass through, the sound of gunfire from the terrorists of the Ten Rings organization had already resounded. Stop them quickly and put the women in the car. The villagers who hadn't had a chance to escape were all controlled by the members of the Ten Rings organization who arrived, and even Insen with the miraculous suit had no means of fighting back. He knew that if he resisted, even though his high-tech suit could save his life, the children around him and their parents would lose their precious lives and loved ones because of his impulsiveness. So he could only wait for the right moment and look for an opportunity to help everyone escape. But when everyone had already surrendered with resignation, a young boy, after seeing his father being taken away by the members of the Ten Rings organization, broke free from his mother's embrace and rushed to his father's side. 
Seeing the order he established with terror being overthrown, the enraged leader grabbed the collar of the young boy with his hand, forcefully throwing him aside, and then kicked down the boy's father. Execute him for me. Let them know the consequences of disobedience. After receiving the order, one of the armed terrorists of the Ten Rings organization pressed against the man, about to shoot right in front of the young boy. No, daddy, the young boy, tightly held in his mother's arms, let out a desperate cry. Just when Insen and everyone present had already lost hope, buzz, boom. A figure in red and gold descended from the sky. Looks like I'm not too late, scum, Tony, wearing the magnificent Mark III armor, descended from the sky, leaving everyone present momentarily stunned. A terrorist from the Ten Rings organization, overwhelmed with panic, pulled the trigger of his rifle, rat a tat it for clang 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 clang, all the bullets that hit Tony left only a white mark on the Mark III armor and lost their momentum as they fell to the ground. However, before Tony could counterattack the terrorist, another bulky red figure descended from the sky and directly pinned him down, preventing him from continuing to fire at Tony. Master, please specify the primary mission and confirm the start of action. The primary mission is to protect the villagers. Commence action. At Tony's command, the large, white, muscular body immediately transformed into a compressed spring and shot in front of a hostage-holding enemy. The combat chips program instantly activated, and boom 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 boom, Baymax swung its chubby fists in a continuous straight punch, bending the enemy like an iron rod until they lay on the ground. Due to the system's restriction on causing harm, after confirming that the target was unconscious, Baymax did not use a finishing move to eliminate the enemy but instead propelled itself to the next target. It may sound complicated, but despite its large size, Baymax was lightweight due to its inflatable structure. Combined with its super braking system, it swiftly neutralized more than a dozen combatants from the Ten Rings organization in just six seconds. Covered in high-strength graphene composite materials, White was impervious to the enemy's firepower and suffered no damage. Therefore, it quickly rescued all the villagers from the grip of the Ten Rings organization. Meanwhile, Tony kept the Ten Rings organization distracted, and by the time they realized it, they no longer possessed the means to threaten him. At the moment when all the villagers were rescued by Baymax, Insen, who was no longer restrained, joined the battle. With the three of them working together, the Ten Rings organization squad was utterly defenseless and quickly defeated. Tony, is that you? With no more threat from the enemy, Insen excitedly walked toward Tony, who was wearing the Mark III armor. Although there was a mask between them, Insen knew that there was no one else in the world who could create such refined and powerful armor except for the Stark family. Seeing Insen approach, Tony opened his mask, spread his arms, and gave him a big hug. Long time no see, Insen. It's great to see that you're still alive. Insen's eyes were slightly red, showing his excitement. It's all thanks to the suit you gave me. It helped me save the lives of many compatriots. Tony gently patted him on the back. Relax, I'll help you. Just wait for me for a moment. I'll go and destroy the Ten Rings organization's arsenal. We can talk later. Baymax, keep an eye on those unconscious guys. We still haven't obtained the data Mark needs. After saying that, Tony took a few steps back, distancing himself from Dr. Insen, and then activated the thrusters to head directly toward the target, the arms depot. Seeing the red and gold armored figure approaching, the tanks guarding the Ten Rings organization's arsenal unexpectedly launched an anti-aircraft missile, successfully shooting Tony down. However, facing anti-aircraft missiles that were ineffective against the Mark III armor, which was coated with graphene and reinforced with titanium gold alloy, the internal shock absorption system efficiently absorbed the impact energy, protecting Tony from any harm. Without a scratch, Tony quickly stood up from the ground and, using the targeting system, locked onto the only tank in the arms depot. He fired a miniature armor-piercing round, destroying it. Then, using the repulsor in his palm, he ignited all the remaining Stark Industries weapons in the stockpile. After completing all of this, Tony and Baymax assisted Insen in evacuating the remaining villagers in Gulmira town before finding a place to sit down and reminisce. Is this your latest developed armor? Immediately after taking a seat, Insen couldn't wait to discuss the Mark III armor that Tony was currently wearing. Yes, ever since I returned and announced the closure of Stark Industries Weapons Division, I've been in seclusion, collaborating with Mark to develop the next generation of suits. 
This suit is the Mark III, the third generation armor. Speaking of which, I apologize to you, Insen, for the suffering Gulmira has endured. I didn't expect the shareholders of the board to secretly continue selling Stark Industries weapons to terrorists behind my back. I'm sorry. Tony expressed remorse and bowed 90 degrees to Insen. Don't be like this. Insen immediately stood up and helped Tony to his feet. Even without Stark Industries, there will be other weapons manufacturers. Terrorists will always find a way to get what they want, and besides, you were not in control of the situation. How could I blame you? And thanks to the amazing suit you gave me, I was able to help some of my fellow countrymen escape from this place. I should be grateful to you and Mark. Don't say that, you're my savior. Tony placed his hand on Insen's shoulder. Don't worry, I'll arrange for people to help you settle the refugees in the town. Thank you, Tony, Insen expressed his gratitude. By the way, besides coming here to resolve the trouble in Gulmira, I also have a mission to help Mark test his new invention. Would you like to join and take a look? Tony knew that since Insen experienced the wonders of the magical suit, he had become a fan of his own son, Mark. He knew Insen would be interested in Mark's new invention. Sure. As expected, Insen's excitement soared upon receiving the invitation. The people of Gulmira have been rescued, and my work here is done. Now I feel relaxed and have plenty of time. Then let's go. Baymax, bring the prototypes, Tony commanded, already deciding the fate of the captured members of the Ten Rings organization. Inside an enclosed area, dozens of members of the Ten Rings organization, who were knocked unconscious by Baymax, gradually regained consciousness and stood up from the ground. However, they remained frozen in place, with not a single person attempting to escape. In front of them, Tony, wearing Mark III, along with Baymax and Insen, stood silently, watching them. Once everyone had awakened, Tony didn't say a word to them. He immediately raised the Dominator one by one and aimed at them. Threat level below 100, safety locked. Threat level below 100, safety locked. Threat level 220, safety unlocked. Dominator's basic mode activated. After conducting several consecutive tests on the targets, the Dominator's prompt changed. Baymax, scan the man with the red headband. Roger. Scan initiated. Scan complete. The target has a microbomb hidden in his body, which can be detonated using a switch concealed in his belt. It seems the target isn't prepared to detonate the bomb. The threat level hasn't exceeded 300, Tony analyzed and understood the reason behind the Dominator's threat level assessment. Since that's the case, let's proceed to the next step. After saying that, Tony, guided by the Dominator's targeting assistance, pulled the trigger directly at the man with the red headband. Zier after the Dominator's barrel emitted a blue flicker, the man with the red headband in the distance fell to the ground, unconscious and motionless. Baymax, scan him again and record his physical data, Tony ordered White once more. Scan initiated. Scan complete. Based on the comparison between the two scans, the target hasn't suffered any irreversible damage and is currently in a shallow state of unconsciousness. They are expected to wake up on their own in approximately 30 minutes. The results are impressive. It seems Mark put some effort into the calculations. Insen, standing nearby, looked at Tony's Dominator, which resembled a piece of art, with a fanatical gaze and asked, Is this Mark's new invention? What is the principle of anesthesia? How does it achieve such long-range accuracy? Can it be applied in the field of medicine? After listening to Insen's rapid-fire questions, Tony smiled wryly and shook his head. You ask so many questions, how should I answer you? This is Mark's new invention, and also his first-ever weapon, the Dominator. It uses a built-in high-energy microwave generator to induce a stun effect. Whether it can be applied in medicine will depend on clinical trials and FDA approval. But if you think this is just an anesthetic gun, then you're gravely mistaken. It lives up to its name, the Dominator. As he spoke, Tony threw a captured machine gun to the now conscious members of the Ten Rings organization, then shouted, Pick it up, defeat me, and you'll have a chance to escape from here. Tony, are you crazy? Insen couldn't understand Tony's unusual behavior. Insen, you'll understand when you see it. The terrorists within the enclosure looked at each other hesitantly. 
After all, the heroic performance of the three individuals standing before them was still fresh in their minds, making it difficult to forget. However, there was one person among them who was brave enough to take the risk. After a struggle, a bearded man stepped forward and picked up the machine gun from the ground. He had decided that if he charged towards Insen, who appeared to be the weakest and slenderest among the three, and took him hostage, he would have a good chance of securing his own safety and escape. Little did he know that as he harbored these sinister thoughts, the Dominator, which had been aiming at him the entire time, had already reported his threat level to Tony. Target threat level exceeds 300, safety disengaged, second execution mode activated, permission to eliminate the target. Receiving the signal, Tony didn't hesitate and pulled the trigger of the Dominator. Zier, boom. The bearded man, who had survived for a long time in the midst of gunfire, seemed to have sensed something and instinctively lunged to the right at the same time, narrowly avoiding a shot to his vital area. However, before he could celebrate his timely evasion, the immense impact of pain and panic caused him to lose his composure entirely. Wide-eyed, he watched as his left arm, grazed by the Dominator's attack, swelled up like an inflated balloon and began to spread rapidly. After expanding and spreading throughout his body, with a bang, the bearded man exploded like a balloon filled with red ink. On the ground, besides the bright red blood, there lay a bright red machine gun and some unrecognizable body parts. Nothing was left that could identify his identity. Target eliminated, safety locked. After receiving the prompt from the Dominator, even Tony, who had already learned about its effects from Mark, couldn't help but be stunned and trembling, his eyes wide open. As for Insen by his side and the members of the Ten Rings organization inside the enclosure, they were even more shocked by the shocking scene. Not a single person let out a scream of terror. Is this Mark's new invention? It's terrifying. This isn't just a Dominator, it's a tyrant. Insen finally came to his senses and turned his head, murmuring softly, as if responding to Tony's question and expressing his own astonishment. In the next moment, the terrorists who had previously been too afraid to move due to the overwhelming power of Tony and his companions, suddenly rushed towards the pool of blood on the ground, competing with each other. Their goal was to grab the machine gun, not to resist Tony and his companions or to escape from this place but to obtain an easy way to die without having to experience the horrifying ordeal they had just witnessed. Yes, they were fighting for an opportunity to commit suicide. But Tony wouldn't give them such a chance. I order, with the highest authority, to activate the third execution mode. Highest authority verified, Dominator's third execution mode activated, energy charging, 3, 2, 1, initiate molecular decomposition mode. Tony looked at the Ten Rings organization terrorists, who had gathered around the machine gun, and gently pulled the trigger. Z, thud. Insen, standing aside, only saw a dazzling blue light flash by and instinctively closed his eyes. When he opened them again, there were only two living beings left in the entire enclosure, himself and Tony. The other captives, including the first man with the red headband who had been knocked unconscious, had all disappeared without a trace, not even leaving behind any bloodstains. Molecular decomposition gun. Mark, your invention really scared the hell out of me this time. Clang. Mark held a cheeseburger in one hand and a happy fatty soda in the other, looking at Tony who had landed safely in the garage. You're pretty fast. What about Baymax? He's still there. I left him there temporarily to take care of the local refugees. I'll arrange for the staff of the Stark Charitable Foundation to take over for him shortly, and he should be able to return tonight. Tony took off his mask, snatched the soda from Mark's hand at the entrance, and drank it in big gulps. Ah, refreshing. Why do you look so disheveled? With Baymax's help, it shouldn't be that difficult to deal with the Ten Rings Organization's ragtag group. Mark frowned, noticing his father's somewhat stiff expression and the deep dents on Mark III. It's nothing. Just had a little game of hide and seek with a couple of big birds on the way back. Unfortunately, I wasn't the one playing the ghost. Where's the burger you prepared for me? Why didn't I see mine? Tony didn't explain in detail and deflected the topic, feeling guilty. Mark shrugged. Who knew you would come back so early? I only ordered mine. There's still half left. Do you want it? Mark held the cheeseburger he had taken a few bites from and offered it to Tony, a mischievous smirk on his face. Unexpectedly, Tony didn't mind and reached out to take the burger. 
don't think you can dismiss me that easily. If I can't eat my favorite cheeseburger from that place within half an hour, don't expect me to send you the test data for your dominator. Humph. After saying that, Tony took big bites and quickly finished most of the burger in his hand. Mark hooked the corner of his mouth, appearing nonchalant. Well, you're destined to be disappointed. I've already had Baymax upload the real-time test data to my private server. I can check it anytime now. Ha ha ha. Tony angrily finished the remaining half cup of soda, having no leverage to threaten Mark anymore. He couldn't do anything about it and could only sulk by himself. Jarvis, help me disarm. Tony stood on the changing platform and gave the command to Jarvis. But moments later, Tony's little temper had completely disappeared. The garage was filled with Tony's screams of, ah, and, ouch, and Mark's hearty laughter from the other side. Please bear with it for a moment, sir. The Mark III suit you designed is very form-fitting, so the more you move, the more it hurts. Be gentle, Jarvis. This is my first time. I designed it to be removable, so I should be able to. Ouch. You caught my hair. Are you trying to make me go bald? Please try not to move, sir. If you really want to keep your hair, please wear a wig before putting on the combat suit next time. Ha ha ha, Jarvis, I'm starting to like your sense of humor more and more. Mark timely added fuel to the fire on the side. Humph. You brat. Ouch, be more gentle. What happened here? Pepper, who had come to report to Tony, couldn't find any amusement in the scene that had Mark laughing uncontrollably. Are those bullet holes? Believe me, it's not as bad as it looks. Twenty minutes later, Tony finally took off the suit and collapsed weakly on the sofa. It was so difficult. The armor shouldn't have pursued the so-called fashionable fit. I miss the comfort of Mark I. Hey, have something to eat. You should think about how to explain this to Pepper. At that moment, Mark placed a takeout bag in front of Tony on the coffee table. Didn't you say you didn't order mine? Tony opened the bag and found his favorite cheeseburger and a cup of soda. I don't want to think about troublesome things right now. I just managed to send Pepper away. Explaining everything is now left to fate. Just teasing you. So, how was the Dominator's design after you actually used it? Did you find any flaws? Mark steered the conversation back to the Dominator, which he was most concerned about. No, everything was perfect. Or I should say the flaw of the Dominator is that it's too perfect. It makes judgments based on system set rules, and the wielder only has the right to pull the trigger. Combined with its visually stunning lethality. The Dominator might truly dominate its wielder and become a cold-blooded killing machine. Hmm. Considering Tony's suggestion, Mark stroked his slightly stubbled chin, lowered his head, pondered for a moment, and then said, how about adding a user psychological evaluation program? If the user begins to show psychological fluctuations, the dominator will temporarily suspend their access to the second and third execution modes, deeming their condition unsuitable. What do you think? Not bad, but you must be cautious in determining authorization for the person. After all, the power of the dominator is enough to leave even a weapons expert like me dumbfounded. Tony nodded and agreed with Mark's idea. Don't worry. With such a cool weapon, it must remain an exclusive weapon of our Stark family. I don't plan on granting authorization to anyone else. Smart. My Mark series armors are the same. They're my exclusive armors, and no one else should dare to touch them. Tony spoke proudly. Humph, when my transformers are developed, no one will be interested in your armors. Mark retorted, refusing to back down. Well, considering the face of the cheeseburger, I won't argue with my son. Tony ignored Mark's provocation and grabbed the cheeseburger from the table, taking big bites. Seeing that he couldn't provoke Tony's temper, Mark shrugged and turned on the TV to catch up on the latest news. Earlier today, an F-22 Raptor fighter jet of the Air Force crashed during a flight exercise in Gulmira. Fortunately, the pilot was unharmed. As for the unexpected turn of events in the town of Gulmira, we are still unclear about who or what intervened. But I can swear that the government of our country has nothing to do with it. Watching Colonel Rhodes deliver the accident report on TV, Mark turned his head in surprise and looked at Tony. The game of hide and seek with the big bird you mentioned, could it be the F-22 Raptor that Colonel Rhodes mentioned? 
I think my analogy was quite vivid. Don't you agree? I think you've gone crazy. Don't make a big fuss about it. If the worst comes to worst, I'll just compensate them with a better aircraft. Besides, the Air Force can't do anything to me. They still need me to design the engine for the Quinjet fighter they're currently developing, Tony shrugged nonchalantly, taking another big bite of his cheeseburger. I think you're fearless, for sure. Colonel Rhodes must have helped you cover up the situation. Otherwise, the Department of Defense and the military officials would definitely drag you to court and force you to hand over the technology of the Iron Man armor to the country, using various charges, Mark warned his old man about the future developments of the events. They're just wishful thinking. They can't touch my stuff, Tony dismissed the concern. Let's not talk about this anymore. We'll deal with it when it actually happens. The legal and PR teams I hired are not to be taken lightly. Whether they come with words or force, whether they want to sue or sabotage, I'll handle them all. By the way, I've already set up a personal sole proprietorship company for you in your name. The company's staff is already assembled. The name is, Mark Stark Technology R&D Center. You are the company's director and responsible for liability for business debt. But since you're not of legal age yet, I'll act as your guardian and guarantee for you, Tony informed. You decided on the company name without even confirming it with me. Mark thought Tony was too occupied with the development of the armor and hadn't had the chance to fulfill this matter. However, when he heard the news again, he realized the company was already established, and the name was not of his choosing. With your naming skills, could you come up with a good name? Tony replied. Mark's words hit him hard, targeting his weak spot. Faced with Tony's counter-question, Mark remained silent, keeping all his words to himself. Although reluctant to admit it, after enduring numerous blows over the past decade, Mark had come to accept that his luck in naming things was not great. You see, you can't even come up with an answer. So, since I'll end up changing it anyway, isn't it more efficient for me to decide directly? Besides, Pepper helped with the name, so if you have any objections, you can talk to her, Tony said. Then I have no objections. Mark said in a somewhat dejected manner. Good. Now, I'm going to explain the Mark III situation to Pepper and build some rapport. By the way, I'll also show you the location of your new company's office. Do you remember to reserve a dedicated laboratory for me? Mark looked interestedly at Tony and asked. Don't worry, everything is arranged according to my standards. And your laboratory is a pilot project for the arc reactor's new energy. All the equipment in your lab will be powered by the underground arc reactor, which is expected to provide uninterrupted power for over 200 years, Tony assured him. Yes. Mark jumped up with joy upon hearing Tony's description of his new laboratory. For a scientific enthusiast like him, what could be more appealing than a laboratory that could bring all his ideas to life? After tidying up his appearance, Tony drove Mark to a high-tech innovation park located an hour's drive from the Stark Mansion. This innovation park was designed and built by Stark Industries, incorporating production and research into one. Only technology startups that received investment from Stark Industries or related companies approved by Stark Industries could enter this innovation park. The park charged a small management fee and rent well below market prices to the resident companies each year, but this didn't mean they could enjoy these benefits without worries. If their annual research results did not meet the approval of Stark Industries' evaluation department, they could be expelled from the park. Stark Industries might also stop investing in the company and sell off their shares. However, this wasn't a problem for Mark. Not to mention that he was the heir of Stark Industries, during this time, he had also gained a considerable number of Stark Industries shares in the stock market amidst the turmoil caused by the closure of the Stark Industries weapons division. Based solely on his own inventive and creative abilities, he was confident that he could pass this so-called year-end evaluation with 100% certainty. The car drove through the park's carefully landscaped roads and finally stopped in front of a six-story building entirely covered in dark green glass curtain walls. They arrived at the entrance, where there were no security guards or receptionists. Tony swiped his face on the facial recognition device at the entrance, and the glass door automatically unlocked and opened. Leading Mark inside, Tony explained, the building has only undergone decoration and office equipment procurement so far, without any smart design. I know you definitely won't be able to hand over this part to others, so I'll leave it for you to play around with. 
The first floor is the reception area and dining area, the second and third floors are the communal office areas, and the fourth and fifth floors are the executive offices. And the top floor, the sixth floor, is your personal laboratory, equipped with the most advanced protective hardware. As for the system and intelligent assistant, you have the freedom to do as you please. How is it? Not bad, right? They made their way to the laboratory on the sixth floor. Tony looked pleased as he saw Mark's excited expression while examining the various seamlessly integrated equipment. All right, all right, you go find Pepper, I can't wait to turn this place into my personal kingdom. Mark exclaimed. He couldn't wait to start planning the automation design and building control system for the office building. He eagerly opened his computer and got to work. Tony rolled his eyes and smirked, All right, I'm leaving. You can take your time. I'll notify the personal secretary I've chosen for you to come and give you an update on the staff situation, and she'll also drive you home. Mark remained focused on the computer without responding, but he raised his left hand and made an OK gesture, then waved his hand forcefully, indicating to Tony, you're not needed here anymore, so leave quickly. This kid, he's really a chip off the old block in this kind of situation. Tony turned and left the laboratory on the sixth floor, went downstairs, started his car, and left the park. Ah, just thinking about explaining to Pepper later gives me a headache. Suddenly, Tony regretfully slapped the steering wheel. Oh no. I should have asked Mark for advice earlier. I was so caught up in his proud demeanor that I forgot. No, I need to go online and check for some strategies first. Tony parked the car on the side of the road and started searching for Love Strategy 2 online. Little did he know that those so-called strategies online were just a bunch of keyboard warriors indulging in their own fantasies. Realistically fulfilled individuals wouldn't waste their time on anything other than their significant others. California, an abandoned railway hub, was now crowded with many Middle Eastern-looking adult men carrying weapons. Bonfires burned around, with people patrolling and guarding the perimeter, giving it the appearance of a military stronghold. At this moment, a black commercial van tore through the dark night, slowly approaching from a distance. However, strangely enough, this heavily guarded base did not stop this car that seemed out of place here, allowing it to enter the interior of the base. The vehicle arrived at the central area, where the security was even tighter. After the car stopped, a black bodyguard dressed in bulletproof clothing and carrying a Stark Industries fully automatic rifle got out first, opening the car door for the important figure in the back seat. And the person who got out of the car was none other than Tony's dear uncle, Obadiah. Welcome, spoke a scar-faced man. If Tony were here at this moment, he would easily recognize this person's identity as the lieutenant of the Ten Rings who had kidnapped him. And this place was a temporary base they had established secretly after smuggling into the United States. As Obadiah confidently walked towards the scar-faced man who welcomed him, one could tell from his relaxed expression that he had encountered these terrorists before. Approaching the scar-faced man, Obadiah did not respond to his welcome but wore a superior smile, staring mockingly at the scars on his face. The scar-faced man showed no fear and pointed to the scars, saying, this is a gift Tony Stark left me. Hearing this, Obadiah's mocking tone grew stronger. If you had killed him when you were supposed to, you wouldn't have that. Understanding the double meaning behind the other's sarcasm, the scar-faced man became somewhat angry and said, you expect us to kill such a powerful figure with the little money you've given us? However, Obadiah did not give him a chance to continue complaining. Without a trace of sympathy in his words, he pointed directly to the purpose of this visit, saying, lead me to see that weapon. Very well, leave your bodyguard outside, the scar-faced man paused for a moment and agreed to the request. The Ten Rings had possessed this set of armor for some time now, but due to limitations in funds and knowledge, even with the existing model and the blueprints Tony drew in the surveillance, the illiterate members of the Ten Rings could not find a way to replicate the armor. Given that, they had no choice but to find a partner who had both the knowledge and the funds, and most importantly, the ambition to cooperate in this goal. Once this plan was accomplished, they would not only possess the most powerful force but also gain a continuous source of money. After considering for a while, they finally chose the suitable candidate for this partnership, which was Obadiah Stane, an ambitious person who intended to kill Tony Stark and seize his company and industries. And tonight's meeting was to finalize this deal. 
Obadiah made a gesture, indicating that his bodyguard should stay outside, and then followed the scar-faced man into a rudimentary tent. Opening the curtain, as soon as they entered, Tony's Mark I, handcrafted by him and Insen in a cave in Afghanistan, came into view. Greed gleamed in his eyes, like the eyes of a feline animal in the night. Even with the crude assembly by the illiterate members of the Ten Rings, it did not hinder him from appreciating it as the most marvelous artwork in the world. He escaped but left us with a little surprise, the scar-faced man said, looking at Obadiah with a hint of pride. So this is the secret weapon he used to escape the cave all by himself. Obadiah asked while his eyes were fixed on every component of the Mark I, this is just a preliminary creation. Tony Stark has improved its design and already made a masterpiece capable of killing. With just a few of these suits, a person can rule over Asia. And you, too, desire Stark's throne. We have a common enemy. The scar-faced man calmly expressed his immense ambition. Obadiah shifted his gaze away from the Markai, glanced at him, and gestured for him to continue speaking. We can continue our business negotiations. I can give you these designs as a gift. In return, I want you to create an army of steel soldiers for me. Obadiah didn't reply but smiled at him and then approached him intimately, placing his hand on his shoulder. Unbeknownst to the scar-faced man, a small device had already appeared in Obadiah's hand. He pressed a switch, and the device emitted a high-frequency sound wave. Before the scar-faced man could react, his brain became congested, and he completely lost his ability to move. This is the only gift you will receive. Obadiah pointed to the noise-canceling earplugs in his own ears and shook the ultrasonic device in his hand, revealing a cruel smile. Technology, this is your eternal weakness in this world. As he spoke, Obadiah turned off the device and removed the earplugs from his ears. But don't worry, the effect of this thing only lasts for 15 minutes. But this is the least of your troubles. After finishing his words, Obadiah directly lifted the curtain of the tent and walked out. Outside the tent, seeing that all the Ten Rings guards had been subdued by his own bodyguards, Obadiah showed no surprise. It was evident that he had planned this in advance. Bring me the armor inside and clean up the mess. It's time for us to leave. As soon as his words fell, along with the sound of gunfire and the hissing of firearms, the abandoned railway hub fell into silence once again. It was unknown how long it would be until someone set foot here again. Establish Sector 16 beneath the ARC reactor prototype. The mission must be conducted in secrecy. Gather our best engineers. I want you to immediately create a prototype for me. Also, keep an eye on Tony and Mark for me. Everything related to Stark Industries must fall into my hands. We cannot afford to make any more mistakes this time. So, what you're saying is that the unidentified factor that quelled the turmoil in Gulmira town, as reported in the news, was actually you. You, wearing that suit of armor, single-handedly took down a whole terrorist unit. Pepper Potts couldn't believe it and covered her wide-open mouth with both hands in astonishment. This is too dangerous, Mr. Stark. You must immediately stop this reckless behavior. You have Mark to take care of, and the lives of tens of thousands of Stark Industries employees depend on you. Just think about the condition the armor was in, full of bullet holes, when you last returned. What if something happens to you? What will happen to these people? Calm down, Pepper, calm down. Don't get so worked up. Those bullet holes might look horrifying, but they didn't cause any critical damage to the armor. You also know that both Mark and I possess intelligence far beyond ordinary people. The safety and reliability of Mark III, developed through the combined efforts of both of us, are beyond doubt. Tony steadied his hands on Pepper's shoulders, looked directly into her eyes, and patiently tried to reassure her. I'm very worried about you, you know. You barely escaped from the hands of those villains, so why would you put yourself in danger again? Perhaps this is the growth I gained from the kidnapping incident. It's precisely because I'm well aware of the dangers I face that I developed Mark III to protect myself, isn't it? And as long as I have you supporting me from behind, even in the face of danger, I can maintain peace of mind. At the most opportune moment, Tony finally uttered the carefully curated lines he had gathered online. And unsurprisingly, with this statement, the situation instantly turned around. Pepper blushed and lowered her head, no longer raising objections to Tony's risky actions. Pepper, 
if you don't mind, I need you to do me a favor. I want you to go to my office, hack into the computer mainframe, and find all recent shipping manifests. Tony said, handing an item to Pepper. This is a password chip. With it, you can easily hack in. The list might be in the main folder, or it could be hidden within the drives, in which case you'll need to search for the smallest titles. If I retrieve the list, what will you do with it? Pepper asked, concerned that Tony might engage in something dangerous again. Just like last time, they're conducting covert transactions, and I need to stop them. I want to find those weapons and destroy them. Tony, you know I'm willing to help you with anything. But if you're involved in something that will put you in dangerous again, I can't assist you, Pepper reluctantly refused. All right then, this will be your next task, an order given by Tony Stark, your boss. Tony Stark, the straight-laced Iron Man, made his appearance again, shattering the good atmosphere that had been painstakingly established. Is that so? Then I quit. Pepper, without backing down, threw the password chip on the table. All these years, while I profited from the destruction, you were always by my side. But now that I want to protect those in danger because of me, you want to leave. You're going to get yourself killed like this, Tony. I don't want to be involved. Everyone should have a purpose in life. The old Tony Stark died in that cave in Afghanistan along with the explosion. The reborn Tony Stark needs a new purpose. I'm not going crazy, Pepper. I just suddenly realized what I should do, and I know deep down that it's the right thing to do. Pepper didn't respond but silently picked up the password chip from the table. You're my everything too, you know. Stark Industries office building, today Pepper changed her usual schedule and arrived at the company half an hour earlier. From her nervous expression, it was clear that something was indeed out of the ordinary. Before entering Tony's office, she observed her surroundings and noticed that no one else had arrived yet. She quickly opened the door and walked in, swiftly closing the office door behind her. Once at her destination, Pepper wasted no time and hurriedly opened Tony's computer mainframe, connecting the password chip to begin searching for the necessary information. Following Tony's instructions, she first searched for the data in the main folder but found nothing. Then she opened the computer's driver folder. It contained many missile blueprints and data designed by Tony, but after a thorough search, she became drawn to a set of blueprints for a giant suit of armor. The design was clearly aligned with the same concept she had seen in Tony's previous armor but had a distinctly different appearance. Sector 16. What are you up to, Obadiah? Could it be that Mark's earlier speculation was correct? Recalling the conversation with Mark when Tony had just returned safely, he had mentioned that only Pepper and Obadiah were aware of Tony's itinerary within the entire company. Therefore, the traitor must be one of them. And now, it was becoming evident that the answer was revealing itself. A video she found further confirmed Pepper's suspicion. In the video, Tony was securely bound and his ears were covered. He sat firmly in the center while surrounded by a group of burly men with their faces covered by headscarves, holding rifles. The leader held a script and delivered a speech in English with a Middle Eastern accent. You didn't tell us that the person you wanted us to assassinate was the famous Tony Stark, just as you can see, Obadiah Stane. You will pay for your deceit and lies, and Tony Stark's head has just become more valuable. Oh my god! Pepper didn't expect it to be true. Tony's beloved uncle was secretly plotting to bring him to his demise. Realizing the gravity of the situation, she quickly transferred the two important files onto the password chip, intending to bring them back and reveal the truth to Tony. Just then, the office door opened, and the person who entered was Obadiah Stane. Oh, Miss Potts, I didn't expect you to be here before working hours. You've surprised me. I know you're in a difficult position right now, Pepper. Obadiah held a glass and approached the wine cabinet in Tony's office. At this moment, observing the slight unease on Pepper's face, Obadiah could already guess why she appeared here so early in the morning. However, until he confirmed that his disguise had been completely exposed, Obadiah maintained his hypocritical facade, preserving the gentlemanly demeanor he had perfected over the years. What he didn't know was that beneath his proper manners, his eyes betrayed his insatiable greed and ferocity, revealing his true nature. Pepper adjusted herself while maintaining a professional smile, simultaneously monitoring the progress of the data download with her peripheral vision. Tony always has good things, doesn't he? 
At that moment, Obadiah took a bottle of Tony's prized wine from the cabinet and poured himself a glass. Seizing the opportunity while his attention shifted, Pepper quickly picked up a newspaper from the computer desk and used it to cover the password chip on the mainframe. She then activated the screensaver, hiding the transfer progress on the desktop. As Obadiah filled his glass and approached the desk, all he saw was Pepper staring at the screensaver without any action, forcing him to continue with his pretense. When Tony returned home, you have no idea how relieved I was, as if he had resurrected from the dead. But now I realize that Tony never truly came back, did he? He left a part of himself in that cave, and it saddens me. Pepper nervously looked at Obadiah, who sat just within arm's reach. Um. He is indeed a complicated person. Sensing her own heightened tension, Pepper paused for a moment, forcing a stiff smile and continued, he has been through many hardships, but I believe he will recover. Obadiah took a sip of his drink, gave Pepper a meaningful glance, and said, you truly are an exceptional woman. Tony has no idea how lucky he is. Thank you for your praise, but I must go. Pepper stood up, picked up the newspaper, and casually retrieved the password chip. After a brief farewell with Obadiah, she left the office under his watchful gaze. Turning the corner, out of Obadiah's sight, Pepper looked at the password chip in her hand and breathed a sigh of relief. She hastened her pace and headed towards the company's exit. On the other side, after seeing Pepper's figure disappear, Obadiah immediately turned back to his computer, unlocking the screensaver. When he saw the prompt on the desktop, he finally confirmed that Pepper had discovered his secret. He forcefully leaned back in his chair, his gaze becoming more resolute and ruthless. Since his disguise had been exposed, she couldn't blame himself for being ruthless from now on. Miss Potts, I'm afraid we have an appointment. Did you forget our arrangement? As Pepper hurriedly descended to the lobby of the office building, she caught Agent Coulson's attention as planned. Considering Coulson's identity as an agent, Pepper, who realized she was in danger at this point, played along, no, I haven't forgotten. You can come with me now. This meeting is guaranteed to be unforgettable for you. On the second floor of the lobby, Obadiah could only watch helplessly as Pepper escaped. In frustration, he turned and made his way to Sector 16, hidden beneath the prototype exhibition area of the ARC reactor. Inside Sector 16, a group of scientists gathered by Obadiah were busy at work. When they saw him forcefully enter, the project leader immediately halted their work and went to greet him. Mr. Stain, the task you assigned to us seems to be a bit difficult. After conducting research, we unanimously believe that the technology to enable the functionalities of this armor does not exist. It doesn't exist. Obadiah tightly grabbed the collar of the person in charge with his right arm, pointing excitedly at the prototype of the arc reactor in front of them. He said, look, what you have in front of you is that technology. I only want you to shrink it a bit. Yes, sir, we wanted to do that, but unfortunately, it's simply not possible. At this moment, Obadiah, no longer pretending, and without his usual gentle demeanor, grabbed the collar of the person in charge, shouting angrily, Tony Stark could create it out of scraps in a cave. Sorry, but we are not Tony Stark. Has Mark not returned yet? After receiving Pepper's approval, Tony, who had spent the night at her house, returned disappointedly when he realized she didn't mean what he thought. After Pepper left, he drove leisurely back to his mansion in Malibu. J. A. R. V. I. S. Has Mark not come back all night? Dot. Not receiving a response from J. A. R. V. I. S., Tony became puzzled and asked again, J. A. R. V. I. S., strange, is it offline? Still not getting a response, Tony decided to check J. A. R. V. I. S. S. program. Just then, the phone at home rang, and seeing that it was a call from Pepper, he answered directly, Hello, Pepper, oh. Before he could finish his sentence, Tony felt as if his brain had lost connection with his body and uncontrollably collapsed onto the sofa. Take a deep breath, relax, relax, a familiar voice sounded behind him, with a gentle tone that emanated a chilling aura. You remember this thing, right? The one who ambushed Tony was Obadiah, who hurriedly arrived from the Sector 16. After confirming that his subordinates couldn't replicate the miniaturization of the arc reactor, he decided to carry out a crazy plan, to snatch it from its owner's hands. By using the same method he used to deal with the leader of the Ten Rings, which rendered Tony immobile, he triumphantly showed Tony the small gadget that helped him achieve everything. 
It's such a shame the government didn't approve its mass production. I still remember when six-year-old little Mark had this invention of his, how excited he was playing pranks on us. Short-term paralysis can be quite useful. He once painted my face with oil paint, and it took me half a day to wash it off. You know, Tony, when I issued the bounty to hunt you down, I was concerned about losing my golden goose. Temporarily paralyzed on the sofa, Tony widened his eyes in shock upon hearing these words, looking at the uncle he once respected. He saw Obadiah coldly and ruthlessly manipulating the tool in his hand, extending his claws towards the arc reactor on his chest. But luckily, you were spared, and you've given me this final golden egg. Without any mercy, Obadiah directly removed the arc reactor from Tony's chest and unplugged the wire supplying power to the electromagnet. Do you really think that if you come up with an idea, it automatically belongs to you? After obtaining what he wanted, Obadiah didn't leave immediately. Instead, he continued to mock Tony, your old man, he helped us create the atomic bomb. If he were as selfish as you, what would the world be like today? Take a look, this thing is perfect. It's your ninth symphony, Tony. It will be your relic, and the weapons powered by it as their energy core will set the world right again. I really wish you could see my armor prototype, it's not as conservative as yours. And involving Pepper was a terrible move on your part. Originally, my plan was to just eliminate you and Mark. You know, Mark is like a younger version of you. He's so talented that I couldn't risk giving him a chance for revenge. P.S. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is considered his greatest achievement in the symphonic field. Here, Obadiah is metaphorically referring to the miniaturization of the arc reactor as the greatest achievement of Tony's life. He has already decided that Tony will undoubtedly die today and will never achieve anything new in the future. Still not understanding the universal truth that villains die from talking too much, Obadiah, after delivering a long speech, left Tony's mansion with the coveted arc reactor. He didn't deliver the final blow that would kill Tony. After Obadiah left, Tony was still affected by the paralysis effect, and with the shards in his chest losing their electromagnetic attachment, his body had become very weak. Tony mustered up all his strength and tried to move his body slightly, but the effect was not significant. Calculating the time since he was ambushed by Obadiah, considering the duration of the paralysis effect, Tony decided to wait until he regained his mobility and then go to the garage to temporarily replace the old core that Pepper had brought. However, to Tony's surprise, before he could even begin this nearly impossible plan, a red figure descended from the sky. Master, what happened to you? Your condition is not good. I'm about to conduct a scan. Scan complete. Your cerebellum has been stimulated by ultrasound, causing temporary paralysis. The reactor in your chest is missing, and the remaining shards in your chest are no longer restrained. Your condition is very dangerous. Baymax will temporarily provide power to your electromagnet using its own energy source. The red figure was Baymax, who had successfully returned after assisting refugees in Gulmira. Baymax quickly removed the combat mode armor and restored its original form as a healthcare assistant. Ignoring its own condition, Baymax picked up a fruit knife from the table and made a small incision in its abdomen, taking out the miniaturized arc reactor that provided energy for itself. Baymax is about to switch to backup energy graphene batteries. Shutting down and restarting. Please wait for three seconds. After three seconds, the restarted Baymax disconnected the power interface of the miniaturized arc reactor and connected it to Tony's electromagnet. However, due to Baymax's reactor being smaller and having a different shape, it couldn't stably fit into Tony's chest. With this series of actions completed, Baymax's body completely lost its support of air and collapsed in front of Tony. Meanwhile, Tony, who obtained Baymax's reactor, felt slightly better, well enough to say a few words. Baymax, can you get in touch with Mark? Tell him to stay in the lab and not open the door for anyone, no matter who comes looking for him. Master, rest assured, I have already transmitted the message. And all of the young master's clothes have been updated according to the standards of the magic suit, with new chips added. He will have a way to escape from any danger. Tony blinked and temporarily set aside his concerns about Mark. How is Pepper doing? I have communicated with Miss Nini. With her by Pepper's side, nothing will happen to her. Since all the threats made by Obadiah had become ineffective, Tony turned his attention to himself. 
the miniaturized reactor that Baymax had given him was definitely unusable. It was too inconvenient for movement, so he had to replace it with the original reactor he made in Afghanistan, which was in the garage. But now that Baymax had lost its mobility, it couldn't be of any help. Tony had to rely on himself. He hadn't recovered to the point of being able to support his body yet. He could only move forward slowly, like a caterpillar, through the slow wriggling of his body. Slowly, he managed to squeeze into the elevator and arrived in the basement. Tony, who could only move on the ground, looked at the first-generation reactor placed on the workbench, high above. No matter how he tried, he couldn't reach it. Just as Tony was about to give up and wait for his body to regain mobility, the clumsy and awkward dummy, who had always been so, handed him the box containing the first-generation reactor. Good boy. It seems I'll have to learn to be nostalgic from today onwards. Tony's face brightened, and he forcefully smashed the reactor onto the ground, retrieving the reactor from it. While replacing his power core on one side, Tony couldn't help but recall a conversation he had with Mark in the past. With that thought, Tony chuckled. It seems Mark was right again. You will be my greatest creation, you little dunce. Tony. 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 Colonel Rohde, who rushed to Tony's house in response to Pepper's distress call, shouted Tony's name loudly. Seeing the living room turned into a mess with a collapsed Baymax on the floor confirmed the gravity of the situation. Sir, the old master has moved to the underground garage. Prompted by Baymax, Rhodey hurried down the stairs to the garage, where he found Tony Stark lying on the ground. Tony. Tony, are you okay? Rhodey quickly approached to assess the situation. I'm fine. Go protect Pepper. I've involved her in this mess. Tony, still weak, could only weakly grip Rhodey's arm and spoke earnestly. Don't worry, she's fine. Pepper is currently with five agents, preparing to arrest Obadiah. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Tony's expression instantly turned grim. Five people may not be enough. I hope Nini can hold on a little longer. Saying that, Tony, with Rhodey's support, forced himself to stand up. Pepper was in a precarious situation, and he had to step up. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Nearby, watching Tony change into the Mark III suit, Rhodey couldn't help but envy. Not bad, huh? It's time to get started. Tony finished suiting up, walked off the changing platform, and closed the helmet visor. Do you need any more help? Rhodey asked. Clear the skies for me. Tony said, and without even going through the garage passage, he burst through the hole in the ceiling that he had made during the Mark II experiment. That's awesome. Rhodey's eyes gleamed with admiration. On the other side, Mark, fully engrossed in developing the building control system in his new company's laboratory, was suddenly interrupted by the urgent alarm from his pocket. The alarm bell pulled Mark's attention away from his research. He took out his phone and saw the urgent situation alert on the screen, realizing that Obadiah had targeted his dad. Unknown to Tony, the gift Mark gave him not only provided a life-saving opportunity but also allowed Mark to detect any sudden situation Tony encountered and help him deal with the crisis. In this case, when Obadiah forcibly dismantled the arc reactor, cutting off its power as an electromagnet, it immediately recorded the occurrence of abnormal conditions and sent an alarm signal to Mark. Upon receiving the alarm, Mark hastily saved his unfinished work on the computer, preparing to rush back and help. However, he awkwardly realized that he didn't have a driver's license or a car at the moment, and even Baymax was not by his side, so he had no way to return home in time. Mark quickly picked up his phone and called Magneto, Magneto. Magneto. Quickly change to surveillance equipment and go check on my dad. As soon as Mark gave the command, the components in the dormant box in the room sprang into action. Two magnetic axles above Magneto's head detached, and the components inside the box, carrying a surveillance camera, were ejected and magnetically connected to Magneto's head. After assembly, the dormant box automatically opened. Magneto flipped out of the box and silently sneaked into the living room. Meanwhile, on Mark's phone screen, the clear footage appeared as Magneto arrived in the living room. The image showed Obadiah smugly leaving the mansion with the arc reactor, while Tony collapsed on the couch. Oh no! I shouldn't have used that thing to prank Obadiah back then. 
Seeing Tony's condition, Mark immediately recognized that it was the result of his own invention. I need to contact Uncle Rody immediately for help. Magneto's magnetic axle servo system can't handle heavy objects like the arc reactor. Just as Mark was about to make the call, Baymax appeared timely by Tony's side, relieving Mark's worries. Creating Baymax was indeed the smartest decision I made. But Obadiah, you old scoundrel, you're really bad. Since you refuse to behave, I'll send you flying comfortably. Mark closed the surveillance footage transmitted by Magneto and opened a pink interface. It displayed only a map and a red locator dot, indicating its position near Stark Industries. It seems Pepper is still going after Obadiah with Coulson. Fortunately, she didn't forget to bring Nini with her. Let's see how I deal with you, you old scoundrel. The interface Mark accessed was actually the location interface of Nini, the all-purpose personal assistant he gave to Pepper. And the reason for adding this positioning system to Nini was, of course, for transmitting special components. The battle suit I customized for Nini is much more thoughtful than Baymax's. Enjoy it, Obadiah. With that, Mark tapped the confirmation button on the phone screen. At the same time, a lawn outside the Stark mansion suddenly rose, revealing a deep and mysterious opening underneath. Boom! A sudden burst of flames illuminated the night sky as a black figure soared into the sky, leaving behind a long trail of fire. Its destination was Stark Industries. At Stark Industries, Pepper, under the protection of Coulson and four other S-H-I-E-L-D agents had infiltrated Sector 16 secretly established by Obadiah. After passing through a dark area and arriving at the center, a mighty suit of armor appeared before them. Looks like you were right, he made a suit, Coulson remarked. I thought it would be bigger. Pepper couldn't help but feel that the suit was different from what she saw in the copied data today. Unbeknownst to them, the suit before them was merely Mark I, the prototype that Obadiah used. The true ironmonger suddenly appeared behind them with a bang. Ah! Pepper shouted in fear at the massive size and menacing appearance of ironmonger. The pink suitcase in her hand received the signal and immediately began flashing lights. Nini was swiftly released. Nini senses that Master is in danger. Switching to Guardian mode. Take him down. Seeing the sudden attack by Iron Munger, the well-trained agents of S-H-I-E-L-D quickly drew their handguns and opened fire. However, these bullets hitting Iron Munger's steel armor were as ineffective as annoying flies, unable to inflict any damage on it. Before the few agents could analyze the next course of action, Iron Munger swept through and took care of all of them. Pepper, who was standing nearby, was stunned by the intense scene. Seeing Iron Munger's iron fist about to strike her, her vigilant companion Nini immediately scooped up her owner in a princess carry, activated the super movement mechanism, and the two swiftly escaped from the range of Iron Munger's attack. Restricted by its enormous size, Iron Munger couldn't maneuver flexibly in the narrow confines of Sector 16 and could only helplessly watch as Pepper was rescued. With Nini's help, Pepper escaped from the office building and immediately dialed Tony's number, wanting to report the situation to him. Luckily, her call was answered this time. Tony, are you alright? Obadiah has gone mad. He created a massive suit of armor. I know, Pepper. Stay calm and get out of there now. But Tony didn't wait for Pepper's response. The phone only transmitted a loud noise and Obadiah's stern voice, where do you think you can escape to? Damn it. Jarvis, how much longer can the arc reactor hold? Sir, there is 48% power remaining, and the level is decreasing. This arc reactor was not designed for prolonged flight. Remind me when. You are of no use anymore. Iron Munger, who had emerged from. The ground in Sector 16, stood in front of Pepper. He aimed the massive machine gun on his arm at her. However, before he could open fire, a burst of flame flashed by, followed by a black figure that collided directly with Iron Munger's arm, causing him to lose balance. The black figure dispersed upon colliding with Iron Munger and transformed into individual armor parts. Nini, who had been standing in front of Pepper, completed her fusion. Indeed, it was the contingency plan left by Mark that arrived just in time. It was Nini's combat form armor. The armor used the same graphene titanium composite material as Baymax, presenting a pink and white color scheme. Unlike Baymax's armor, 
which was only equipped with a flight module and lacked substantial offensive weapons, Nini's armor featured plasma blades, similar to the ones used by Gogo -Go Tamago in The Big Hero 6. Coupled with the martial arts skills programmed into Nini's combat chip, it could be said to be a great enhancement. Fully armed, Nini didn't prioritize dealing with the immediate threat but immediately carried her owner, Pepper, and activated her thrusters to fly away from the dangerous place. In bodyguard mode, Nini always prioritized her owner's safety, so unless it was impossible to escape safely, combat would not be Nini's first choice. As soon as Nini took Pepper away from the scene, Tony piloted Mark III and arrived in front of Iron Munger. Hit him in the chest with the energy blast. As soon as they met, Tony gave Obadiah a welcome gift, a direct hit from the chest-mounted energy cannon. Iron Munger was affected by this attack and took several steps back in succession. However, Iron Munger's design was different from Tony's Mark series that prioritized aesthetics and streamlined design. Its heavy outer armor and massive transmission structure gave it more formidable defense and attack power than the Mark series. Tony's full force blow didn't cause much damage to Iron Munger, instead, it aroused Obadiah's ferocity. After stabilizing himself, Iron Munger launched a counterattack against Tony. Obadiah controlled the suit, activating the boosters on its feet quickly closing the distance between him and Tony, followed by a powerful iron fist that struck Tony's chest armor. Bang! Mark III's strength couldn't withstand this powerful attack, and Tony was directly knocked to the ground. Iron Munger, already on a rampage, was not satisfied with this. He grabbed Tony, who was still recovering on the ground, and slammed him back down. For thirty years, I have supported you. I built this company from scratch, and nothing can stop me, especially not you. As he spoke, Iron Munger's rear weapons compartment opened, and a piercing round was fired directly at Tony. Boom! A massive fireball engulfed Tony in an instant, but fortunately, Mark III not only used a graphene titanium alloy as its main material but also had a layer of graphene film invented by Mark on its surface. This made the armor thin and lightweight while maximizing its defensive capabilities. Tony endured the impact of the explosion and took the opportunity to soar into the air, intending to gain the advantage of higher ground. To his surprise, he discovered that Iron Munger's heavy body was equipped with a flight device. Sir, it appears that the enemy's mech has flight capabilities. You're right, Jarvis. Take me to maximum altitude. Sir, you currently have only 15% power remaining. Flying to such heights will. Tony interrupted Jarvis' reminder. I can do the math. Do as I say. As Tony's armor continued to climb higher, Iron Munger tenaciously followed closely behind, ascending as well. When Tony's armor reached 7% power, Iron Munger finally caught up with him and grabbed him. Your idea was good, Tony. But my armor is more advanced than yours in every aspect. Is that so? Have you solved the high altitude icing problem for your armor? The icing problem? Obadiah was confused, but before he could react, Iron Munger's control system malfunctioned due to icing, completely losing power. Think about how to solve it. Tony struck Iron Munger's head with a punch, breaking free from its grasp. Meanwhile, the out of control Iron Munger accelerated due to gravity and plummeted towards the ground. But Tony's triumph didn't last long. Sir, power is down to two, activate the graphene battery as backup power. With the backup power activated, Mark III could no longer hover steadily in the air. It began a staged descent, but thanks to Jarvis' precise calculations, Tony had enough energy to land safely. Pepper. Tony, oh my god. Are you okay? I'm running out of power. As soon as I'm out of this thing, I'll come find you. Boom. Not a bad plan. But my luck is even better. Tony thought he had dealt with Iron Munger but it reappeared behind him. Iron Munger grabbed him tightly with both hands. Tony, what's happening to you? Pepper heard an unusual tone in the voice coming through the phone and anxiously asked. But Tony was now in the grip of Iron Munger and couldn't respond to her concern. Nini, hurry and help Tony. With no other options, Pepper could only request Nini's assistance. Understood, Master. Please stay here for now and don't leave. Nini will be back soon. Zoom. With a boost from the thrusters on her back, Nini headed straight for the position of Iron Munger and Tony. 
On the other side, Tony, who had finally freed himself from Iron Munger's control, concealed himself. Pepper, we can only overload the reactor in the exhibition hall and blow off the roof to deal with Obadiah and his armor. Tony, I already sent Nini to help you. It won't work. The little one couldn't possibly. Deal with. Obadiah. Tony, what's wrong with you? Why are you speaking so hesitantly? Pepper, thank you for your help. I take back what I said before. The violent factor deep down in Mark's core surprised me. The scene that made Tony stumble in his words was none other than Nini, who came to assist in the battle under Pepper's command. Nini wasn't crushed by Ironmonger as Tony had imagined, nor did she rely on agile movements to restrain Ironmonger's attacks. After descending from the sky, Nini shot out two plasma lightsabers with her arms. Before Ironmonger could react, she skillfully dismembered it. Looking at the lifeless Obadiah, Tony felt a chill running up his spine, making his whole body shudder. This kid Mark, why does it feel like the things he invents are becoming more and more dangerous? I really don't dare to provoke him in the future. The great battle came to an abrupt end. Even the villain boss, Obadiah, couldn't even set his own death flag. He met his end under Nini's swift and decisive attacks. I should have had Mark make me a personal assistant like this. Jarvis, contact Rhodey for me. Tony, how's it going over there? As soon as the call connected, Rhodey quickly inquired about the situation on Tony's end. There's a mess here that needs your help. I knew it wouldn't be anything good when you called me. I'll clean up the mess for you. How about lending me your armor for a day? Sorry, they're custom made. Give me some time, and I'll modify Mark II for you. Deal. In the familiar setting of a press conference, Colonel Rhodes, dressed in military uniform, was speaking on the podium. We have all received the official statement regarding the Stark Industries incident last night. Uncertain reports suggest that a prototype robot malfunctioned, causing severe damage to the buildings and roads surrounding Stark Industries. Fortunately, one of Tony Stark's private security personnel. Behind the scenes of the press conference, Pepper was applying makeup to Tony, concealing the scars left on his face from last night. While listening to Rhodey's live speech on TV, Tony absentmindedly looked at the newspaper. This name is pretty memorable and cool. Technically, it's not accurate, though, because my armor is made of titanium gold alloy and is coated with a graphene film. But anyway, this name is quite attractive. Hearing Tony's words, Mark rolled his eyes disdainfully. If I hadn't activated Nini's combat modules to save you, you would have blown up the arc reactor prototype that Grandpa left behind. And yet, you have the nerve to feel proud because of some newspaper headlines. Tony became irritated at Mark's exposure. I haven't even criticized you, you little punk. Lately, it's either some combat module or dominator. Why don't you ever discuss it with me? Humph, why would I need to discuss anything with you, an ignorant novice who doesn't even understand graphene? Mark began to use his advantage as a time traveler to retort at Tony. You little punk. It's thanks to me that your robot can use the miniaturized arc reactor. That was also invented by Grandpa, and you just lucked out. Both of you, please stop. Agent Coulson, who had just entered the room, intervened as it seemed like these two gentlemen were ready to fight to the death. He quickly halted their argument. Mr. Stark, this is your alibi. Coulson handed a piece of paper to Tony. You were on the yacht at the time. We have prepared customs documents. You were on Avalon Island all night, and there are testimonies from fifty guests. I thought it was just Pepper and me together, alone on that island. Pepper, who was focused on touching up Tony's makeup, pulled off the bandage on his face and gave him a warning with a touch of coquetry. What about me? I should also be on the island. Mark interjected, joining in for fun. Don't make trouble. What business does a child have at an adult's gathering? By the way, it doesn't mention Obadiah here, Coulson calmly responded, we have prepared the relevant documents. He was on vacation at the time, but unfortunately, the small plane he was on had an accident on the way. You know, those small planes are particularly prone to accidents. All you need to do is speak according to the official statement, Mr. Stark. That way, you'll be fine soon. You have 90 seconds to prepare. After finishing his words, Coulson turned and walked away. Wait, Agent Coulson. 
Pepper hurriedly called him from behind Coulson. I want to thank you for your help. This is our job. We will be in touch with you. Coulson responded with a smile. From the National Strategic. Just call us S. H. I. E. L. D. Our director has accepted the proposal from Mark Stark, the young man. Hey, don't call me a young man. I'm already 14. Mark shouted in protest. All right, Mark, go sit in the seats outside. We're about to go on stage. Tony patted Mark's buttocks, urging him to leave. Mark instantly understood and realized that Tony was creating a space for alone time with Pepper. He obediently left the room after Coulson, not wanting to be a third wheel. If I were Iron Man, my girlfriend would know my true identity. That would be tough for her. She would worry about me dying all the time but also feel proud of me. She would be in a constant dilemma, but it would make her even more fascinated by me. So. Pepper, do you ever think back to that night? Which night? You know. Are you referring to the night we danced, then went upstairs, and you went downstairs to get me a drink, but you left me alone there with Mark and left directly? Is that the night you're talking about? Tony intended to test the progress of his relationship with Pepper but ended up creating an extremely awkward atmosphere. He could only force an awkward smile and remain silent. I knew it. Is there anything else, Mr. Stark? No, nothing. It's fine, Miss Potts. Let's go out. I think I heard Rhodey calling my name. With a stiff smile, Tony quickly escaped from this awkward place, leaving Pepper looking at him fleeing and finally unable to pretend to be angry any longer, revealing a charming smile. Now let's invite Mr. Tony Stark to the stage to make a statement, but he won't answer any questions. Thank you. Colonel Rhodes finished his speech and walked to the side of the stage, making way for Tony to take the podium. Tony stood on the podium, looked at the audience and reporters below, then glanced at Pepper, Mark, and Rhodes on either side of the stage before speaking, it's been a while since I last saw all of you. I'll stick to the script this time. Some people speculate that I was involved in the incidents that happened on the freeway and rooftop. Just as Tony began reading from the script in his hand, the journalists in the audience were unwilling to let him off the hook so easily. Sorry, Mr. Stark, do you really expect us to believe that it was a bodyguard in armor who happened to appear, despite your bodyguards? I understand that the situation is confusing, and Happy's physique is a bit bulky. But I believe if he was willing to shed a few dozen pounds, he could also fit into the Iron Man armor. Questioning the official statement is one thing, but making wild accusations or insinuations that I'm a superhero is another matter. Tony's speech, which seemed to be a denial with no solid evidence, made the journalists in the room excited. They knew that big news was about to break. Mr. Stark, I never said you were a superhero. Is that so? Well, that's good. Tony started to blabber, feeling a bit embarrassed. Because that would be far-fetched and delusional. Clearly, I'm not cut out to be a hero. I have a bunch of character flaws, I've made numerous mistakes, and I've been very public about them. Stick to the script. Rhodey whispered through gritted teeth, reminding Tony as he began to ad-lib okay, okay, the fact is. Tony paused halfway and suddenly wore a mysterious smile. I am Iron Man. Tony openly admitted his identity as a superhero, causing a frenzy of camera flashes from the journalists in the audience. They didn't care how many rolls of film they used up or how much memory they consumed. Their fingers were pressing the camera shutter like they were having muscle spasms, capturing photos for tomorrow's front page headlines. Awesome, Dad. You're the first superhero to come out publicly since World War II. Mark rushed onto the stage after Tony finished speaking. All right, don't pour oil on the fire. Pepper took Mark aside. Didn't you see how angry Mr. Rhodes and Agent Coulson looked? Now all the preparations they made before are in vain, and they'll have to work overtime to clean up after your dad. Hee <laughs> hee. I just witnessed the birth of Iron Man, so I'm excited. Don't worry, I'll give him face in public, but I'll definitely scold him when we get home. He can't keep causing trouble for others like this. Ha ha ha. Seeing Mark's serious expression, Pepper couldn't help but laugh. It's already good enough that you don't cause trouble for others. Wanting to scold your dad on top of that? By the way, last time you asked me to buy Stark Industries stocks for you, I've already fully invested. Do you want to continue investing? 
No need. No need. Mark quickly shook his head. Now that Dad has revealed his identity as Iron Man, Stark Industries stocks will definitely skyrocket. I don't have that much money to invest in it. Besides, thanks to you, Pepper, I already obtained shares from the stock market and some small shareholders. Combined, it's enough. With these shares, I can help Dad secure over 50% of the voting rights, so he won't be overridden by the board of directors. And my company is about to start developing its business, so my funds will be invested there. How about it, Pepper? Do you want to leave Tony and come work at my company? I promise I won't make difficult demands like he does, and I won't throw tantrums. I'll double your current salary, and you'll receive a personalized limited edition of every future product my company launches. Thank you for thinking so highly of me, Mark. But I still can't leave your dad's side. He's a grown man now, but without me, I don't know how long he can hold on. But don't worry, your company's employees and managers were personally selected by me. In terms of work capability and character, they are top-notch, on par with or even surpassing me. Humph, I'm not concerned about their work capability. Worst case scenario, I can handle everything myself. There's no productivity that the power of technology can't replace. I just feel that it's unfair for you, sis, to stay by Tony's side and work there. Hmm. Suddenly, a brilliant idea popped into Mark's mind. Pepper, come closer. I have a secret to tell you. What is it? Pepper leaned in to listen. What if we play a prank on Tony? You pretend to resign and come work for me. Let him experience life without you by his side, so he can truly understand your importance. Well, that doesn't sound quite right. What if he actually approves? Pepper expressed her concern. That's impossible. Even I can see that you two like each other. If you don't give him a taste of bitterness, this playboy won't take the initiative to confess. And even if he does approve your resignation, it wouldn't be a big deal to slide over to my company. Mark reassured her. Ah, you're taking advantage of the situation. You're quite cunning. Mark's little scheme was exposed by Pepper, and she pretended to be angry. Well, since you're not rejecting it, I'll take it as you agreeing to my plan. Mark, inheriting Tony's thick-skinned nature, continued to probe. Pepper, not opposed to Mark's proposal, reluctantly nodded in agreement. On the stage, Tony, who was welcoming the media's interviews and photo shoots, had no idea what kind of trap his mischievous son had set for him. Why did it turn out this way, Mark? How did Pepper suddenly propose to resign? I thought our progress was going well recently. On the way home, Tony, still unaware that he had been tricked by Mark and Pepper, drove while constantly texting Mark, with a confused expression on his face. Mark suppressed his laughter and said seriously, Focus on driving, Dad. Pepper's resignation could be attributed to two reasons. First, she's unhappy with her work and finds her boss unbearable, so she decided to quit in a fit of anger, seeking liberation. That's impossible. Tony quickly interjected, I'm handsome, wealthy, and have an agreeable personality as a boss. How could anyone dislike me? Besides, I. Tony clearly wanted to come up with more reasons to refute Mark's viewpoint, but after pondering for a while, he couldn't think of any evidence that would prove he's a good boss. The atmosphere in the car suddenly fell silent. Mark didn't want to push Tony further into despair all at once. He didn't want this prank to end prematurely, so he reassured Tony, all right, all right, let's assume you're a good boss. Pepper didn't resign because of that. It's probably the second reason, she found a company that offers better salary and benefits, so she decided to switch jobs. But when I tried to persuade her to stay today, I told her I would give her a raise, but she still didn't agree to stay. Tony said with some frustration. In that case, I think it's very likely there's a special third reason. At this moment, Mark, who had been skillfully leading Tony into the trap, finally revealed the carefully prepared snare. There's another reason. Tell me, what is it? Tony, upon hearing this, stopped the car on the roadside and stared straight at Mark, seeking an answer. Well, isn't it because you want an office romance? You've been teasing her all along, without making any commitments or publicly acknowledging it. It makes her feel like your secret mistress. Isn't that tarnishing her reputation? And if she likes you and you like her, then that's one thing. 
But the problem now is that you haven't clearly expressed your intentions. The girl has lost her patience and doesn't want things to be awkward in the future at work, so she can only resign, right? Is that so? Tony's eyes lost focus as he murmured. That's exactly it, there's no mistake. Mark's plan succeeded, and he quickly offered a definitive answer. Then, what should I do next? I don't want Pepper to leave me. You have to help me, Mark. Tony completely fell into the trap set by Mark, oblivious to the fact that he was seeking advice from the mastermind behind it all. Of course, Mark wouldn't refuse Tony's request. Since Tony willingly walked into his role as a puppet, how could Mark let go of this opportunity? First of all, you need to give Pepper some time to think calmly. Tell her to take a few days off, rest well, and consider whether she really wants to resign. If she realizes it herself, then the next steps will be easier. In reality, this first step was to give Pepper and Mark time to discuss their plans, to figure out how to manipulate Tony next. Next, even though you've given Pepper a break and temporarily stabilized the situation, you can't take it lightly. At this point, you need to show her that you care, let her feel your inner affection. That's the key to changing her mind. This second step, Mark no longer had the intention of teasing Tony. After all, the purpose of his actions this time was to make Tony anxious and let him know that if he didn't seize the opportunity, a good match like Pepper would run away. So, they need to create opportunities for the two of them to spend time together and understand each other's feelings. This requires Tony to take the initiative. And then the final step. Mark paused at the crucial moment, not saying anything, wanting to create suspense. What is it? Tony cooperatively adopted a posture of seeking advice, blinking his watery eyes like an elementary school student in class. Seeing Tony's appearance, Mark, whose vanity was satisfied, continued, the final step is, of course, to express your feelings. As long as Pepper agrees to be your girlfriend, even if she really changes jobs, she won't be able to escape, right? Yes. Tony slapped his thigh suddenly, showing an enlightened expression. But soon his expression turned gloomy again, as if he had changed his mind, if I had the confidence and courage to confess, would things have turned out like this today? Hey! You coward, there's no hope for you. Mark truly didn't expect Tony Stark, a renowned playboy who had slept with countless beauties, to be so pathetic when faced with true love. It seems that I can only go with the flow. I hope things will develop like in a movie plot. Mark silently thought to himself. Because he was disgusted by Tony's cowardly behavior, Mark remained silent all the way, and Tony felt embarrassed to strike up a conversation with Mark. The two of them returned home without saying a word. Jarvis, good evening. As always, Mark greeted Jarvis when he returned home. Welcome home, sirs. Do you think you're the only superhero in the world, Mr. Stark? You have become part of a larger universe, you just don't know it yet. In the dim corner of the living room, a bald black man with an eye patch suddenly appeared in front of the Stark father and son. He seamlessly blended with the environment of the living room, to the extent that neither Tony nor Mark noticed his presence after returning home. Who are you? Seeing that this stranger could break through his set security system and intrude into his home, Tony immediately shielded Mark behind him and asked cautiously. I am. Boom. Before the intruder could finish speaking, he suddenly collapsed to the ground, leaving Tony, who had already tensed his nerves, stunned in place. It was the noise made by Mark rushing out from behind him that brought Tony back to his senses. But seeing Mark actively rushing over, preparing to tie up the person, Tony knew for sure that it was the work of this kid. Mark single-handedly helped the stranger onto a chair. He tied the person up with the strap and pressed a button on it. The strap automatically tightened, securely restraining the person. What's going on? Explain it. Tony stared at Mark, adopting a stance of honesty for leniency. Mark raised his hand and waved the watch on his wrist. Hee hee, this is an accessory I invented to go with the magical suit, the anesthesia watch. As he spoke, Mark pressed the B button on the watch, and with a click, the watch face popped open. It's used for aiming. I embedded a tranquilizer needle and an ejection device in the dial. It never misses within a range of 10 meters. This big guy here fell into a stupor after being hit by my tranquilizer needle. The belt is made of graphene material and has adjustable properties, capable of stretching and changing between zero. 
meters and 100 meters. Very convenient. Why do I feel like you're better prepared in terms of security than I am? Looking at his son covered in high-tech equipment from head to toe, Tony silently sympathized with the big guy who had broken into his home. If he had any malicious intentions, he definitely picked the wrong person. If the unconscious one-eyed bald man could know what Tony was thinking at this moment, he would definitely cry foul. He was just a regular guy, trying to put on a show and discuss an important matter, who would have thought he'd be slapped in the face right away. Dang, in a dazed state, Nick Fury felt a strong light shining on his face. However, relying on his years of experience as the King of Agents, he didn't immediately open his eyes to observe the surroundings. Instead, he continued pretending to be unconscious while secretly gathering information about his surroundings. Feeling the tight restraints on his body, Fury knew he was tied up. The ropes were sturdy, and he couldn't loosen them no matter how hard he tried. The scent of a cheeseburger filled the air, indicating that the person who tied him up was nearby, enjoying a meal. He could hear the sound of distant waves, suggesting that he was currently inside a building near the seaside. Why was he tied up like this? How could the director of the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, the King of Agents, fall into an enemy ambush? Oh, right. It seems like I infiltrated Tony Stark's villa in Malibu today, wanting to show off, no, discuss a major plan I've been plotting with him regarding Iron Man. But it seems like things have taken a different turn now. Thinking of this, Fury also guessed his current situation. He wasn't kidnapped by enemies but caught in one of Stark's traps, which rendered him unconscious. And his current location was inside Tony's villa. Knowing that he probably wasn't in danger, Fury decided to stop pretending and opened his eyes. After adjusting to the strong light from the desk lamp shining directly at him, Fury saw Tony Stark and his son sitting side by side in front of him. Tony held a cheeseburger in his right hand and a soda in his left, scrutinizing Fury while eating. Can you please move this lamp away? It feels like you're interrogating a prisoner. Fury made a somewhat speechless request. After all, he was the head of a spy agency. Is this how you treat him? But before Tony could say anything, Mark spoke first. He didn't buy into Nick Fury's act. This was a perfect opportunity to tease Fury, and if he revealed his identity as the director of S-H-I-E-L-D, Mark wouldn't have this chance anymore. Humph, audacious criminal, trespassing in someone's home and getting captured by us. Yet you dare to make unreasonable demands without flinching. I bet you're a repeat offender. But now that you're in the hands of this young master, no matter how daring you are, you'll obediently surrender. Baymax, switch to interrogation mode and make this criminal understand his mistakes. Received, master. Interrogation mode activated, target locked, repentance program initiated. Baymax, who had been waiting by Mark's command, appeared beside Fury. Without giving him any chance to speak, Baymax delivered a powerful electric shock. Yesterday, Baymax had damaged its polyethylene glycol fiber skin while trying to save Tony. Mark had replaced it with a more durable graphene composite material skin. Additionally, based on its enhanced conductivity, Mark added a repentance program, designed to save those lost lambs forced onto the path of crime. In reality, Mark just wanted to tease Nick Fury with a cruel sense of humor. As Fury, bound tightly to the chair, uttered a feeble, motherfew, he was already convulsing and twitching excitedly under Baymax's repentance program. Seeing Fury convulsing madly in the chair and the uncontrollable smile on Mark's face beside him, Tony suddenly felt a chill down his spine and shivered. All right, Mark. Although he doesn't seem like a good person, if he can sneak into our house silently, he must be someone extraordinary. Let's hear what he has to say first. What does it mean by not looking like a good person? Nick Fury wanted to curse out loud after hearing that. But considering his current situation and seeing Baymax still standing by his side, Fury decided to honestly reveal his identity, I'm Nick Fury, the director of S-H-I-E-L-D. I came here this time to talk about the Avengers. The Avengers? Tony didn't doubt the identity of the other person as the director of S-H-I-E-L-D, but he was very puzzled about the mention of the Avengers. On the other hand, Mark couldn't hide his excitement in his eyes. Because just now, Nick Fury said, talk about, instead of talking to Tony alone, which meant that his abilities were recognized by Fury and he wanted him to join the Avengers as well. 
you should know that joining the Avengers not only meant responsibility and danger, but also opportunities and challenges. Alien civilizations, infinity stones, everything mysterious and unknown in the Marvel Universe could be accessed and explored through the identity of an Avenger. For Mark, who thirsted for knowledge, this was an extremely joyful thing. Unfortunately, Tony, in his role as a guardian, refused to let him participate in this conversation on the grounds that Mark was still underage. The conversation between Tony and Nick didn't last long, as it wasn't suitable for in-depth discussion during their first meeting. Twenty minutes later, when the two came out of the study, Fury warmly approached Mark and tried to present a friendly attitude as much as possible. He said, Mr. Mark Stark, I cordially invite you to join the Weapons Development Division of S.H.I.E.L.D. as our special advisor. I'm very interested in the devices you used on me earlier and that electric inflatable robot. Mark was still a little puzzled. How could the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. suddenly be so polite to him? It turned out that he had taken a liking to the props and research capabilities he developed. However, Mark wouldn't make a losing deal like that. Working for someone else was impossible in this lifetime, especially when his own company had many talented people and he enjoyed being there. Director, if you are interested in the various small props I've developed, you can consider signing a procurement contract with my company, the Mark Research Center. I can provide exclusive supply to S.H.I.E.L.D., but working for you is out of the question. Even if you are a special department, employing child labor is illegal, you know. Well then, when I get back, I will inform Agent Coulson about this matter, and he will communicate the relevant details with you. Tony, think about what I said to you. I apologize for intruding today, I'll take my leave. Watching Nick Fury leave the villa, Mark approached Tony and curiously asked, What did you talk about? That's none of your business, it's not something a kid should be concerned about. Tony pushed away the prying Mark with a disgusted look on his face. Humph, if you don't want to say, then forget it. However, kids hold grudges, you know. I'll just give the order from S.H.I.E.L.D. to Hammer Industries for production. After all, someone from Stark Industries looks down on this kid, you little brat, how dare you. Los Angeles, Hollywood, Grand Theater. Today, a grand and solemn press conference will be held here. The first groundbreaking product jointly released by the Mark Research Center and Stark Industries will unveil its mystery here. In fact, the knowledgeable reporters already know what this upcoming product is, as Tony had previously showcased it during his return press conference. Although the main product of this press conference has lost its sense of mystery, it still attracts widespread attention from the public. Its association with the current popular Iron Man, Tony Stark, ensures that it will not lack traffic and attention. At the same time, the public is also curious about Mark, the genius illegitimate son and future heir of the Stark family. What kind of person is he? Does he inherit the high intelligence of his father and grandfather? The answer to this question will not only affect Mark's personal reputation but also impact the evaluation of the future value of Stark Industries by the financial tycoons on Wall Street. At this moment, the gossip-loving crowd, who eagerly watches this press conference, is unaware that Mark is about to drop a bombshell on them. At 7.30 p.m. New York time, the first product launch event of the Mark Research Center officially begins. Tony and Pepper, wearing custom-made formal attire, sit in the audience seats, observing Mark's imminent performance. There is no host to set the atmosphere, nor are there performing guests singing and dancing. Mark, dressed casually in a suit, walks onto the stage from the side and stands under the spotlight. Ladies and gentlemen present at the venue, watching through the internet or in front of the television, good evening. Today is my first time speaking in front of so many people, and I don't possess the eloquent speaking skills of my father. So let's get straight to the point. After Mark finishes speaking, the lighting technician instantly turns off all the lights in the venue and then shines two spotlights, one on Mark and the other on a red suitcase. Ladies and gentlemen, the product I am going to show you today is inside this red suitcase, about the size of a handbag. Mark's words draw everyone's attention to the red suitcase on the stage. Before this, I believe some of you have already seen its true form and even experienced the convenience it brings. But today, I will formally introduce my invention to you and demonstrate its tremendous capabilities in detail. Baymax, it's your turn to take the stage. Ding! Upon receiving Mark's command, the circular light strip in the center of the suitcase lights up, and the lid of the suitcase automatically opens. 
With a hiss and a brief sound of inflation, a cute and chubby inflatable robot, white and soft, appears before everyone's eyes. Hello, I am your personal health assistant, Baymax. How can I assist you? Before this press conference, Mark specifically disabled the other modules of Baymax and retained only the original medical chip module. At this moment, all the female viewers who are paying attention to this product launch instantly fall for Baymax's adorable and cute appearance. So cute. It's chubby. I really want to hug it. This is the shared sentiment among countless female viewers at this moment. However, for the male viewers, Baymax's appearance alone cannot win them over. The next step requires Mark to take the stage and introduce the powerful functions of Baymax as a personal health assistant. You have all seen Baymax's appearance. When designing it, I considered the need for a friendly and comforting image. Therefore, I adopted a convenient inflatable design for easy storage, as well as a round and cute appearance. But for any successful product, having a good-looking appearance is certainly not enough. Next, I will provide a detailed introduction and demonstration of the powerful capabilities that Baymax possesses as a personal health assistant. Baymax is implanted with the most advanced medical chip, which contains over 10,000 medical measures to address the majority of diseases one may encounter in daily life. Its eye position is equipped with a holographic scanner that can perform harmless scans of the human body, accurately diagnosing all diseases currently known in the field of human medicine. In addition, Baymax's diagnostic program also includes procedures for psychological disorders. For patients with psychological illnesses who are unable to confide their hidden thoughts to a human doctor, Baymax can serve as a more suitable listener. With Baymax, you will have a companion that can safeguard your physical and mental health anytime and anywhere. It can eliminate diseases at their earliest signs, greatly reducing the possibility of mild conditions developing into severe ones. As Mark's speech reaches this point, the audience, both present and remote, regardless of gender, have their eyes brightened. This is especially true for those capital magnates and elites who have already resolved their basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, and transportation. What could be more attractive to them than a healthy body and a longer lifespan? Surely everyone has seen or heard about people who appear energetic and physically healthy in their daily lives, only to discover they have contracted a terminal illness during a hospital examination. For many diseases, the human body cannot perceive any changes until they have developed into true terminal conditions. By the time we experience discomfort, it is often too late. However, going to the hospital for a full-body checkup every year is time-consuming and expensive. But with Baymax, all these troubles can be cast aside. It possesses an all-seeing eye and can identify any minor hidden risks in your body. Mr. Mark, are the capabilities of this inflatable robot really as powerful as you say? Can you demonstrate its functions for us on the spot? A journalist in the audience challenged Mark with these questions. However, for Mark, this was not a problem at all. The live demonstration was already part of his plan, and now that someone had provided him with an opportunity, he smoothly seized it. No problem, sir. Now, please watch a video explaining Baymax's diagnostic capabilities. In the meantime, our staff will invite a few volunteers who want to experience Baymax's abilities to wait by the stage. Soon, the promotional video concluded, and at this point, all the audience had gained a general understanding of the inquiry process of the healthcare assistant, Baymax. This made them even more excited for the upcoming live demonstration. Does this personal healthcare assistant, Baymax, truly possess the miraculous capabilities showcased in the video? With this question in mind, all eyes were focused on Mark and Baymax on the stage. Alright, the video is finished, and the on-site staff have invited four volunteers, two men and two women, to join us for the live demonstration. Now let's give a round of applause to welcome these four volunteers to the stage and be the first to experience Baymax's services. Quickly, guided by the staff, the four volunteers stepped onto the stage and gathered at the center. Welcome to the four of you, and thank you for participating. Now, following the order of appearance, let's have the blonde lady begin. Please introduce yourself to the audience. I'm called Kristen, and I'm a journalist. Great. Now, please stand naturally and wait for a moment. The results will be revealed soon. Baymax, come here and perform a full-body scan on this beautiful lady. Understood. Madam, I will scan your body. Scan initiated, scan complete. 
Madam, your body is in a subhealthy state. You have chronic specific inflammation in the shoulder joint capsule and surrounding connective tissues. Wearing high heels for an extended period has caused your big toe to deviate outward at the first metatarsophalangeal joint. Irregular eating habits have led to gastric ulcers, and irregular rest has resulted in gynecological inflammation. Baymax suggests that you improve your lifestyle habits, maintain a healthy and regular diet, get adequate rest, and consider using anti-inflammatory medication and physical therapy. This will help you recover your physical health as soon as possible. Baymax proceeded to diagnose and provide treatment recommendations for the remaining volunteers, leaving the audience in awe and generating continuous applause. Mark appeared on stage again, raising his hands and pressing down, signaling for everyone to calm down a bit. Thank you all for the enthusiastic encouragement. I believe the live demonstration just now has showcased the role of Baymax as a personal healthcare assistant comprehensively. However, some may still question whether these volunteers were randomly selected to come on stage and whether the diagnosis results of Baymax are accurate. In response, first, I assure you in the name of Stark that all the demonstration processes today were not prearranged. I believe the credibility of the Stark family name should still hold some weight. Secondly, these four volunteers will receive a free full-body examination opportunity at the medical center, and the examination process will be supervised by a notary public. The results of the examination made by Baymax will be announced on the official website of the notary public. Now, let's move on to the most concerning question for everyone. How much will this personal healthcare assistant cost? First, we have the consumer version targeted at the general audience, Intelligent Diagnosis 1. This model of the personal healthcare assistant only retains the intelligent diagnosis function. It uses a higher cost-effective hyperspectral lens, does not come with an inflatable robot appearance, and lacks treatment functions. As Mark introduced, the large screen also displayed the consumer version of the intelligent diagnosis one, resembling a home projector with a simple design. After removing all additional features and exterior design, its price was truly appealing. The retail price was only $8, 999. Considering even the middle class who purchased expensive commercial health insurance, this price was only equivalent to the cost of three full-body examinations at a formal hospital. Coupled with the American people's preference for credit card usage, $8,999 could be considered a price almost anyone with a job could afford, after all, health is priceless. The various versions that followed caused waves of cheers and applause on site, bringing immense surprise to the audience. The Robot Home Edition was priced at $26,999, the Robot Custom Edition at $46,999, the Medical Institution Professional Edition at $269,999, the Military Edition at $369,999, and Personalized Interchangeable Skins at $199 each. Although the prices announced by Mark were shocking and seemed like a loss-making business, in reality, even with these prices, his company would generate over 100% gross profit. Following the concept of using salaries to create happiness, Mark not only made precise differentiations in the product itself but also implemented a strict fee-based charging model for services. In other words, any service you can think of comes with a price tag. This ensured a continuous stream of revenue for Mark's company from the sales of the personal healthcare assistants. However, at this moment, all the people paying attention to this product were caught off guard by Mark's price tactics. They had no awareness of the trap they were about to fall into. Only Tony, sitting in the audience, could see through Mark's seemingly sunny and handsome smile and recognize the true nature of this guy as a cunning businessman. The Mark Research Center will collaborate closely with Stark Industries. All the products will be manufactured and strictly controlled for quality by Stark Industries, guaranteeing that every customer receives flawless and top-notch products. We will also provide the highest quality return, exchange, and after-sales service to all consumers. Today's product launch event comes to an end, and I hope to see all of you at the next Mark Research Center product launch event. Thank you. Mark bowed and took his leave. The lights slowly brightened, and the audience enthusiastically applauded, indicating that Mark's debut today was highly successful, establishing the reputation of the Mark Research Center. Anyone with a bit of business acumen and social experience could analyze that the Mark Research Center was about to become a unicorn enterprise in the medical robotics industry. 
With the passage of time and the support of Stark Group behind Mark, its future would undoubtedly make it a technology giant with influence and value comparable to Stark Industries. This was something they firmly believed in. Backstage, just as Mark was preparing to meet with Tony and Pepper, he received a message from his secretary, boss, Mr. Carlson from SHIELD is waiting for you in the dressing room. He wants to confirm the order details and sign the purchase contract with you. Oh. It seems like my product launch event was a great success today. They can't hold back anymore. Well then, I won't hesitate to make a bold request. He he he. Mark, your performance at the previous press conference was excellent. As soon as Mark entered the room, Carlson, who had been waiting in the dressing room, stood up from his seat to greet him. Mark had a clear understanding of the purpose of Carlson's visit and remained calm. After a polite handshake, he went straight to the point, thank you for your praise, Agent Carlson. We have met several times before, and we have already reached a preliminary agreement for collaboration. The only thing left is to finalize the pricing. So let's skip the formalities and get straight to the matter. Seeing Mark being direct, Carlson didn't beat around the bush either. He also wanted to complete the task quickly and report to his own director. Mark, let's start discussing the details item by item, beginning with the foundational material, graphene, which can be considered a versatile material. Our SHIELD Research Center has provided an evaluation report on the graphene you discovered. The report shows its unimaginable value in military applications. The Mark Research Center is currently the only company in the world with mature and cost-effective large-scale graphene extraction technology. Considering the practicality of graphene in various fields such as military, medical, and energy, SHIELD is willing to accept your proposed price of $8 million per ton. However, the condition is to sign a priority supply agreement. When multiple parties place orders with the Mark Research Center simultaneously, our agency's order requirements should be prioritized. On this matter, my bottom line is to prioritize fulfilling 70% of SHIELDS needs, while the remaining 30% will be prioritized for supply after the supply demand balance is restored, Mark replied. He didn't immediately accept the condition despite SHIELD agreeing to his price. Considering the future needs of his own company, Stark Industries, if he agreed to this condition, Stark Industries would be at a disadvantage during times of tight supply and urgent need for graphene. Okay, I'll include that in the contract, Carlson nodded and made the necessary modifications to the contract on his laptop. It seemed they also took into account that Mark would want some leeway for his own industry, and the 70% share didn't exceed their expected bottom line. The second item is the artifact suit you previously showcased to us, including the incredible suit that grants extraordinary abilities to an ordinary person, the tracking glasses that display maps and work in conjunction with trackers and bugs, the voice-changing tie that allows for versatile vocal modulation, the agent badge for constant communication, the non-lethal portable weapon, the tranquilizer dart watch, the versatile and expandable utility belt, and the enhanced footwear that boosts. Agent Agility these equipment items can indeed provide significant assistance to our SHIELD agents in their work while reducing the risk of casualties. However, the price of $800,000 per set makes it impossible for us to equip every agent with this gear. Therefore, I hope your company can make a slight concession on the price of the artifact suit. After all, it concerns the life safety of an agent responsible for maintaining social stability, and SHIELD's annual budget is limited. Upon hearing Carlson's request, Mark hesitated and felt conflicted. His hesitation was not due to the decrease in profit resulting from lowering the price. After all, he was well aware of the true cost of the artifact suit. Even if he gave SHIELD a 90% discount, he would still make a profit. The issue was that the agents in SHIELD were not only the heroes who maintained social stability, but also soldiers of HYDR lurking in the shadows and constantly plotting to subvert the world. Although Mark was confident that his encryption technology could prevent Hydra from infiltrating, he was reluctant to give them such a huge advantage behind the backs of the real heroes. As Mark frowned and contemplated in front of him, Coulson began to feel nervous. Could it be that the cost of the artifact suit was really high, leading Mark to consider it so seriously? Unaware of the truth, Coulson could only endure the agony of waiting while maintaining a patient appearance. 
Suddenly, Mark slapped his forehead and a cunning smile appeared on his face, indicating that he had come up with a brilliant idea. Coulson, I think you make a good point. We can't let the heroes shed blood and tears. Regarding the price, I can offer you a 50% discount. Moreover, the procurement can be split according to your needs, and it doesn't have to be a complete set. Additionally, I can provide each S-H-I-E-L-D agent with a free agent badge modeled after the S-H-I-E-L-D logo. Mr. Stark, you're truly noble. I admire you. Coulson expressed his gratitude and even knelt on one knee, saluting Mark with clasped fists. However, the scene Mark had imagined didn't actually happen. Coulson just nodded excitedly and quickly began typing on the keyboard, adding the conditions given by Mark to the contract, as if afraid that Mark would change his mind if things were delayed. Huh, you folks really don't know about formalities, Mark silently complained in his mind, without showing any self-awareness. Well, Mark, now we have only one item left on the list, the military-grade health assistant. It can handle various injuries, perform complex surgeries, adapt to all terrains, and has offensive capabilities. To be honest, this series has captivated not only us but also the military, CIA, and FBI. They have urgently requested special funds to purchase this product. So, if you can guarantee the priority completion of S, H, I, E, L, D, S order, we can agree to a price of $18. Million. Deal. This time, Mark didn't refuse the request. After all, the inflatable robot was not like graphene, a basic material. Moreover, the other party had already made concessions in terms of price, so there was no reason to continue haggling in this regard. With the terms settled, Coulson immediately took out a portable briefcase printer and printed three copies of the prepared contract. One copy would be kept by Mark's company, one by S. H. I. E. L. D., and the final copy would be submitted to the World Security Council, the superior organization of S. H. I. E. L. D. Mark quickly scanned through the contract and had his secretary fax it to the company's legal department for verification. Once it was confirmed that there were no issues, he signed the contract. Satisfied, Coulson put away the contract. I'll take the contract back to the director for confirmation and signature, and then I'll return your copy. No problem, Mark agreed. Now that everything is settled, I'll take my leave. Tony is still waiting for me. As Mark stood up to leave, Coulson quickly called out, wait, besides finalizing this procurement contract, there's another task the director assigned me to complete today. Task? Mark turned his head towards the person, surprised, and halted his movement to leave. That's right. S. H. I. E. L. D. is currently engaged in a massive secret operation that requires strong scientific research support. However, our internal scientists have encountered some bottlenecks in this project that are difficult to overcome. Previously, Director Fury communicated with Tony, and Tony agreed to provide technical support to solve our energy issues. But now, we are facing some difficulties with the power system. Security experts have raised concerns about the safety and reliability of our scientific team's design for the quad turbine engine. However, our scientists are unable to come up with new feasible solutions. When Director Fury sought Tony Stark's help again, Tony recommended you to the director to solve this problem. He highly praised your invention of the magnetic axis servo system and the super braking engine. He believes that you can provide the most suitable solution based on these two technologies. So, before I came here today, Director Fury instructed me to inform you about this matter and ask for your opinion. If you agree to help us complete the development of the power system for this project, the Director will utilize his authority and provide access to a portion of the technical data accumulated by S. H. I. E. L. D. over the years as compensation. To think of using knowledge to bribe me. Tony must have advised you on this. But I have to admit, this move is quite effective. I'll take on this mission. Send the required parameters to my company's server, and I will design a solution accordingly. By the way, also send over a technology inventory from your technical library. I'd like to select some technologies that interest me. Stark Innovation Park, Mark's Research Center, Top Floor Laboratory. Mark was busy modifying the engine design draft for S. H. I. E. L. D. Since obtaining this laboratory, Mark preferred coming here to unleash his creativity compared to the crude experimental conditions in his own room. During the previous press conference, Coulson approached him and asked for help in designing a power system for a secret project. 
Mark knew that this so-called secret project was actually the development of the helicarrier, and now he was designing the engine for that magnificent behemoth. In the original timeline, the safety issues Coulson mentioned earlier were likely unresolved. The helicarrier nearly crashed in the Pacific due to a turbine engine failure caused by an enemy assault. Although achieving such a critical situation would require the failure of at least two out of the four engines, it was still a significant risk to the safety of all personnel on board. Mark wondered how Nick Fury managed to convince the security experts to proceed with the construction of the airborne mothership according to the original plan. However, now that S-H-I-E-L-D had entrusted him with this task, Mark couldn't simply complete it with a half-hearted effort. For these past few days, he had locked himself in the laboratory, optimizing his design prototypes. Apart from eating and using the restroom, he didn't leave the workbench at all. He didn't even return to his home in Malibu. This suited Tony's intentions as well. Ever since Pepper and Mark set a trap for Tony during their last collaboration, with Mark secretly pushing things along, their relationship had progressed rapidly. It was currently a period of ambiguity, and Tony didn't want Mark, the third wheel, to go home so that he could have some alone time with Pepper. The current modification Mark was working on involved utilizing the magnetic axis servo system as the engine's transmission system and the super braking engine as the power engine. By connecting hundreds or even thousands of super braking engines in series through the magnetic axis, he aimed to create a highly fault tolerant super engine as the power system for the helicarrier. The benefits of this design lie in the even distribution of power, which ensures smooth and stable acceleration and braking processes while providing ample power. During steady cruising, the excess engines can be shut down to save energy for the spacecraft. Additionally, the distributed design ensures that even if a hundred engines are damaged, the spaceship can still safely land. Mark was satisfied with his design. He believed that even if Tony developed anti-gravity engines in the future, his system would be compatible, allowing for a smooth and cost-effective upgrade of the airborne mothership, saving both funds and time. The only remaining challenge now was the control system for this super engine. Proper coordination of hundreds or even thousands of engines was necessary to accomplish actions such as acceleration, deceleration, steering, and hovering. The design difficulty and workload of the entire control system were beyond imagination. However, in the face of such a daunting task, Mark, after overturning one failed idea after another, was gradually completing it single-handedly. Mark installed an intelligent chip on each power engine, forming the entire engine system into a neural network. He added an intelligent core to oversee the entire control system, allowing the spaceship's operators to effortlessly control its movements. So, one week after receiving the task from S-H-I-E-L-D, when Mark called Coulson and informed him to come and receive the design results, even the experienced Coulson was astonished by Mark's efficiency. You. You solved the problem that has been troubling S-H-I-E-L-D scientists for months in just one week. I've completed the design, but whether it meets your expectations is up to you, Mark shrugged, acting as if it was not a big deal. By the way, when will S-H-I-E-L-D fulfill its promise? I'm getting a bit impatient. Don't worry. Once S-H-I-E-L-D gives its word, it won't go back on it. If you're still unsure, you can consult Tony. If he agrees, you can come with me to S-H-I-E-L-D headquarters now. That way, if there are any questions about the power system's design, we can consult you at any time. Oh, the headquarters of the covert division? Great, I want to go there now. Mark exclaimed. Baymax, Mark's intelligent wristwatch lit up, upgraded to an intelligent assistant and connected to the server, as Baymax responded. Inform my dad that I'm going to have some fun at their headquarters with Coulson. I won't be coming home tonight. Let him enjoy some quality time with Pepper. Understood. Message sent. Master, the old director replied, go, don't come back halfway and disturb us. Dot. Washington D.C., along the banks of the Potomac River, a white curved building spans across the river. Surrounding it are the famous Capitol Hill, Washington National Square, Washington Monument, and Lincoln Memorial. It's hard to imagine that the headquarters of a secret organization would be located in such a popular tourist spot, with such an extravagant and eye-catching design, exposing itself to everyone's sight. However, the remarkable thing is that despite its attention-grabbing appearance, if you were to ask the local people what companies are inside the building and what kind of work the people inside are engaged in, no one could give an accurate answer. 
The flamboyant exterior design attracts all the attention to the point that everyone completely ignores what secrets might be hidden inside. S. H. I. E. L. D. S. approach truly exemplifies the saying, hiding in plain sight. Mark, who was visiting the Triskelion for the first time, looked around curiously after entering. After all, in his previous life, he had only seen parts of the building in movies and TV shows. Now, these scenes were truly unfolding before his eyes, and Mark was very excited. Mark, remember to stay close to me. There are many classified and important areas within the headquarters that require authorization to access. If you accidentally intrude, other agents might treat you as an invader. Pay attention to this point, understand? Coulson, who was leading the way, turned back and instructed Mark. Don't worry, Mark reassured, patting his chest. Coulson nodded in satisfaction, but he didn't notice that after Mark finished speaking, he muttered softly, Anyway, your access control system. Can't stop me. From the moment Mark entered the Triskelion, he had secretly ordered his intelligent assistant, Baymax, through the smartwatch, to infiltrate the entire internal system through the building's Wi-Fi, ensuring that there would be no exposure. He initially thought it would take some effort to penetrate such a sensitive department, but he didn't expect that various hidden backdoors were left in S-H-I-E-L-D-S systems, allowing Baymax to easily enter and exit the S-H-I-E-L-D servers. It was even easier than entering his own backyard. It seems that Hydra left these backdoors to collect and transmit data from within S-H-I-E-L-D. I've lucked out. But unfortunately, important information is either stored in physical documents or on Nick Fury's personal servers, not connected to the network. It looks like I'll have to ask for what I want face to face, Mark thought to himself. Following Coulson and watching him use his ID card to pass through a series of authentication doors, the two finally arrived at the office of S. H. I. E. L. D. S. Director, Nick Fury. Good to see you again, Mark. I heard from Agent Coulson that you completed the design of the power system in just one week. It seems Tony's praise of your talent that it's comparable to his, is not unfounded, Fury said, seeing Mark at the door standing up from behind his desk and welcoming him. Humph. Mark rolled his eyes upon hearing these words. What talent. He's just flattering himself. How could he possibly be as intelligent as me? Don't tarnish my good name based on his words. Um, well. I don't really understand these technological matters, so I'll leave it to you and the research team to discuss. Let's talk about your compensation now, Fury smoothly changed the topic without any hint of embarrassment. I've already had someone send you a catalog of technical documents that can be made available to you. Except for dangerous technologies with offensive capabilities, it includes the majority of the technical data accumulated by S. H. I. E. L. D. since its establishment. Have you considered which ones you'd like to choose? Well, I've already made up my mind. I initially thought that a big organization like S-H-I-E-L-D would easily satisfy my thirst for knowledge by revealing some secrets. But it turns out that most of the list you sent me consists of outdated and mundane technologies. If you don't have anything hidden, then I think it's necessary for your organization to establish a long-term technical support partnership with my company. From the list you sent, there are only two things that caught my interest the Super Soldier Serum that created the first publicly known superhero, Captain Steve Rogers, and Dr. Hank Pym's Pym Particles. Just show me these two. Are you sure? Fury confirmed with Mark. You should know that both of these technology files are incomplete and missing crucial content either due to accidental loss or deliberate concealment by their inventors. Our S-H-I-E-L-D researchers have been trying for years to reconstruct them from the remnants of these materials, but no one has succeeded. We even accidentally created an ill-tempered monster in the process. Are you still determined to choose these options? It's only those two. Don't worry, I won't come back later and ask for additional compensation. Even if I find them to be inadequate compared to the effort I've put in, a deal is a deal. I understand the principles of voluntariness, equality, fairness, honesty, and trust, Mark shrugged at Nick Fury, indicating that he didn't mind these factors. All right then, since you're determined, Coulson will take you to the database later to access these two documents. The documents can only be read within the confines of the database. If you haven't finished reading them, you can come back tomorrow. However, you can't take the documents out or disclose the contents you've seen. Understood? No problem. It won't take much time. 
I have photographic memory. Two technical files won't be a challenge for me. Very well, Agent Coulson, you take Mark to collect his compensation and also deliver the power system he designed to the R&D department for feasibility analysis and verification. Understood, sir. After Coulson led Mark out of the office, Fury watched their departure with a meaningful expression and said, it's not in vain that I made careful arrangements. You've indeed chosen these two technologies, and only they can provide you with a challenge. Howard Stark's grandson, I wonder if you can reproduce these two technologies. I'm eagerly waiting to see. While Mark was immersed in technical data in the information room of the Triskelion building, the outside world was exploding with excitement over the private health assistant released by the Mark Research Center. After the product launch, Mark had been secluded, studying the power system required by S-H-I-E-L-D. After emerging from seclusion, he went straight to S-H-I-E-L-D headquarters to continue his seclusion. Mark was not aware of the company's operations, or rather, when he decided to delegate all matters other than research to his subordinates, these matters were no longer his concern. However, as viewers watched the video of the conference and media reporters continued follow up on the volunteer physical examination events, private health assistance related terms exploded in popularity on television, newspapers, and the internet. Mark's marketing department invited various celebrities and public figures to post requests for the private health assistant on their social networks, mentioning the Mark Research Center's tweet. This greatly boosted the popularity of the matter. The power of fandom is undoubtedly strong, and the private health assistant itself is of excellent quality. As a result, the publicity effect exceeded expectations. People were amazed by the powerful diagnostic and therapeutic abilities of the robots developed by Mark, and they were also attracted to the various stylish and cute designs of the robots. In this era of information explosion, the spreading speed of this hot topic would undoubtedly be faster than ever before. In people's daily discussions, there was always one topic, and that was the private health assistant released by the Mark Research Center. Where can you buy it? How much does it cost? Can you get more styles of interchangeable skins? No matter what the question is, the central focus is around Baymax. Even shrewd fashion brands and luxury goods manufacturers came seeking collaborations, wanting to launch co-branded skins or obtain image development rights, and engage in commercial development of peripheral products and even cultural products. And today, the first batch of private health assistant products is about to go on sale. Offline, Mark stores named Mark Home have sprouted up like mushrooms in various commercial districts of major cities, drawing crowds of citizens who eagerly line up in front of the stores, all hoping to purchase their favorite health assistant as soon as possible. At the same time, there are also scalpers mixed in, with the intention of profiting from this hot trend. Online, Mark's company team was well prepared, launching a carefully designed company website where netizens could compare the differences in parameters and prices between various robot models and make reservations for purchase online. However, even though they had rented server clusters from Stark Industries in advance, the website of the Mark Research Center almost crashed due to the massive influx of traffic. Fortunately, Mark had connected Baymax's program to the company's servers, allowing for load balancing and traffic control, ultimately stabilizing the situation. Tony, the data I collected today from the opening at 9 a.m. until the closing at 5 p.m., the total revenue of Mark Holmes' offline stores is $390. Million. In addition, the online sales reached a total of $230 million. Today, the single-day revenue of the Mark Research Center exceeded $600 million. And this is just the income from the European and North American markets. If the Mark Research Center's products enter Asia, Africa, and South America in the future, this data will increase significantly. In the Stark Mansion in Malibu, Pepper was reporting to Tony about the revenue situation of the Mark Research Center that she had collected today. After hearing Pepper's report, Tony, who had initially appeared indifferent, was also dumbfounded. Tony had taken over Stark Industries since he was 21 years old and was adept at interpreting a company's performance. He was well aware that based on the revenue data from the Mark Research Center today, even if it would eventually decline due to decreasing popularity, the valuation of the Mark Research Center would start at least in the trillions of dollars. In other words, if this company, which he helped establish less than a month ago, were to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange now, its stock price would be more than double that of Stark Industries during its peak. Mark's personal net worth would surpass his own and make him the richest person on the Forbes billionaire list. Wow! 
Mark is truly terrifying. At this rate, will my own son surpass me so quickly? If Mark is willing to give up the sole ownership of his company and make it public, then it's indeed possible. But I don't think Mark will let his company go public. Firstly, he has you behind him, and Stark Industries is there to support him. Even without going public, it would hardly have any impact on its funding and business operations. Moreover, Mark doesn't like to consult with others to make decisions. Once he has made up his mind, it's difficult to change it. So he won't allow multiple directors who can influence his decision-making power to exist in the company. Furthermore, Tony, you've overlooked one thing. Although Stark Industries' new energy business hasn't fully launched yet, the private health assistant contract manufacturing service provided by the Mark Research Center has already restored the company's stock price and revenue to the levels before the weapon department was closed. And the momentum is still strong. Your personal assets are also constantly increasing. Your words do make me feel better. By the way, you mentioned a new shareholder joining the company a few days ago. This person bought heavily when Stark Industries stock price plummeted and now owns enough shares to enter the board of directors. Have you contacted him? Although I've taken over Obadiah's shares, essentially gaining control over the company, if this new shareholder has some ulterior motives, it could still cause some trouble. You don't need to worry about that. The new director who bought those shares is Mark. He saw how you were previously restricted by other shareholders on the board because your shares didn't exceed 50%, so he used his personal funds to acquire scattered shares in the stock market. Mark has entrusted me with the authority to represent him fully in terms of these shares and voting rights, so you can rest assured. Mark has become a director of Stark Industries. Suddenly, Tony felt that the world was changing too fast, and he couldn't keep up with it. In the data room of the Triskelion, S. H. I. E. L. D. headquarters, Mark was holding a technical dossier and reading its contents with great interest. The document in his hands was about the Super Soldier Serum, and many crucial technical details and theoretical descriptions were missing. The remaining content consisted mostly of speculations and recorded questions proposed by Dr. Abraham Erskine during the development process. There was also a portion that included some memoirs and speculations written by his grandfather, Howard Stark, who worked on it after the establishment of S.H.I.E.L.D. Among these seemingly disorganized materials and formulas, Mark even saw fragments of information in the hidden books left by Howard, which indirectly proved that Howard had attempted to reconstruct the technical data on the Super Soldier Serum for S.H.I.E.L.D., but ultimately failed. Despite the seemingly chaotic nature of the information and formulas, Mark found it intriguing. After reading through all of it, he didn't proceed to open the technical dossier on PIM particles but took out a stack of calculation papers and began deduction and calculation. Mark first sorted the contents of the dossier according to the chronological order of Dr. Erskine's research process and then started organizing deductions and calculations one by one. On the calculation papers, Mark's pen moved swiftly, and lengthy and complex equations lined up densely. Nearly a hundred pages of standard A4 size were quickly filled with by Mark, and most of the content was still unsolved equations. To obtain the correct answers, extensive calculations and biological experiments were required to collect experimental data. But for Mark, calculations were never a challenge. The innate talent of the Stark family, which was a cheat from the Marvel Universe, combined with the brain development he obtained from time traveling and his continuous growth over the years, had brought Mark's brain very close to the realm of a deity. Even the fastest supercomputers on Earth today couldn't surpass Mark in terms of computational capacity. Not even experimental data could stump Mark. His highly developed brain allowed him to create a virtual laboratory in his mind and access various biological data from his memories, constructing a virtual experimental process. After analysis and calculation, he could derive data results that were accurate to the smallest detail, just like real-world experiments. However, Mark didn't continue deducing the technical data of the Super Soldier Serum. In this data room, surveillance cameras were installed from all directions. If he were to calculate everything here, they would be compiled into a dossier and end up on the desks of Hydra and Nick Fury tomorrow. Mark wouldn't do something that would benefit others at his own expense. After tidying up the scattered papers on the desk, Mark neatly stacked them and picked up the second technical dossier on PIM particles, examining it attentively. PIM particles were subatomic particles named after Dr. Hank Pym, their initial discoverer. 
Through research, Dr. Hank Pym found that these subatomic particles could alter the size of objects, even allowing people to change their size at will. He utilized the principles of Pym particles to integrate them into his armor, creating the Ant-Man suit. Dr. Hank Pym's contributions go beyond that. In order to collect and safely utilize these subatomic particles, Dr. Pym formulated a series of core equations. Using this set of core equations, Dr. Pym and his wife, Janet, became the superheroes Ant-Man and Wasp, respectively. As a result, they were invited by Howard Stark to join S.H.I.E.L.D. However, during a mission in which Dr. Pym and his wife were together, Janet became trapped in the quantum realm after shrinking too small. This made him reassess the dangers of Pym particles and believe that this technology should be properly safeguarded. At the same time, he discovered that someone within S.H.I.E.L.D. was attempting to steal his research and replicate Pym particles. To protect this dangerous technology, Dr. Pym voluntarily left S.H.I.E.L.D. With the relationship severed between him and S.H.I.E.L.D., Dr. Pym took all the information related to these core equations with him. The remaining fragments of information within S.H.I.E.L.D. were deductions made by scientists based on the data they obtained while working with Dr. Pym. Even Mark, with all his abilities, couldn't reverse-engineer the original core equations from these fragments. However, that didn't matter. Mark wasn't interested in shrinking people. As mentioned before, Mark wasn't the kind of person who liked to charge into battles. So, rather than creating suits that could safely shrink and enlarge people, Mark was more inclined to apply this technology to objects. You see, by combining the ability of Pym particles to alter the size of objects with the microrobot technology in Mark's mind, it would be easy to create nanobots and significantly reduce the difficulty and cost of producing various nanotechnologies. What Mark needed the most was how to collect Pym particles from the real world and store them. Detailed design ideas were already recorded in this technical information. Although it still required Mark to conduct further research and deduction to obtain results, it was already sufficient. Having obtained the two technologies he had longed for, Mark left the data room feeling satisfied. However, in order to help us, H-I-E-L-D, understanding the difficulties and key points in the power system he designed, Mark couldn't leave yet and had to temporarily stay in the suite provided by S, H-I-E-L-D. But this didn't hinder Mark's research. In his mind, a virtual laboratory had already been constructed, where three virtual figures, identical to Mark, were each performing their respective tasks. One person was deducing the super soldier serum, another was deriving the Pym particle equations, and the third was engaged in unknown research and development. This was the scene that Mark's parallel thought processing had created in his virtual laboratory. And that mysterious project being worked on by the third Mark was the ultimate design that fused the super soldier serum, Pym particles, and microrobots together. I never expected to have the opportunity to recreate this technology in the Marvel Universe. Before I reincarnated here, I heard that this movie was about to be released. It's a pity I didn't have a chance to watch it. I wonder if this can be considered a crossover between the two comics. No, no. Inside a laboratory at S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, Mark watched a group of scientists busy verifying parameters and voiced his dissatisfaction, the magnetic axis servo angle here should be 25 degrees. Didn't I clearly mark it on the blueprint? Why did you randomly change it? Mark was infuriated by these people who modified his set parameters without consulting him. Humph, young people will always be naive. A 25-degree transmission angle clearly contradicts the principles of transmission mechanics and would impose additional stress on the transmission axis. I merely made the correct adjustments. The scientist who changed the parameters arrogantly replied to Mark, revealing both his disdain and hostility towards him. He appeared to be in his thirties, much younger than the other scientists in their fifties and sixties. Mark immediately guessed the intentions of the other person. It was evident that this individual felt threatened by Mark's remarkable achievements at such a young age and had always been overconfident. Now, being struck by the design created by Mark, who was not even an adult yet, this person believed that his position was being undermined, and thus, he intentionally belittled Mark to elevate himself. However, Mark was no ordinary person. He had been influenced by Tony from an early age, and it could be said that even after ten years of training, this person wouldn't be a match for Mark when it came to sharp-tongued remarks. If you don't understand, ask. Did you exhaust too much energy during group exercises last night, 
causing your brain to short circuit? Do you view my magnetic axis servo transmission with the traditional principles of mechanical transmission? If you are truly so intelligent, S H I E L D wouldn't need to bring me, a 14 year old kid, here to answer your questions. If we implement your design, are you planning to send this warship to outer space with the power of thousands of super strong braking engines? Are you trying to kill everyone? You. 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 The person pointed a trembling finger at Mark, attempting to argue back but found himself speechless. In the end, overwhelmed with anger, he fainted. The older scientists beside him shook their heads in disappointment, clearly displeased with his behavior. Once a researcher loses the humility to seek advice and reverence for knowledge, they are easily blinded by money and fame, making it impossible for them to discover the truth of science. Shortly after, several agents entered the laboratory and carried the unconscious young scientist out. The remaining older scientists silently reverted the previously modified transmission angles, focusing their efforts on inputting the parameters from Mark's blueprint into the computer, gradually constructing a holographic model of the power system. With one less person, the efficiency of the entire team actually improved. It seemed that a single arrogant individual had previously hindered the team's progress. When the final parameter on the design blueprint was input into the computer, a massive and intricate engine model appeared before everyone through the holographic projection. The densely distributed power nodes within the model were evenly spread along the magnetic axis servo transmission axis, which spanned over 300 meters. They could flexibly rotate within a 270 degree range, providing the aircraft with powerful propulsion and agile maneuverability. The next step is the final feasibility verification, Mark said, filled with anticipation as he gazed at the magnificent holographic model. Although he was confident that his design could meet the requirements set by S. H. I. E. L. D. and pass this safety validation, he still felt a bit nervous and uneasy until the actual results were obtained. As he spoke, Mark took out a portable hard drive from his pocket and handed it to one of the experimenters. This is the control system that governs the entire power apparatus. Only with it can thousands of power nodes cooperate safely and orderly, carrying out the operator's commands. The experimenter received the portable hard drive from Mark and connected it to the server in the laboratory. The final step of the safety and feasibility verification process was to input the program created by Mark into the server, control the holographic model generated by the computer software to perform various functions, and then export the data for examination. If all the data met the design requirements, Mark's proposed solution would receive official approval. Power on, activate all power nodes, enable all operational modes, verify the system servo mechanisms, countdown, 3, 2, 1, start. Following the command, the experimenter immediately pressed the enter key on the computer keyboard. Subsequently, each power node of the holographic engine model began emitting blue light, symbolizing the propulsion jets. The startup process went smoothly. The experimenter proceeded to test the engine's power limits. 10% thrust, 20%, 50%, 80%, 100% full power. According to the parameters displayed on the computer, the engine had outputted all its power, and the computer's calculations indicated that, at full speed, it could propel the loaded aircraft to a speed approaching Mach 3, which was comparable to the fastest fighter jets in the world. What was even more astonishing was that, at the extreme speed of full throttle, disregarding the load capacity of the personnel inside the vessel and the potential damage to the ship structure, the engine designed by Mark could even perform instantaneous right-angle turns and 180-degree sharp turns, demonstrating its remarkable agility. One hour later, after completing all the simulated tests, the scientists began exporting the data from the experiment and initiated the verification and calculation process. Verifying all the data for such a massive system would typically be a tedious and monotonous task. However, after witnessing the terrifying capabilities of the performance monster designed by Mark, everyone on site was caught up in frenzied excitement. They were witnessing history, witnessing a miracle, and couldn't wait to calculate all the results immediately, enabling the engine to be put into production right away. Finally, with the assistance of a supercomputer, after five and a half hours of mundane calculations, the project leader responsible for this validation heavily pressed the enter key with their finger. As the words appeared on the command screen, the entire team erupted in cheers, leaping out of their seats. We did it. We have witnessed the birth of a miracle. Mr. Mark, your proposal has passed our feasibility and safety validations. 
Thank you for providing such a creative power system solution that has truly amazed us. You're welcome. It was part of our agreed upon deal. Now that the validation is successful, I will be heading back today. After reviewing those two technical documents, I have many ideas that need to be tested in the laboratory, especially that one thing, it has been a week since Mark returned from the S-H-I-E-L-D, Triskelion headquarters. During this week, he continued to facilitate Tony in Pepper's private time, immersing himself in scientific research and being unable to break free. In just one week, Mark had already reconstructed the core theory of the Super Soldier Serum, even deducing the molecular formula and synthesis reactions of its main components that interact with the human body. However, his progress in extracting and storing PIM particles was hindered. The extraction of PIM particles required processes at the picometer level, separating and purifying countless impurities. To achieve such technical precision, Mark not only needed to reproduce Dr. Hank Pym's core equations but also design and manufacture a new set of separation and purification equipment to meet the accuracy requirements of the entire process. Moreover, to ensure the long-term stability of the purified Pym particles, a stabilizer needed to be used as a medium. The formula for this stabilizer was only vaguely mentioned in the technical information provided by S. H. I. E. L. D., indicating that it was closely guarded by Dr. Pym himself. Without any related information, Mark had to continuously experiment with various known stabilizers, making trial and error attempts. If the desired effect couldn't be achieved in the end, Mark would have to develop a new type of stabilizer, which would undoubtedly consume a significant amount of time and effort. Furthermore, as long as the progress with the PIM particles stalled for a day, Mark's plan to integrate several technologies and create that particular thing would remain unrealized. This was the most challenging aspect. Hey, this won't do. Staring at the equations for PIM particles all day has made my mind dull. I should go back and continue working on my transformers and hover cannon. It's been dragging on for a while now. Tony has already started developing the 4th, 5th, and 6th generations of the Mark series armors, and I haven't even finished the first transformer yet. I feel a bit behind. So, Mark decided to temporarily set aside the research on PIM particles and return to the previous hover cannon project, shifting his mindset. Speaking of which, Mark's progress in the hover cannon research had also stagnated for some time. Initially, he hit a bottleneck and couldn't come up with a better solution, so he turned his attention to improving the design of the Transformers transforming mechanism. Later, due to the events involving Obadiah and his own company, Mark's focus shifted, and this project was temporarily put on hold. In the laboratory, Mark retrieved various design drawings he had made for the hover cannon from the server and resumed his work. The first thing Mark focused on was the transformation mechanism of the hover cannon. Since it needed to switch between a car form and a robot form while preserving the passenger space and various functionalities of the car, this further constrained Mark's design space. It was impossible to achieve smooth operation as a car without an intricate transformation mechanism. The suspension, steering, acceleration, and braking functions of the hover cannon after transforming into a car form all needed to be integrated into this transformation mechanism. Therefore, Mark had to meticulously design each component, ensuring they fit seamlessly together without causing any jerking or disruptions. However, for Mark, this was considered an easy task. After all, mechanical structure design was his area of expertise, and compared to the research on PIM particles and the design of the hover cannon, designing a transformation mechanism could be described as easy and enjoyable, almost like a leisure activity. Although he had plenty of idle time, Mark quickly got into the groove. He effortlessly applied various complex structures and sometimes even had bursts of inspiration, coming up with ingenious designs that excited him for more than 10 minutes. In just two days, Mark designed the intricate mechanical structures on the body of the hover cannon. Under the holographic model projection, each joint was flexible and stable, and the overall structure combined strength and aesthetics, closely resembling the transformers from Mark's memories, even surpassing them in certain aspects. If combined with the all-round attack units Mark envisioned, the transformer he designed would far surpass the movie's depiction in both appearance and attack power. After clicking, save, to upload all the data to his personal server, Mark stretched lazily. After working continuously at the lab bench for over 10 hours, his youthful body felt a bit tired. It seems I should prioritize researching the super soldier serum. After all, even for scientific research, a healthy body is indispensable. 
Just as he was about to pick up the research materials for the super soldier serum and continue his work, the doorbell of the lab suddenly rang. Master, your secretary has work to report and is waiting outside the door. The clear voice prompt informed Mark about the visitor's presence, and he nodded. Let her in. Since the product launch event, I haven't paid attention to the company's affairs. It's about time I inquired. A bit. Sorry for disturbing your research, boss. The secretary, dressed in a black professional suit and holding a stack of documents in front of her chest, entered the room and gave a slight nod, apologizing to Mark. No need to apologize. It's your job. Speaking of which, it's me as a boss who's been inadequate. I haven't shown any concern for the company's affairs for such a long time. Have there been any difficulties that couldn't be resolved? Mark waved his hand, indicating that the secretary shouldn't be so reserved, and then began to show interest in the company's situation. Oh no, boss, the secretary, a charming young lady, shook her head, I came here today not because the company encountered any issues. On the contrary, the company's recent situation has been exceptionally good. The general manager asked me to come and report the company's status and inquire about the company's future development direction. Go ahead, I'm listening. All right. Since the release of our company's personal health assistant product, the sales have been continuously booming. Within one week of its launch, the demand for robots and skins of various models has been overwhelming. As of 8 o'clock this morning, our total online and offline revenue has reached 4 billion US dollars. Medical institutions and military forces from various countries have expressed their willingness to collaborate, and it is projected that our total revenue for this quarter will exceed 300 billion US dollars. To cope with the high demand, Stark Industries has urgently increased its production lines, and now the production output can almost meet our daily shipping quantity. Mm, everyone has worked hard during this period. With such a large shipment volume, everything has been well organized, and everyone's work has been outstanding. The company's first battle since its opening has achieved such remarkable results. Does the general manager have any reward plans for the employees? That's one of the tasks the general manager entrusted to me today. He has prepared several employee incentive plans, but they still need your review and approval. The secretary took out a document from the thick stack of papers and placed it on Mark's desk. All right, I will review it as soon as possible and give him a response. Is there anything else? The general manager wants you to attend the company's senior management meeting tomorrow morning. Although the current performance is impressive, the product line is still too thin. Also, there has been no news from your side regarding the company's product direction for the next quarter. The marketing department is also hoping for an early decision so that they can prepare the promotional plans. Well, I didn't expect that we would already have to start considering the next quarter's matters just two weeks after the product launch event. I will prepare well for this aspect. Before the meeting tomorrow, come to the lab and inform me, as I'm afraid I might get too focused on my experiments and lose track of time. Understood, boss. Then I'll leave now. The general manager still needs me to give him a response. Mark nodded, signaling the secretary to leave, but his thoughts had drifted somewhere else. Mark's Research Center, a technology company that relied solely on him for the entire research and development system, couldn't find a second one like it in the whole world. Even Stark Industries had an entire research department. Moreover, compared to personal sole ownership businesses like his, which relied on technological products for operations, large companies like Stark Industries had a broad range of business activities and didn't need frequent updates to their product lines to mitigate risks. Furthermore, launching a new product wasn't as simple as making a minor upgrade to an old product. The Mark Research Center, which had already been labeled by consumers, would suffer a severe blow to its image if it released a disappointing product. The direct or indirect losses resulting from it would be even greater than reducing the frequency of product launches. Therefore, Mark had to carefully consider the direction of the company's products for the next quarter. This won't do. If I have to spend time and energy thinking about what product to launch every quarter, it will undoubtedly consume a significant portion of my time and energy. Moreover, not every invention of mine is suitable for public promotion. Weapons like the Dominator, which require strict confidentiality, cannot be considered as options, even if the impact it creates upon disclosure would be sensational. 
In that case, I need to seriously consider the flagship product for the next quarter, ideally something that can continue to iterate, upgrade, and bring forth new series of products even without my direct involvement. Now that I want my consumers to experience the concept of the Mark Research Center creating happiness with technology, how can I not release a game? Yes, that's right. I should make a game, and it should be a console game. I can make money from hardware sales, and when consumers go home and find out that all the games are paid, I can earn more from software. I also need to launch various accessories for the consoles, as well as peripheral and cultural products related to the game characters. It seems like there's great potential in this. Hee hee hee, the money-making model of Sony plus Nintendo plus Penguin, you'll all obediently fall into my trap and put the dollars into my pocket. Master, your secretary has come to remind you that the senior management meeting is about to begin. Please go and attend. All right, Mark responded weakly, lifting his messy bedhead. After deciding to enter the gaming industry yesterday, Mark started working overtime on creating a plan. After all, even if he wanted to emulate the money-making strategies of the big shots, the product still needed to be innovative. PS1, 2, 3, 4, Xbox, Switch, those cheap thrills, Mark couldn't bring himself to use the slogan of creating happiness with technology. If he wanted to enter the gaming industry, he needed to completely subvert everyone's perception of games. So, after working on the plan all night, Mark, with disheveled hair and dark circles under his eyes, pale-faced, entered the meeting room with his prepared materials. Hello, boss. As soon as Mark entered, all the high-level executives in the meeting room greeted him in unison. Don't be fooled by the fact that everyone present was in their twenties or thirties and were young and promising elites in their respective fields. Mark was only fourteen years old, not even an adult yet. But these high-level executives, who dealt with company affairs every day, knew better than anyone else about their boss's terrifying talent. The estimated revenue for the first quarter since the company's opening had reached 300 billion US dollars. The privately developed high-tech product, the personal health assistant, not only gained the favor of various social classes but also received widespread praise and a good reputation. If Mark were willing to make his company go public at this point, the valuation of the company would be at least in the trillions, making this 14-year-old young man the richest person in the world. Furthermore, Mark had the famous Iron Man as his father and the endorsement of Stark Industries behind him. So, whether it was in terms of ability or family background, it was enough to make these ambitious young talents willingly bow down to him. Good morning, everyone. If everyone is present, let the general manager preside over the meeting and start. Please call me when it's time for me to speak. All right, boss. Let's first discuss the logistics cost pressure caused by the surge in online sales. Under the leadership of the general manager, the meeting officially began, and each department manager and supervisor gave their speeches one by one. However, the process of this meeting was not as Mark had imagined, where everyone simply read from their scripts. The atmosphere was intense and filled with heated debates. Perhaps it was because everyone was young and their ages were not too far apart, and each held a strong attachment to their own viewpoints. It was precisely because of this intense debate and clash of ideas that the meeting was highly efficient, and the decisions made were precise. Now, I would like to invite the company's boss, Mr. Mark Stark, to talk about the company's product direction for the next quarter. As the meeting reached its conclusion and the general manager summarized the content, it was finally Mark's turn to present the company's future plans. Ahem. Mark cleared his throat and then projected his plan onto the conference screen. He confidently said, Gentlemen, your speeches earlier were brilliant. As for the company's products for the next quarter, everyone, let's focus on gaming. 